Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. The National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. This is the start of a mystery. Our main character is a San Francisco girl detective, Candy Matson. There are others in the show, too. An Inspector Mallard, a gent who calls himself Rembrandt Watson, a cowboy, a dude ranch owner, and a gal the casting agency assured us was a dowager, slightly boozy. There are a few other voices along the way, too. I think that has all the makings of a good mystery show, don't you? Well, let's go on from here and find out. So, here's Candy Matson. <laughs> Like the man just said, this is the start of a mystery. Christmas had me completely tuckered out. No one had invited me to the Rose Bowl game or the East-West at Kezar, so I decided to make like a bear and hibernate over New Year's. It worked out perfectly because, as my old friend Rembrandt Watson put it, You wish to greet 1950 in some remote spot? Is that the idea, Doug? That's the idea, Ducky. I have the perfect place for you. A dude ranch, reasonable, just on the other side of Sonoma, in the Valley of the Moon. Valley of the Moon. New Year's Eve in the Valley of the Moon. Rembrandt, that sends me. Good. Maybe it can send us both. I have a commission to take some pictures up there for a brochure they're putting out. I have to be there tomorrow afternoon. Yes? I see you're nibbling at the bait. I shall be blunt. Why don't you drive me up? You've won your point. I'll pick you up tomorrow at what time? Let us be spectacular and say high noon. High noon. And uh, do bring some cash, will you, girl? I'm a little short. I thought you were going up there on a commission. Yes, I am but they have some simply divine one-arm devices. And? And there goes my commission. Naturally, a girl has to look right to welcome in the New Year. That gave me the perfect excuse to squander a few hard-earned dollars and cents on some lovely clothes that didn't make sense but cost dollars. The afternoon was aging gracefully, a little gray here and a wrinkle or two there. So I stopped for a parfait, very dry and no olive. With that mission accomplished, I headed back over Kearney Street. And as I wheeled past Portsmouth Square in the Hall of Justice, I realized I hadn't seen my chum Mallard in quite some time. Inspector Ray Mallard of San Francisco Homicide. A very smart cop who can smell a clue a mile away. But when it comes to me, he very conveniently carries his own fog around. Well, Candy, my little cupcake. Mallard, dear... You called me your little cupcake. Sure, it's still the Christmas season. Let's be charitable, I always say. What do you always say? In a situation like this, nothing. I just exude a stream of steam from the top of my head. Very cute. What brings you around our boarding house? You, darn it. I thought you might like to know I'm going away for a week. What did they get you on? Petty theft? Yeah, and they got me as I tried to make my getaway on a tricycle. (laughs) But for your information, Inspector, I'm I'm spending my New Year's Eve up in the Valley of the Moon. Oh, want to get away from it all, huh? That's right. You in particular. In that case, may I get your midwinter vacation off to a flying start? You can try. How? I'm not working tonight. How's about a movie? You've got yourself a date. What's playing? Tex Tex Acuff. Acuff. (laughs) That's what I thought. Where's Tex and his faithful hoss mustard playing this time? Why, at the plaza. Mm. And the picture's a pip, too. I bet. I read all about it. Yeah. Hot lead over Laredo. Uh, uh, look, here's the ad in the paper. Oh, I can't wait to see it. Uh, uh, Show me. That, that. Yeah. A searing epic of the West's wild grandeur. Men as rugged as the mountains. Oui. A singing saga of scorching bullets, strumming guitars, and supple senoritas. Uh-uh. And starring the champ of the cowboys, Tex, Tex Acuff. Acuff. Oh, what more can one ask in a motion picture? Popcorn. Oh, we'll have that, too. <laughs> I went home, did some packing for the trip the next day, fixed something to eat, and then changed into my spurs that jingle jangle for Tex Acuff. Mallard arrived, we took off. We got to the early show, so we managed to get some good seats. Of course, he wasn't kidding about the popcorn. He got a great big bag of that. We fumbled our way down the darkened aisle and found a place to sit. The movie was almost over. The whole thing looks like a gosh dang frame up to me. They must have snuck off with them head of cattle and old ring the in you. Yep, all right. Here, Candy. Right. These seats are okay. Oh. They must have gone that way, all right. 
Oh, 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 sorry, lady. So am I, Pete. What happened to Tex? Last time I seen her, she would leave the house. Okay. Oh, uh, have some popcorn? No, no. I wonder no, where the sheriff is. He said he was going to be riding by directly. Oh, the truck was not on. What? I said sure is good popcorn. Oh, sure you don't want some? What? I said, are you sure you don't want some popcorn? I keep saying no. No, thank you. I don't want any popcorn, my dear. If you'll pardon me, I'm going home and catch this on television. Not with Tess missing this way. I understand your feeling all about it. Well, I'm after hot lead over Laredo, I suffered through six reels of a bouncy college picture. The freshmen looked like holdovers from the early days of the war. Then a newsreel, then a cartoon, then the trailer, then again Tex Aka. So we got out about midnight, and I drove Mallard back to the Hall of Justice. As he got out of the car... Oh, wow. Oh, now that's what I call sharp dialogue. On leaving the lady, all he can say is, oh, well. Oh, nothing personal, Candy. <laughs> now he laughed at me. Well, I was just thinking, uh, you're going up to the Valley of the Moon for a rest. Is that the idea? Well, yes. That and trying to get away from Tex Aka. Uh, I know you too well, Candy. You're not going to have any rest. Uh, look at the headline on that paper in the newsstand there. Man missing in Sonoma mystery. And Sonoma can have it. Mallard, dear, if I so much as step inside the Sonoma city limits, you can come and lead me away quietly. You know something? I'm going to remember that. <laughs> Mallard waved goodbye and went inside. I didn't like the way he said that. But I had other things to think about, such as getting home and getting some sleep. So I did. And in the morning, I drove over to California Street, picked up Rembrandt, and we headed out across the Golden Gate Bridge up towards Sonoma. The Valley of the Moon wasn't too far, a couple of hours of leisurely driving with time out for readjustments, and you're there. Then another eight miles north and east, and there was the Dude Ranch. This is it, dear. What do you think of it? Perfect, just perfect. Wait, Rembrandt, dear, it's a real ranch. Of course, dear, but going concern. They only take in guests as a sideline. Oh, here comes the man. I imagine that's Mr. Lawrence, the owner. Oh, well, I'll shut off the motor. Good morning. How do you do, sir? Would you be Mr. Lawrence, for chance? Yes, and you? Watson, Rembrandt Watson. I'm here to take some pictures for you as we discuss via the Dell system. Oh, yes, Watson, right on time. That's good. Oh, Candy, may I present Mr. Lawrence? Owner of the double L, uh, Miss Madsen. How do you do? Miss yeah. Madsen was wondering if she could get accommodation for about a week, Mr. Lawrence. What? Now, wait a minute, Watson. I'm paying you a substantial fee for this job, and I won't get stuck with non-paying guests. Oh, I think you're laboring under a misapprehension. Hold it, Rembrandt. Look, Mr. Lawrence, I'm here as a commercial guest. I'm not asking for any favors. And I doubt if I'd stay here now if you got down on your bended knuckles. Oh, now, wait a second. I didn't mean it just that way. I, I apologize. It's only that, uh, well, I've had some tough luck with people lately who seem to be only too intent on beating me out of their bills. Uh, please, Miss Madsen, excuse me. I, I just jumped to conclusions, that's all. I think you set a new record for the jump. Oh, forget it, Dove. Do. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, do you have room for me, Mr. Lawrence? Why, yes, yes, of course. A delightful cabin just in back of the ranch house. Not being prepared, it'll take about an hour to get it in shape. Will that be all right? Yes, sure. We can eat in the meantime. Fine. I'll get one of the boys to fetch your luggage. Oh, you can park over there under the old stables. Oh, no garage? No. Oh. Again, I have to apologize, Miss Matson. The garage is overloaded now. We have a sheriff's posse up here. The owner of the ranch next to mine disappeared yesterday afternoon. The sheriff is searching the entire vicinity around here. <laughs> Dove, are you all right? <laughs> well, speak to me, girl. What is it? I'm all right. I just happened to think of something Mallard once said last night. <laughs> I pushed my assembled horsepower into the stables where they belonged, and Rembrandt took me by the arm and steered me into the ranch house. It was a beautiful place, a tall cathedral-like living room with a crackling fireplace about the size of Dante's Inferno at one end. Off to this one side of the fireplace was a cozy little bar. The sun was just going over the yard arm, so I figured an old-fashioned would be quite in order. Old-fashioned was right. Behind the bar was the personification of an old-fashioned cowboy. Real shafts, a leathery face, and little squint wrinkles around his eyes. 
Well, howdy, Tex. It seems like as if I done saw you in a movie last night. Oh, howdy yourself, ma'am. Nope. Must have been two other cowboys. I've been working here at the Double L for almost five years. My mistake, partner. Matson's the handle. What's yourn? <laughs> Is that the way cowboys talk, ma'am? <laughs> yeah, Hollywood and vine variety. I'm glad to know you. Call me Jeff, Miss Matson. Check. This is Rembrandt Watson. Rembrandt, Jeff. Are those shoulders sewn in, or are they real? <laughs> I'm afraid they're real. Hiya, Mr. Watson. You riding herd on all those bottles back there, Jeff? Yep, for better or worse. Chang, our regular bartender, took powder on his day before yesterday. Uh-oh. Seems like he picked a bad time to do a run out. Oh, you mean the missing jet from Glen Valley? Glendale? Yeah, that's the ranch next to ours. Yeah, I understand the police are on the lookout for Chang, but he didn't do it. He's a good, honest Chinese boy. Even so, it's a bad time to disappear. Oh, I admit it doesn't sound good. Well, if you folks won't mind the efforts of an amateur dispenser, what can I do for you? An old-fashioned for me, Jeff. Well, that I can try. <laughs> From now on, it gets easier. Rembrandt only wants the coke. Well, I can sure fix that all right. Uh-oh. What's wrong? Here comes the Duchess. The Duchess? Yeah, one of our guests. Oh. She's been out here about two weeks. And she can go through distilled spirits faster than a buzzsaw through mushy pine. And I hope you're prepared to talk. Always, Jeff. Always. Hello, my dear. You just arrived, haven't you? Uh, mentally or physically? Oh, oh, my. A sense of humor, too. I, I shall enjoy your company. Are you staying long? Well, I, I'm not sure now. My plans are rather indefinite. Oh, you'll love it here, Miss... Uh... Met. And may I present Mr. Rembrandt Watson? Charmed, I'm sure. As of now, me life has come in. Oh, you delightful lad. Uh, Jeff, dear boy, make me just a little nip of the old favorites, will you? Sure. One painkiller coming up. Oh, here's your old-fashioned, Miss Matson. Thanks. Mr. Watson, your coat. Thanks, sir. Young lady, you must be an actress. You look like what? Well, no, I'm not. I used to be an actress, a mm. famous one. Mm. I toured all over the continent with the greatest of stars, the finest of plays. Mm. I was the toast of London, Berlin, Vienna. Yes, but I... I, I had kings and princess uh. worshipping at my feet. Oh. I was once the vortex of an international incident... But no matter. Those days are gone forever now. I... And here's your tonic, Duchess. You what? Oh, thank you, Jeff. Well, as we used to say, here's to cry. What was that? It's a perfect toast. We have quite a mystery in this part of the country, young lady. And so I keep hearing. I can't understand. Mr. Ferguson had everything to live for. Mr. Ferguson? The man who owned Glen Valley. Wealthy, good-looking, in the best of health. You seem to know quite a bit about the gentleman, Duchess. Only what I read in the newspapers, and I can't understand it. Well, as I said, here's to crime. We dallied at the bar for a few more moments. Then Jeff informed me that lunch was ready and Rembrandt and I ate. We managed to duck the Duchess. I don't think I could have taken her with food. After lunch, Lawrence showed me to my cabin. It was, as he said, delightful, with a warming flame in the fireplace. It was cheery and comfy, and I felt completely at home. Lawrence left to talk to Rembrandt. They were going to discuss the pictures he wanted taken. I felt like going riding, so I changed in my jeans and started to leave. But as I did... <gasps> oh, sorry, Miss Matson. I didn't mean to frighten you. Oh, well, you did, Jim. Uh, I was just about to knock when you opened the door. Oh, that's okay. Was there something you wanted? Oh, well, you're in riding clothes, and that answers my question. The question being? Well, were you going riding? <laughs> you see, the boss wanted to know if you were going riding, and if so, did you want some company? I usually show the guests around the acres. Well, yes, that'd be wonderful. And uh, how long do you want to be out, Miss Matson? About three hours or so. Sure. In that case, we'll take the deluxe tour over across the back 60 and up through Manzanita Canyon. You know, when we get up to the top of Iron Mountain, you can see the whole valley of the moon. That's for me, Jeff. Let's hit the leather. <laughs> Jeff was obviously born to the saddle and came into this world teething on a tether rein. You couldn't tell where the horse left off, and Jeff began, a real rider. We nosed out through the clump of ranch buildings and on into open space. I had a fine horse under me, and I really felt like I was living. We'd been riding about an hour when we came across a little stream. 
Jeff indicated we should stop and water the horses. How long have you been a cowboy, Jeff? Oh, about as long as I can remember. Around here? No, up around Montana. Then little by little, I gradually drifted further west. Hit upon the Valley of the Moon about five years ago. Fell in love with it. I've been here ever since. Reckon I'll stay here, too. No, I don't blame you. Excuse me if I seem to be full of questions, Jeff. Well, that's what I'm here for, ma'am. Good. Because I've got a couple more. What's up that little draw there on the other side of the creek? Mm, nothing but a tangle of manzanita. Scrub oak and brush. Pretty hard to get through there, hmm? Hard. It's impossible. Well, I've seen chipmunks get fouled up in that draw. Uh-huh. Then how come those boot prints are going right up there? Boot prints? I don't see any. Well, hey, you're right. Either boot prints are the result of shoes with Cuban heels. Well, now, there's a strange one. Exactly what I thought, too. Say, you know, something just dawned on me. Matson, didn't I see your pictures in the Frisco papers a couple of weeks back? San Francisco. Big pardon? San Francisco. Oh, yeah, San Francisco. Excuse me. Well, sure. You know, the way you was asking those questions just now, <laughs> it hit me. You're a detective. I'm afraid you got me, partner. Uh-oh, wait a minute, Miss oh. Matson. Listen. Set the duck, Jeff. Too late now. What the... Well, who there? What are you doing over this way, Jeff? Hi, boss. Well, say, you give us quite a little start. You haven't answered my question. Oh, we just stopped to wallow the horses, Mr. Lawrence. Miss Matson here is a mighty fine rider. She wanted to make the big circle of the ring. Well, you certainly picked a fine time to do it. Whoa. Sheriff Posse is out around this way. You're liable to get shot. Now get back to the ranch, pronto. Just a moment, Mr. Lawrence. You've been uncivil ever since I got here, and I don't like to be dictated to. It's like being on board ship, Miss Matson. The captain is the law. I'm the owner of this property, and you'll do as I say. Now get moving, both of you. And if you don't like my attitude, you can leave any time you want. Leave? Now? Yes. Oh, no, Mr. Lawrence. I'm beginning to find your ranch extremely interesting. <laughs> Jeff and I wheeled our horses about and sifted back to the ranch house. I looked back a couple of times, but there was no sign of Lawrence. I was mad, and Jeff must have sensed it because he was smart enough to keep his mouth closed. As I dismounted at the stables and headed for the house, he waved me a forlorn adios and disappeared. Just as I went through the door, I was greeted by Rembrandt. Oh, there you are, Dove. I was about to institute a searching party for you. Oh, I was safe enough until I gained the grips with a thing called my own temper. What have you been doing, Ducky? I've had a most delightful afternoon, Candy dear. I've been playing canasta with the Duchess. Canasta? Ooh, you don't know how to play canasta. Well, I know that, and you know it, but I don't think the Duchess does. She celebrates each hand with a hefty pull on her bitters. <laughs> Why'd you manage to make any sense out of the game? Well, that has me puzzled, too. All I do is put down some cards, any cards, and she'd congratulate me. Maybe you've got a green thumb for the game. Incidentally, I thought you were going to be taking pictures this afternoon. Called off on account of the law. Hmm? Mr. Lawrence had to ride out into the lone prairie and deliver a phone message to the sheriff. He's making like ghost riders in the sky out there. Do go and change, dear. You smell of horses. Yes, I know. Oh, and incidentally, we're to have a soiree this evening. Two more guests arrived. The cook tells me there's to be a little entertainment after dinner. Good. Around here, anything will be an improvement. I didn't tell Rembrandt I was going to change, so it wasn't a fib when I stayed in my jeans. I went back to the stables, got the boy to rig me another horse, and headed out toward that creek again. I rode faster this time, because I'd noticed something else there besides the footprints. It was a battered ten-gallon hat on the far side of the creek with studded initials J.F. on the crown. <laughs> But when I got there, the cupboard was bare, but good. Not only was the 10-gallon hat gone, but the boot prints had been completely obliterated. I stayed for another few minutes of study and frustration and then went back to the ranch. I changed, met Rembrandt, had dinner, and then we relaxed in the living room. Oh, Dove, I'm so full. This outdoor living makes me ravenous. Outdoors? I don't think you've stepped out of this building since we got here. Well, then it's the thought of outdoor living that does it. <laughs> oh, they are the new arrivals over by the fire. Uh, did you meet them? No. They looked at me as though I might soil their escutcheon, whatever that is. I can see what you mean. Hi, folks. Do you enjoy, enjoy your dinner? Oh, hello, Jeff. Yes, it was wonderful. Uh, has anybody seen Mr. Lawrence or the Duchess? We haven't seen Lawrence, no. Uh, the Duchess is over there writing a letter. Oh. Well, 
I hope you'll all drop around in about an hour. I'm going to do some singing and a little guitar plucking. Is there anything you don't do, Jeff? No, very little. But none of them too darn good either. Sure, we'll be here, won't we, Rembrandt? What? Oh, yes, I go with three diamonds and a joke card. Jeff left, Rembrandt snoozed, and I threw a wrap around my shoulders and took a stroll around the patio. The air felt good. I went over to my cabin, picked up some cigarettes, and started back. But as I came close to the cabin opposite mine... It was the Duchess. I recognized those tones and groans anywhere. Duchess? Yes? This is Candy Matson. Are, are you all right? Yes, I'm all right. Touch of indigestion, I should imagine. Oh, is there anything I can do? Can I get you something? Oh, what a dear thing you are. No, I'll be all right. I have these attacks all the time. You run along and enjoy yourself. Jeff is going to sing. He's such a dear boy. But you're sure you'll be okay? Yes. Yes, dear. You go along. Oh, here. Now, let me put a blanket over you. Oh. Here, and take off your shoes. You'll be ever so much more comfortable. Oh, you're so sweet. So pretty. You remind me of myself when I was young. Thank you. Thank you so much. I tucked the old girl in and left her to dream of the past and went back to the ranch house. Jeff was just pulling up a chair in front of the fireplace. Now you'll have to understand, folks, I'm not a singer. I don't pretend to be. I just warble along the way I feel. Now, is there any particular kind of cowboy tune you'd like to hear? No, Jeff. Why don't you just sing a favorite of yours? Good idea. Just do what comes naturally. Okay, you ask for it. Let's see. Here's one I think you might like. Oh, bury me not on the lone prairie Where the coyotes howl And the wind blows free in a narrow grave, just sit by three, but barely. Oh, hiya, boss. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeff. Go right on with what you were doing. No, Mr. Lawrence. You arrived just in time. The entertainment's over. What? What are you talking about, Miss Matson? I said the show's over. Is the sheriff around? Yes, he and his men are outside. They're just leaving for the night. You better call him back right now. The Duchess is dead in her cabin. What? Poisoned. Wait a minute. Sheriff! Sheriff Hop! Is that you, Lord? That's right. Can you and your men come back for a spell? Seems we have more trouble. Okay. We'll be over as soon as we tie up the horse. Now then, what's this all about? Well, I could tell you, Lawrence, but I think it'd be more proper coming from the star himself. Don't you think so, Jeff? <laughs> Looks like this is it, doesn't it? You know, you're smart, Miss Matson. Like they say in that ad, never underestimate the power of a woman. That's right. That letter the Duchess wrote proves your point. What? How'd you get hold of that letter? I thought I... Oh, <laughs> she wrote a duplicate. Is that it? Like you say, never underestimate the power of a woman. Wait a moment. I don't understand what's going on here. Go ahead, Miss Madison. You tell him. Looks like I'm not the star any longer. Well, Lawrence, up to about two weeks ago, you had as nice and gentle a cowpoke working for you as there ever was. Then the Duchess arrived. She wasn't kidding when she claimed to have mingled with nobility, important people. As a matter of fact, she had an inside tip about your ranch and the one next door, Ferguson's place, Glen Valley. Didn't you receive a fantastic offer for your property from a big wine company just recently, Lawrence? Why, yes, I did. So did Ferguson. They were going to merge the two places and make it one of the world's largest vineyards. I didn't know about that part of it. But the Duchess did. She wanted in on the ground floor. That's why she came out here. She tried, tried to talk business with Ferguson, but he'd have none of it. So in one of her boozy moments, she hit upon the idea of doing away with Ferguson. But she didn't have the nerve to go through with it. That's when she approached Jeff here and cut him in on the deal. Jeff was tired of the poor but honest cowboy routine, saw a chance to make some heavy sugar and went along with the gag. Right, Jeff? She's got it straight so far, boss. Jeff, I... 
I can't believe my ears. Oh, that's nothing. Just wait a while. Jeff and the Duchess were out riding one afternoon when, by chance, Ferguson rode up, too, just where the boundaries of the two ranches meet. While the Duchess talked to Ferguson, Jeff sneaked around and back and bashed in his head. They hauled him up to that draw where you bumped into us this afternoon. I know now why you ordered us out of there. On the other side of that snarl of brush in Manzanita, there's a quicksand pit. That is now Ferguson's permanent residence. This is terrible. Terrible. In a hurry to dispose of your late neighbor, they left shoe prints along the bank of the creek. And they also overlooked Ferguson's hat with his initials on it. I'm mighty glad you came by when you did, Lauren. After I had noticed the boot prints, I, I think Jeff was going to dump me into the quicksand, too. <laughs> You're right again. After the boss sent us back in, I sort of figured to get to you tonight instead. And then, Lawrence, you were going to be next. Because in your will, you would name Jeff as your sole heir. Is that right? That, that's right. I, I love him like a son. Then the Duchess and Jeff could have swung a hard bargain with that wine outfit. All very smooth, except for one thing. One thing? I'm kind of curious about that one thing, Miss Matson. Alcohol, Jeff. It's not only lifting to begin with, but also acts as a depressing agent. The Duchess had been imbibing all day, and after dinner she arrived at that point of depression, realized what a horrible thing she had done, and she wrote the full story about the wine company and Jeff's duplicity and made a copy. You were afraid of that yourself, Jeff. That's when you went out and slipped the old girl a lethal mickey. I heard her groaning and went in to investigate. She said it was indigestion, but I knew differently. Her breath. And I knew, too, that she'd be dead within five minutes. Then I saw her shoes, Cuban heels with mud caked on the inner side of the arch. That's when I had a hunch the letter she was writing had a definite meaning. You overlooked it, Jeff. I found it. Where only a woman would think of looking. Tucked inside her bosom. I'm sorry, Lauren. I had you figured wrong from the start. I was the one who was wrong. You aren't hard at all. You're soft as putty. <laughs> well, Jeff, here comes the sheriff. Yeah, so I see. Well, I'm ready for him. You can't beat a royal flush with a pair of deuces. Or should I say, dunces. Ah, oh, go, there won't be any fuss. And all of a sudden, it dawns on me. People should accept their luck. If you're born to be a cowboy, just stay a cowboy. And if you're born a millionaire, don't fight that either. Well, goodbye, Miss Matson. And I'm glad the boss happened along when he did. I don't think quicksand would look good on you. Like Jeff said, he went quietly. No trouble. Too bad he wasn't content to be just a ranch hand, simple and unspoiled. Because as Rembrandt had noticed, he did have wonderful shoulders. He played the guitar, he sang, and he made fine old fashions. All in all, a very nice guy, except for two vices. Kidding from the behind and poisoning. The Valley of the Moon? Oh, I'll go back. It's lovely. After all, one man with a snarl brain can't undo the work of the original master painter. Listen again next week at this same time. For excitement and adventure, just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. <laughs> Heard tonight were Helen Cleave as the Duchess, Lou Tobin as Lawrence, and Clancy Hayes as Jeff. Henry Leff as Inspector Mallard and Jack Thomas as Rembrandt. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and produced by Monty Masters. Sound effects were created by Bill Brownell and Jay Rendon. Eloise Rowan is heard at the organ. The characters in tonight's story are entirely fictitious, and any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. The program came to you from San Francisco. Dudley Manlove speaking. You are tuned for the stars on NBC. From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Janet Gaynor and George Brent in Mrs. Moonlight. (laughs) 
Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater comes to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes. It's made possible because you buy Lux Flakes so regularly. This year, more than ever, you need Lux because it's a luxable year. Stores are full of the new cotton, smart and crisp as iceberg lettuce, rayons and silks and many new textures. They'll all stay new looking longer with Lux. Give them the safe care you give your underthings and stockings. Just one washing failure may wreck a clothes budget, you know. Let me put it this way. It pays in dollars, and it costs only a few cents to use Lux for everything safe in water. Remember, a little goes so far. Lux is thrifty. It's a different type of play we bring you tonight, a most unusual romance of a girl who wished she might never grow old and whose wish came true. Janet Gaynor and George Brent are the stars of Mrs. Moonlight. Louis Silvers directs our orchestra, and Dr. Walter B. Pitkin, author of the famous bestseller, Life Begins at 40, is our special guest. And now, the producer of the Lux Radio Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. I want to join with Melville Ruick in thanking you for your loyal support. You who listen to this program are partners in the Lux Radio Theater. It's for your pleasure that we produce these plays. It's your preference that helps select them, and your purchases of Lux that make this theater possible. Traveling across the country in connection with the opening of Union Pacific, I met a woman who asked me what she could do to express her thanks for the pleasant evenings that this theater had brought her. I told her the best way to show her appreciation was to buy the products behind the Lux Radio Theater, Lux Toilet Soap, and Lux Flakes. Those women in our audience who are not already using these splendid products, and I, I assume there are only a few, will thank me for suggesting their use. And we thank each and every one of you for your loyalty, which makes this theater possible. Some 400 years ago, in a newfound land called Florida, a Spanish explorer, Ponce de Leon, gave up his life on the altar of an age-old quest, the secret of eternal youth. And I doubt if there's anyone in our audience tonight who at some time or other hasn't wondered if there really was some fountain of everlasting youth. This idea has captured man's hope and imagination again and again. Tonight's play, Mrs. Moonlight, is the drama of a woman who finds that secret, a woman who never grows old. But what results from this, the events of our play will tell you. A play starring Janet Gaynor and George Brent, who in real life found the end of their quests here in Hollywood. Miss Gaynor is one of that select company of stars who were once Hollywood extras, an achievement not often duplicated. For the odds against the extra are 10,000 to 1, unless that extra has the talent and determination of a Janet Gaynor. When an Irishman arrives in Hollywood, he can't come with a better background than the University of Dublin and that city's famous Abbey Theatre. George Brent, like the romantic ideal of his countrymen, has followed a quest of adventure as a sailor, diamond miner, stoker, blacksmith, sheep herder, and vagabond, a trail that led eventually to Hollywood. He appears through the courtesy of Warner Brothers Studio and is currently starring in The Rains Came for 20th Century Fox. Tonight he plays Tom Moonlight, and Janet Gaynor is Sarah, as the Lux Radio Theater presents our adaptation of a great Broadway success, Mrs. Moonlight. <laughs> Midsummer night in England. The year is 1881, almost 60 years ago. In a tiny garden facing on the moors, a lovely young girl stands in a dress of shimmering white. Her face is lifted toward the full round moon, and her eyes are bright and shining, for tomorrow is her wedding day. But a dark cloud steals across the moon's face, and from the west comes the deep rumble of thunder. The girl turns, hearing a step in the shadows behind her. Edith? Edith, is that you? Yes. Whatever are you doing out here at this time of night, Sarah? Looking at the moon and thinking how happy I am. Oh, it's going to rain. Only a summer shower. I don't like it. There's a queer feeling in the air tonight. Have you felt it too? It'll be too bad if it rains tomorrow. Oh, it won't. It couldn't. You mustn't tempt Providence, Sarah. <laughs> I'm not afraid of Providence. 
I'm not afraid of anything tonight. I'm going to marry Tom Moonlight. And tomorrow, I'll be Sarah Moonlight. Isn't it the most beautiful name? Hmm. Very beautiful. Edith, you like Tom, don't you? Whatever made you think I didn't? Nothing. Only sometimes when I speak of him, you seem to... Oh, nonsense. It's your imagination. You'd better come in now. In a little while. Tom's stopping by to say good night. But don't you wait up. My maid of honor must look her best tomorrow, too. My best is only a candle beside you. No one will even notice me. Edith. There's Edith Jones, the bride's cousin. What a pity she didn't inherit the family looks. Edith, what is it? Aren't you happy for me? Oh, you know I am, but perhaps I'm a little sad, too. Well, I'm going in. I don't like storms. Good night, Sarah. Good night. Sarah? Sarah? Yes, Minnie? What is it? I have a little something for you, Miss Sarah. Your wedding present. Oh, Minnie, how sweet. <laughs> you do love me, don't you? I've waited on you since you were three. People grow close with time, I suppose. <laughs> well, aren't you going to open it? My present? But I thought tomorrow... Open it now. It's more fitting somehow. Why? Well, it's a strange gift, child. It's called the dreard. The dreard? Oh, I'm sure it must be something very wonderful and very Scotch. It's been in my family for hundreds of years. Nobody knows where it came from first, but it's for you. <gasps> a necklace? Oh, Minnie, how lovely. But why is it called the dreard? I don't rightly know, but there's said to be magic in it. Magic? Aye, there's a legend. It's said that there's one wish granted to every owner. One wish that will come true. One wish. Sometime you may want something badly, Miss Sarah, with all your heart. It may be that you'll use it then. Sarah? Yes, Edith? Your Tom Moonlight is here. Tom! I got away as soon as I could, darling. Oh, I knew you would. Look, I've had a present already from Minnie. A necklace? Well, that's beautiful, Minnie. And there's a legend, Tom. It's not to be talked about. Oh. You must get to bed now, Sarah. It's growing late. I won't keep her five minutes. Five minutes, then. Or I'll come get her myself. Oh, Tom. Tom Moonlight. Do you know I'm very happy? My darling. So happy it frightens me. <laughs> Fasten my necklace. I want to wear it. So you'll be even more beautiful? There. Well, that was close, wasn't it? How still it is after. How unearthly still. Perhaps the gods are standing gaping. Surprised that any mortal could be so lovely. Tom, we must always be as happy as we are now. Nothing must ever change. It never will. Oh, if I could only be sure. You can. Our love will never change. But we'll change. We'll grow old, Tom. You won't like me to look old. I'll always see you just as you are now, Sarah. Just as I married you. As I am now. There, you see? What? Oh, Tom, if you ever stopped loving me, I should die. Stop loving you? When I die, Sarah, and not even then. Our love is forever. Oh, it must be. It must be. It's late. Kiss me goodnight. The last time I shall ever have to leave you. The last time. Good night, my darling. Good night. One wish. One wish to every owner. Oh, Dread. This is my prayer, that I shall never change, that I shall never grow older. Oh, let me look always, just as I do tonight. It's my youth, he loves. Don't let me lose it. Let me keep it always for him. <laughs> Thank you. 
Minnie, do you have to do that dusting right under my nose? If Mrs. Moonlight's cousin's coming, I can't have her see dirt. Well, why didn't you do it this morning? I was busy elsewhere this morning. Well, if you've finished, then run along. Well, don't stand there watching me. After nine years, surely I'm nothing to stare at. I was just thinking that a Scotsman wouldn't forget his wedding anniversary. I did not forget it. Mrs. Moonlight's gift is being delivered any minute. And why aren't you looking after my daughter, as you're supposed to do? Do you mean Jane? Well, who in the world do you suppose I mean? She's with her lovely parents, she is. Do you mean Mrs. Moonlight? Who do you suppose I mean? Ah, uh, Minnie, you're a disagreeable old woman. I've been thinking seriously of giving you notice. Ah, uh, away with you. Consider yourself lucky to be living in the same house with us. With us? With Sarah Moonlight and me and we Jane. Oh, creature, answer the bell. <laughs> it's your poor wee gifty, I expect. And it isn't poor and it isn't we. Good afternoon, Minnie. It's Mrs. Moonlight's cousin. Good afternoon, Thomas. How are you, Edith? Nicely, thank you. Where's Sarah? She's with Jane. Oh, Minnie, will you please inform Mrs. Moonlight that her cousin is here to go to the band concert with us? She doesn't have to. How are you, Edith, dear? Many happy returns of the day, Sarah. Here's my present. Oh, how nice. What is it? Mm, I'm afraid you won't like it. I'm sure I will. Oh, sure. Oh, I mean, but, but what a lovely one. Yes, I knew you wouldn't like it. Oh, but I do, Edith. No, you don't like it because you think shawls are only for old people. Oh, how absurd. You think too much of your age, both of you. Do you think I do, Edith? Well, since you ask me, yes. You dress too young. Several people have mentioned it. Well, they're just envious. Sarah doesn't dress young. She looks young. Well, put it any way you like. But tell me this. Does Sarah look a day older today than she did at 21 or 20 or even 19? Well, no. But is that a crime? Well, I didn't say so. Do you think so? Well, I don't think it's a crime, but... But it is odd. What do you mean by odd? Just odd. I see. Oh, please, please, Edith. Let's, let's forget it. Oh, of course. It was Sarah who asked me. Oh, uh, look, Edith. I got a letter last night from Maud. From your sister Maud? What does she want? She wants to tell me she's just had a baby. Now, why does she think you'd care? She gave up her family when she ran off with that good-for-nothing foreigner. Now answer that, Minnie. Is it a boy or a girl, Sarah? A girl. They've named her Joy. Ironically, I presume. Do they still live in Florence? Of course. His work is there. He's an artist. <laughs> Here it is. Here what is? Where did you get that box, Minnie? That's a little present from me, my dear. Oh, Tom, what is it? Well, open it up and see. <gasps> a dress. Oh, and it's beautiful. It's the most beautiful dress in the world. <laughs> Edith, isn't it lovely? And it's a very pretty frock. Oh, I'll be a queen in it. What trinkets will you wear? Yes. Oh, what jewelry? My crystals, Tom? It wants something with a touch of blue. I don't think I have anything blue. Yes, you have, dear. You know, the what you may call it, the, the dreard. No. Why, Sarah. What is the dreard? Well, it's a necklace made of turquoise. Minnie gave it to her for a wedding present. Then why not wear it, Sarah? No. But you used to like it when we were first married. She doesn't like it, no. Can't you let the bear on the lawn? Well, we'd, we'd better be leaving. I'll get my thing. What's the matter with her today? I don't understand her. She was perfectly all right until... Until what? Oh, nothing. Only I wish you wouldn't talk about her looks, Edith. It always disturbs her. And well, it might. She ought to do something about it. Do? What can she do? She looks young, that's all. Well, all I can say is it's very strange. <laughs> you seem very disappointed this afternoon, but for sure, well, even Edith might have known better. Tom... What is it, dear? I've been meaning to tell you. You must be very, very nice to Edith. Well, I am. Why? You see, she's... Edith's in love with you. Ah, oh, don't be silly. It's true. She always has been. That's why she seems bitter at times. Well, I don't believe it. She probably respects me, but I don't think any more than most other women. <laughs> yes, I suppose they're all in love with you. Except me. You? Why, you adore me, Mrs. Moonlight. I don't. I love you. Dear... Dear Mr. Moonlight. As much as ever. And after nine long years. As much as the first time. Do you remember the first time? Remember? Hmm. You were playing the piano. I was playing this. May I sit beside you, Mrs. Moonlight? No. <laughs> 
<laughs> Tom, don't. But I must kiss you. I can't help myself. Mr. Moonlight, what a way for old married people to behave. Old married people. Why, go over and look at that old married lady in the mirror. I look my ears, Tom. You don't, of course. Oh, Tom. And it's my belief that you never will. Oh, please don't say that. Oh, Sarah, you've got to get over that silly fancy. Oh, I can't. I'm frightened. Frightened? Supposing, Tom, supposing someone should be born who never really did grow any older, what would happen? Well, she'd probably make a fortune in a freak show. Oh, please be serious. Oh, how can I be serious about such nonsense? But just supposing, what do you think would happen? Well, in olden times, she'd probably have been burned as a witch. And nowadays? Nowadays, we have other ways of dealing with witches. Less crude, perhaps, but just as nasty. Why, Sarah, you're trembling. Tom, once I prayed above all things that I should never grow older, look older. I thought you'd stop loving me if I did. Now I think you'll stop if I don't. But you will, darling. Of course you'll look older in time. You'd rather I did? Well, yes, I think I would, but there's quite enough that's miraculous about my wife without that. Oh, it sounds foolish when I talk about it to you, but not when I'm alone. Sometimes I feel I'm going mad and can't stand it any longer. You see, it's growing stronger, not weaker. Every year for years, ever since we've been married. Sarah. Oh, do you think I'm just fanciful? That's all. And you'll always believe, whatever happens, that I love you, won't you? Yes, dear. But nothing can happen. In fact, I promise you that in the morning you look 102. Now, come, darling, I think it's time you went to bed. In a little while. I'm not at all sleepy. You'll come up soon? Yes, soon. Then kiss me goodnight. Good night, my darling. And remember, I love you, Mr. Moonlight. Very, very much. going at this time of night? Minnie, Minnie, I'm never going to look any older. What fool's talk is this? Your necklace, the dreard, and the legend. I know of no legend. I wished, Minnie. It was the night before I was married. I wished that I might never look any older. That legend, Minnie, it was true. No. Can you look at me now and say that? Oh, Miss Sarah. I suppose it was wicked of me to wish. Vain and unnatural. Now, I'm a kind of freak, a witch. We have new methods for burning witches. We burn their dear ones too, Minnie. What is it? What are you going to do? I'm going away, out of their lives. Tom's and Jane. What foolishness is this? Tom growing old beside me. And Jane, a young lady with a mother who didn't change... Oh, I couldn't stand it, nor could they. You'll break their hearts. I'd break them if I'd stay. Where will you go? To Maud, in Florence. Tom Moonlight will find you. He mustn't know, and you must never tell. He must think me dead. Promise. Poor Tom Moonlight. Promise? I promise, if that's the way it must be. Thank you. Goodbye, Minnie. Goodbye. Sarah Moonlight. You'll take care of them, won't you? I... Tom and little Jane. Take good care of them. For me. The curtain falls on Act One of Mrs. Moonlight, starring Janet Gaynor and George Brent. During this short intermission, we meet the Brownings getting ready to go to their summer cottage on the lake. Come on, girls. Help me finish this list. What list, Mother? Things we've got to get on our way through the village before we reach camp. Okay, let's see what you've written down. 
Oh, I see something you've missed. Matches. Oh, please, Mother, put some marshmallows on the list, too. Well, Midge, we can't toast marshmallows right away. We'll have a lot of cleaning up to do. Dishes to wash. Everything will be dusty. Oh, dear, a big dishwashing job. Hmm, that means Lux. Is it on the list? Yes. It won't take long with Lux. Gosh, wouldn't it be awful to be stuck at camp with no luck? Have to fool around forever with pokey cake soap. Or ruin our hands with wash day soap. <laughs> then you wouldn't have those rose petal hands Archie Smith raves about, would you, Dot? I don't mean that at all. Anyhow, you know perfectly well Lux is the nicest way to do dishes, isn't it, Mother? Oh, of course it is, dear. I want you girls to have nice hands, so don't worry. There'll always be plenty of Lux in the house. Wise Mother Browning. People notice red, rough hands right away. They certainly rob a woman of charm. That's why it's so important to wash dishes with Lux. There's an amazing difference between Lux and harsh wash day soaps. Your hands feel it when you touch those soft Lux suds. And your hands show it, too. They soon look so much softer and prettier. Did you ever realize this? Lux flakes are as gentle as the finest toilet soap. They haven't any of those alkaline suds builders that sting and irritate your skin. And yet, Lux for dishes costs almost nothing. Why, a lot of women find that just one big box will do their dishes for about 60 meals. So be sure to get the thrifty big box of Lux Flakes right away and use it for dishes every day. And now, here's Mr. DeMille. Act Two of Mrs. Moonlight, starring Janet Gaynor in the title role and George Brent as Tom. <laughs> Seventeen years have passed since the night Sarah Moonlight fled from her family because she knew she could never grow old. Unable to find a trace of her, Tom Moonlight has picked up the broken threads of his life. He's been married for many years to Sarah's cousin, Edith, and is enjoying a middle-aged happiness. Jane, the young daughter Sarah left behind her, is now a woman old enough for marriage. One of her suitors, Percy Medling, has come to call. In the living room of the Moonlight home, he leans toward her, a desperate look in his eyes. You're not listening, Jane. Of course I'm listening, but can't you tell me some other time, Percy? I'd rather tell you now, Jane. But we're expecting a guest. Minnie's gone to the station to meet her. Yes, I know, but... It's a brand new cousin. You mean a baby? Oh, no, silly. She's only a year or two younger than I. They've lived in Italy for years. We've never even seen her. Jane, I'm sorry to interrupt, but if you have a guest coming, I must say what I have to say quickly. Now, as to my present occupation, engineering is quite a respectable occupation, and the firm is well-established and an old one. Furthermore, my father would be regarded by many people as being, so to speak, in a very comfortable position. Percy, are you proposing to me? Well, yes, I was coming to that in a moment. May I advise you, Percy, the next time you want a girl to marry you, just say, Jane, I love you. Unless, of course, her name is Mary. You mean it's... No good, then. I'm afraid not, Percy. You see, I don't love you. Oh. I'm very sorry, Percy. Jane, there isn't any other. I mean, you're, you're not in love with someone else, are you? I don't know. But you must have some idea. I mean, well... Willie Rag is coming over a little later. Willie Rag. Oh, I see. That's your guest, Minnie. The only one getting off. Nice looking young woman, too. Yes. That's her. Sarah. Miss Sarah. How are you, Minnie? Sarah Moonlight. Let me look at you. Come into the light. No. I haven't changed, if that's what you mean. Still young. Still a girl. Only in looks, Minnie. Not in my heart. Oh, my poor darling. Was I right to come? I had to see them again, Tom and Jane. But they won't know me. You promised. They'll think that you're Maud's daughter, Joy, who resembles her aunt, Sarah Moonlight. To them, Sarah Moonlight has been dead for 17 years. And ghosts don't often come back, do they? No. 
The carriage is over here. How is he, Minnie? Tom Moonlight? Oh, he's well. Happy enough, I dare say. Edith makes him a good wife, doesn't she? Mm, yes. Yes. She was always in love with him. Tell me about yourself. Where do you live? In Vienna now. I was seven years in Florence, then eight in Paris. People begin to wonder after a few years, so I have to keep moving on. You, uh, you have money enough? Mm, money enough for me. My music helps. Pupils and concerts. And it's good for me. There's no time to feel sorry or to think of him. And Jane, Minnie, what is she like, my Jane? Like you, mostly. I suppose she'll be marrying soon. Very likely. There are two young men. Very nice young men, I hope. Percy Middling is. And uh, Willie Rag. Well, <laughs> him you can judge for yourself. He'll be at the house, most likely. You're late, Willie. The third time this week. Late again. Willie left his little Jane, but Willie soon came back again. <laughs> I made that up on my way. Jane, you haven't kissed me yet. You haven't asked me. Please, Miss Moonlight, may I kiss you? Yes, you may. Twice. Once. Twice. <laughs> Where have you been? I've been to Newmarket. Oh, have you got the job? No, but I probably shall, or something else. Oh, Willie. Now, there's nothing to worry about. Oh, but there is. You know how Father feels. He says you're irresponsible. Irresponsible? I? It's blasphemous. Oh, I say, he can't hear me, can he? <laughs> no. Good. And if he won't give his consent, I'll marry you without it. Oh, Willie, please be serious. But I am. Oh, we thought you were alone, Jane. Come in, Father. Come in, Mother. How are you, Mr. Bragg? Very well, ma'am. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Has Minnie returned yet, Jane? No, Father. Well, I think I'll meet her on the road. Oh, please, sir, if I might have a word with you, sir. A word with me? I think you know what it's about. I have an inkling. I'm going to marry your daughter, sir. Oh, yes? Oh, uh, Father, Willie doesn't mean it quite like that. Mr. He... Bragg is a bit blunt. I believe in speaking out, sir. A fine quality, and I believe in it, too. I also believe, young man, that at the present time you have no position or any prospect of one. Under those conditions, I don't quite see how you can speak of marriage. I regret your disapproval, sir, but I must tell you that I won't let it stand in my way. Really? Willie, don't say any more. Father, you don't understand. Mm, evidently not. Tom, wait. Minnie is here. I'll speak to you later, Mr. Rag. Well, why doesn't she come in? Minnie! Your visitor is here, Mr. Moonlight. Come in, Miss Joy. Good evening. Oh. Why? Why, she's... She's the image of... Tom, don't. How are you, my dear? I'm very well, thank you. I am your Aunt Edith. And this is... This is... Mr. Moonlight. Yes, we're... We're very happy to see you, George. Thank you. This is my stepdaughter, Jane. I've been looking forward to your coming. Jane. What? What's the matter, dear? Well, Mother, she's so pale. Well, she's tired out. She's had a long journey. Yes. Yes, a, a very long journey. Sarah? Yes? It's almost time for your train, Sarah. I know, Minnie. The days have passed quickly, Sarah. Too quickly. Oh, there was so much I wanted to do. And now it's all slipped away from me. Oh, Minnie. She must be happy. My Jane must be happy. If I knew she was going to be, I could leave in peace. You're talking of Willie Rag now. Yes. Why can't she see, Minnie? Why doesn't she know? And why am I so powerless to help her? I'm her mother, Minnie. And I can't lift my hand. A half an hour past nine. It best be making ready. The night train is always on time. The night train. I left once before at night. Long ago. Hush, my darling. You'll come again. After another 20 years. Oh, what's the use, Minnie? If only to see us all. To see you all growing old without me. To feel left behind. Sarah, my darling. Joy. May I see you? Jane, of course. Come in. It's rather private. Minnie, will you leave us alone? Very well. 
What is it, Jane? Well, it's about Willie. I want you to talk to Father. Tell him what you what you think of him. But what I think of Willie is really very much what your father thinks of him. Joy, but can't you see what Willie is? Yes, I've been worried that you can't. Oh, really, Joy? I thought you at least would be on my side. My dear, I am on your side. That's what Mother says. But middle-aged people have forgotten what love is. Not always, Jane. Are you very disappointed in me? No, but I thought you'd understand, that's all. Jane, will I see you before I go? Of course. Why do you ask? Well, it's a late train. I thought you might be tired. No, I'll wait up to see you go. Thank you, Jane. Is that you? No. Oh, Miss Joy. Do you want her, Mr. Rag? I'll call her down. No, 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 no. Not, not yet. Come down yourself. Oh, this is a bit of luck. Finding you alone, I mean. I'm afraid I'm rather busy. Oh, I say, I've been waiting three weeks for a chance to talk to you. You mustn't dodge me now. Not on your last night. Do you know, Joy, do you know that you're a very beautiful creature? You really think so? Oh, now, don't be modest. If I didn't have Jane, I might go clear over my head. Oh, thank you. May I sit beside you? Certainly. Why? Well, why does a fellow ever want to sit beside a pretty woman? Usually because he wants to kiss her. That's why. Why did you do that? I don't know. I've been wanting to ever since I first saw you. Are you angry? I'm not sure yet. Have you forgotten, Jane... Of course not. I adore Jane, but... But what? Well, hang it all, I'm not married yet, you know. And if you are angry about my kissing you, I can only say... I'm sorry. I didn't say I was angry. I may not be angry at all. You know, Joy, you're a strange girl. Yes, I am. You're not like any of the girls I've known. You're different. You... I want to see you again, Joy. You must let me. I'm going to Paris. I'll follow you. Where will you be? What address? Please tell me. Numero 82. And the rest? Rue d'Alger. Rue d'Alger. Hadn't you better write it down? Do you think I could forget it? Joy, listen, I can't leave tonight, but I'll follow you. Look for would me. Would it be rude uh, if I asked to come in? Uh, uh, Jane, I didn't hear you. Perhaps I walked too softly. Believe me, I didn't mean it. <laughs> uh, I was just telling Joy goodbye. Was that it? Of course. <clears throat> well... I really must run. Goodbye, Joy. And goodbye, Jane. Darling. See you tomorrow. Night. Jane. Jane, dear. Don't come near me. Don't touch me. You're vile. Jane, don't say that. You are. You're vile. You're unclean. I heard you. I heard everything you said. Now go on. Go to Paris. Wait for him there. He'll make you very happy, I'm sure. But at least he hasn't the chance to make you unhappy. You see Don't now... Don't speak to me. I hate you. I hate you. Jane. Father, make her go. Make her leave. Get her away from here. Jane, what is it? I can't bear the sight of her, I tell you. Are you mad? She wanted Willie. Well, she may have him. And you needn't worry any longer about me, Father. I'll marry Percy just as you wanted. I'll marry Percy Middling and be miserable all my life. Now are you satisfied? Joy, I'm sorry for this. I'm sure she's just upset, that's all. Oh, please don't be polite. Well, I'd better leave. I'll miss my train. Are you disappointed in me? I don't even know the facts. Jane told you. I've stolen her young man. But I didn't want him. I'd rather have Jane's love than anything in the world. Then why did you do it? You were against the marriage. Certainly I was. I knew they'd never be happy. So did I. Did you? And there's talk about Paris. He wanted to follow me. I gave him the wrong address, a made-up one. I only wanted Jane to see what he was really like. Why, you... you funny child. When Jane is over this, will you tell her what I've told you? Of course I will. Promise? I promise. Mr. Moonlight, are you happy? Yes, of course. Why? Oh, I knew you were, really. I just wanted to hear you say it. What a strange, strange girl you are, Joy. You're the second person who said that tonight. 
Oh, there's my carriage. I don't want to go back. I don't want to go yet. You may stay if you want to. No, I can't. Goodbye, Mr. Moonlight. Goodbye. I shall miss you very much, Joy. You're very much like... Like someone I once knew. Someone I loved. Dear Mr. Moonlight, will you kiss me goodbye? Goodbye, dear. Come soon again, won't you? Soon? Perhaps. for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. You have just heard Act Two of Mrs. Moonlight, starring Janet Gaynor and George Brent. During the intermission, we present a very famous guest. But first, a piece of news about a penny. Do you know what a penny a day can do for your hands? Here's what I mean, and see if you don't think it's a beauty bargain. About a penny's worth of luxe will do a whole day's dishes. Yes, for about the price of a penny postage stamp, you can use gentle lux, as beauty experts advise, to help your hands stay soft and white. If the water is hard, just a little extra lux will soften it and give you an abundance of suds. How foolish to use harsh soaps, since it costs almost nothing to use Lux for dishes. So keep that thrifty big box handy. Use it for dishes every day. Remember, you're often judged by your hands. Make them speak well of you. Mr. DeMille escorts our guest to the microphone. Columbia University has on its faculty a memorable personality in Professor Walter B. Pitkin. Academic duties occupy only a part of his prodigious energy. He's also famous as an author. Professor Pitkin has passed the age of 40 far enough to uh, know what he's talking about. He decided that middle age and old age were nothing to dread. So he wrote a book about his discovery with the challenging title, Life Begins at 40, which held a place among bestsellers. The author of this book should have some interesting comment on the problem of Sarah Moonlight. So from New York City, we hear Professor Walter B. Pitkin. Mrs. Moonlight in our play tonight is indeed a very unusual character. Yet her wish is the secret wish of every man and woman since the beginning of time. The desire for perpetual youth lies deep in the hearts of every one of us. We think it's the road to perpetual happiness. And yet, how wrong we are in our wishful thinking and how pitiful the consequences Think of the matron of 40 who tries to be 20. Think of the dowager of 60 who tries to be kittenish. If they only realized each age has its own special loveliness. How delightful is the charm of a five-year-old. But would you want to be five forever? And how rich and beautiful the charm of a 70-year-old grandmother. I agree with Samuel Butler that youth is a greatly overrated season, like spring. Occasionally sunny, but usually full of raw gusts. Youth is lovable, but immature. But middle age and old age are as deep as character, and character can be as deep as the universe. Nature is always moving forward. If you attempt to stop the march, you die, mentally and spiritually. Life insists that we grow as we live each new day as it comes, reaching out to accept new responsibilities and new experiences. And it is those enriching experiences that give us beauty and charm and keep us young and alive. People who keep up with the times, people who never try to stop the clock, people who refuse to be perpetually 20, they are the ones who know that life is just beginning at 40. We cannot condemn youth and its lack of wisdom, but we do condemn age, 
which refuses to accept its own rich rewards. And now let us return to Mrs. Moonlight. I don't know how this play turns out, but I do know that Mrs. Moonlight is basically a splendid woman. And I have faith that somehow she will be able to discover a solution to her problem and that she will find happiness. Mm, you show us that autumn has beautiful colors, Professor. In Hollywood again, we continue our play, Mrs. Moonlight, starring Janet Gaynor and George Brent. Years have passed, long years, which have gradually dimmed the remembrance of Sarah Moonlight and Joy. It's the present day, and many changes have come to the Moonlights. Edith is dead, and Jane and Percy Middling, married for 20 years, live on with old Tom Moonlight. Meanwhile, in the cities of Europe, a strange figure moves silently, always alone, always young, never changing in a changing world. In a music school in Bucharest, this strange girl, known only as Miss Sarah, faces the master in his room. Miss Sarah, how long have you been with us now? Twelve years. Twelve years. Yeah. Had not realized it was that long. Miss Sarah, what I have to say is not easy. But some of the other teachers, they, they feel... They feel there's something strange about me. Yeah. Of course, I know that it is ridiculous, but... Uh... Oh, don't say any more. I'll leave in the morning. Oh, oh no, no, Miss Sarah, you... It's happened before. It'll happen again. What is it about you? What is it? Uh, where will you go, Miss Sarah? Oh, I don't know. To Paris, to Berlin, Naples. It is not easy to find work in strange cities. They're not strange to me. And you want to work here, Miss Sarah? Uh, Miss Sarah, haven't I seen you somewhere? I don't remember. Uh, it's a long time ago. I don't remember. I am sorry, but I have nothing for you. Good day, Signor. The concert season in Paris is well booked, Mademoiselle. If will your name? I am called Miss Sarah. Miss. Of course, I remember you. You played here in 1904. You. What? That is impossible. Yes. Yes, you've mistaken me for someone else, monsieur. But you say you are. No. Good day, monsieur. And do you want to teach my daughter? Yes. I can give your daughter lessons every day. Just as you gave them to me? What? You gave me lessons, too? No. You did? And I was a girl. Oh, no. You. I remember. I remember. Miss Sarah. No. 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 And the ticket was to Vienna, Fräulein? Yes, to Vienna. I... No. No, I want to go to England. To London. Yeah, Fräulein. First class? No, third, please. Third class to London. See you tomorrow, Peter. Right you are. Thanks for the lift. Oh, it's a pleasure. I say, Peter, is that somebody waiting for you? Where? Uh, that woman by your steps, looking up at the house. I don't know who she is. I've noticed her hanging around the house several times the last few days. Well, why don't you ask her what she wants? I believe I will. Goodbye, Greg. <laughs> Bye. I beg your pardon, but, but are you looking for someone? No, not exactly. You look ill. Uh, would you like to come in for a moment? Uh, this is my house. Your house? What is your Christian name? Why, why, Peter. Peter. Peter Middling. Your father is Percy Middling, and your mother is Jane. How did you know that? And your grandfather. Is he dead? No, he's not dead. Oh. Oh, here, here, here wait a moment. Oh, don't go away. Why, you're cold and ill. Come inside and get warm. Oh, no. No, no, I mustn't. Nonsense. Well, a hot drink will do you good. Come along now. Will you wait here a moment, please? Thank you. Mother. Peter, come in. I, I say, Mother, I've, uh, 
I, I brought a woman into the house. Peter. Oh, no, no, listen. I, I think she's ill. She looks it. Who is the woman? I haven't the faintest idea, Father. But she knew my name and seemed to know all about me. She knew your name? Oh, hello, Minnie. Why, yes. Who do you suppose it is, Minnie? I, I don't know. How could I? I'll go and have a look at her. I suppose she's a very beautiful Peter. No. She's rather ragged and and young like a girl. But her eyes are too big and... Well, there, there, there's something strange about her. Come in, please. Thank you. Good evening. How do you do? Come and sit down by the fire. Are you my... Are you Peter's mother? Yes, I am. Yes. I thought you were. You're very lovely. Would you like something hot to drink? And that is Percy Nibbling. How do you know that? You mustn't ask me questions. Please sit down. Thank you. Well, I'm all right, really. It's just that lately I've had a kind of pain here in my heart. Peter, come and sit near me. You've got to tell me all about yourself. Are you at Oxford or Cambridge? Oxford. Like your grandfather. How did you know that? Who are you? Poor, puzzled Jane. I'm just an old lady, my dear, who's rather come down in the world. Old? Why, you're a girl. That... that picture on the table. It's Tom Moonlight, isn't it? Yes, it is. Was it just taken? This picture? That... Oh, that was taken a good ten years ago. May I see him? I'm afraid not. He's very feeble. His memory's gone, and he really doesn't recognize people. He hasn't recognized any of us for months. Poor Mr. Moonlight. He hasn't really been the same since my grandmother died. You... your grandmother. You mean Edith? Yes. Oh, I say, if, if you're an old friend of grandfather's, perhaps you could come tomorrow and see him. She can see him now. Minnie, you brought him down? Father. Tom. Tom Moonlight. Who? Who is that over there? Father. He doesn't know you, Mother. He's staring at her. Oh, my dear. I've been asleep. Yes, Tom. Has Edith gone? Edith? Yes, dear. She's gone. Well, that's good. I'm worried about Edith. Worried about what you told me this evening. I've been thinking it over, and I believe you're right. Edith is in love with me. Of course she is, darling. We all are. Ah, uh, including you, eh? A little while ago it was all, except you. Was it, Mr. Moonlight? Perhaps I've grown older since then. Have you indeed? Well... I'll tell you a secret. I never believed you. You love me very much indeed. Clever Mr. Moonlight. Grandfather, who is she? Who is she? Why, that's my wife, young man. Who are you? I? I'm Peter. Well, I don't know you, sir. And I don't much want to. Grandfather, what is your wife called? She's called Sarah, of course. Sarah Moonlight. Percy, he thinks it's his first wife. What are they saying? Don't they like my Sarah? Well, of course they do. Especially me. I think she's lovely. Well, she is, too. And what's more, she doesn't change. Did you know that? She doesn't change. Now, what's that about changing? She's worried about that. I don't like that. I've forgotten it. Tom, shall I play for you again? Huh? Yes, yes. You always like this. May I sit beside you, Mrs. Moonlight? I'm a very lucky man, Mrs. Moonlight. And a very, very happy man. Yes, dear. And you're a very happy woman, Mrs. Moonlight. Very happy. I think I've never been so happy in my life as I am now. And I'm certain of this. Mrs. Moonlight, 
I could never, never be happy with any woman but you. That's what you think, Mr. Moonlight. It's what I know. Well, Sarah, well, I think I'll go to bed now. I'm feeling tired and sleepy. Yes, dear. I'll take him upstairs. So tired, Sarah. So very, very tired. Father. Uh, Peter, get some brandy. Oh, my darling. My darling. Percy, you and Peter get him upstairs. No. Stay here, all of you. He'll want her. I know. Come along, please. Thank you. Thank you, Minnie. She's been up there with him a long time. Over half an hour. Percy, I'm nervous. Oh, it's all right, my dear. Well, there's nothing to be nervous about, Mother. Why does Father think he knows her? After all, my dear, your father hasn't known anyone for months, and it's just as reasonable that he might think he knows this girl. No, there's something else. But I won't say it. I, I'm afraid. Wait, here's Minnie. Minnie, how is Father? Your father... Your father... Is dead. Really? Oh, really? She was with him. He was in her arms. Minnie, who is that girl? She's someone Mr. Moonlight knew a long time ago. Minnie, come in, dear. Peter, get her a chair. I'm quite all right. All right, thank you. I'm not unhappy. It was really very, very beautiful. It would be wicked to be unhappy. I'm only, only very tired. I wonder why I'm so tired. Please sit down. You'll feel better in a minute. Thank you, Peter. He just said to me, I love you, Mrs. Moonlight. Very very dearly. He just said that. He looked happy, too. Jane. Yes? Give me your hand. I'm so pleased with you, Jane. I've always liked your nice Percy Midland. And you've done well together, haven't you? A nice boy and a nice home. Oh, I'm so tired. I love you, Mrs. Moonlight, very, very dearly. Jane, do I look happy? Very happy. Are you? Oh, oh, so happy. It's funny to be so tired here in my heart. Perhaps, perhaps, oh, oh, how lovely. Now, Lord, let us, thou, thy servant, depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen, mine eyes have seen. Mother, look at her. She, she's... She's at peace. With Tom Moonlight. Mother. It's all right, Peter. I'm sure she's happy. See how she's smiling. Falls on Act Three of Mrs. Moonlight, starring Janet Gaynor and George Brent. In a moment, our stars return for their curtain calls. But first, a timely word. Here we are at the beginning of summer, and that means vacation time, doesn't it? Vacation time for you, but not for your hands. Did you ever think of that? You're right, Mr. Roy. 
My hands work harder in the summer than in the winter. But with gardening, swimming, tennis, and... And housekeeping? Oh, yes, housekeeping, of course. My hands show it, too. Well, you're just the person I want to talk to. Now's the time your hands are busier than ever. They need special care. They can't spend hours in the dishpan with harsh, biting suds drying them up and then do a right-about face and look nice when company comes. You need Lux for every single soap and water job you do, and especially for your dishes. Do you know why? Because Lux has none of the alkaline suds builders found in many laundry soaps. Lux contains nothing to dry and roughen your skin. That's why beauty experts recommend it for dishes. And remember, a little goes so far. Lux is thrifty. Buy the generous large size box and start now to save your hands. Mr. DeMille. The moonlight of our play has faded, so suppose we get back to the world of reality. Miss Gaynor, I've heard some whispers about you that I'd like to pin down right now. Well, uh, what are these whispers, Mr. DeMille? Well, they're about painting and... Uh... Oh, I'm sure it was an exaggeration. But if you're looking for a hobby, there's George Brent's, a gentle pastime called polo. The question was about paint, not ponies. There's really nothing to it. Something around the house always needs paint. Kitchen table, the lawn chair, the cupboard. A landscape or a still life. I'm afraid my watercolors are pretty amateurish. But the furniture painting, well, now that's quite professional. Mm -hmm. Could George and I persuade you to do a sketch of us, say, with me sitting in a chair and George standing behind with his hand on my shoulder? <laughs> I'd be delighted to, but I'm afraid portraits are beyond me. If you draw a picture of an orange and it doesn't look like an orange, you can always say it's impressionistic. That doesn't go with portraits, at least not when the living originals do the judging. Why hasn't somebody seen one of these pictures? Mm, I keep them locked up. Yes. But you can look at the lawn chairs I paint at any time. <laughs> I used a special weatherproof paint. We could have used some of that and the rains came. I doubt if there has ever been so much rain in California before. <laughs> <laughs> and photographing rain is a difficult operation, too. It has to be done on a clear day to get enough light. Yes, yes. Well, if it was a cloudy day and looked like rain, we made sunshine scenes indoors on a soundstage. Now, that's not so crazy as it seems if you think it over. Mm. Well, I'll figure it? it out on the way home. <laughs> and I think it's time to leave now. Well, I recognize a gentle hint. Good night, C.B. Mm. I hope the man in the moonlight and Mrs. Moonlight shine long in clear skies. All of you, I'm sure, will want to join us again a week from tonight when you hear the announcement of our stars and play, which Mr. DeMille brings you in a moment. Assisting in our cast tonight were Janet Young as Minnie, Jane Gilbert as Jane, Ted Osborne as Willie Ragg, Claire Vadera as Edith, James Eagles as Peter... Eric Snowden as Percy Midling, Lou Merrill as Heinrich, Frank Nelson as Bonelli, Jane Morgan as Frau Muller, and Eddie Kane as ticket agent. The play Mrs. Moonlight was written by Ben W. Levy. Louis Silvers appeared through courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studio, where he directed music for Second Fiddle. Don't miss the Lux Daytime Radio program, The Life and Love of Dr. Susan. This human and gripping story of a young, attractive woman doctor is brought to you every afternoon, Monday through Friday. For the time and station, see your newspaper. The Life and Love of Dr. Susan comes to you in addition to the Lux Radio Theater. Your host, Mr. DeMille. Scattered along the boundary between the United States and Mexico are colorful, exciting jumping-off places called border towns. To such a place we take you next Monday night in a melodrama of a disillusioned man who crushes his ideals in a scramble for money and power. Into his life come two girls, and the mark they leave upon it is told in our adaptation of the hit picture, Border Town. And bringing Border Town to our microphone are three stars, outstanding in popularity and talent. Donna Michi, Joan Bennett, and Claire Trevor. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Donna Michi, Joan Bennett, and Claire Trevor in Border Town. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. The announcer has been Melville Roy. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Carol Lombard and James Stewart in The Moon's Our Home. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. I seem to remember telling a certain young lady a few years ago that she'd never get anywhere in pictures. I believe I said she didn't take herself seriously enough. Well, I've long since eaten those words about Carol Lombard. And tonight we bow low and welcome her to the Lux Radio Theater on the arm of James Stewart, her co-star in the captivating comedy The Moon's Our Home. Paramount gave it to the screen... And we give it to you now as our prescription for raising your spirits at least 100%. It's a madcap love story of two famous and rather temperamental people. One a screen star, the other a combination author and explorer. I know you'll approve our casting of Carol Lombard and James Stewart for these parts. And we have a great respect for you who are out there beyond the footlights. A great respect for your choice of plays and players and your constructive criticism of this theater. And another thing we respect is your good opinion of Lux Flakes. What pleases me is that so many of you are self-appointed members of our research staff, because each week a large number of you tell us about some new use that you've discovered for our product. I'm sure you've all learned that you can depend on Lux Flakes, all except perhaps a very few who haven't tried it yet. And I hope those few will learn in the very near future say, the first thing tomorrow morning. But the first thing on this schedule now is to raise the curtain on Act One of The Moon's Our Home, starring James Stewart as Anthony Amberton and Carol Lombard as Cherry Chester. <laughs> on the lot at Paragon Studios stands the dressing room bungalow of Miss Cherry Chester, star of Paragon Pictures. In the bungalow stands Miss Chester herself. She has a wild look in her eye and a vase in each hand. The lovely voice that has thrilled audiences throughout the world can now be heard all over the studio lot. I won't, I won't, I won't! Stop throwing things! I won't do it, you hear me? I won't! You missed me, dear. You must be overtrained. Oh, Boise, darling, I'm a beast. My own darling nurse who's taken care of me since I was a child. I might have hurt you. There was a good chance of it. Oh, Boise, if I ever did, oh, I'd blow my brains out. I know, and I'd have to tidy up afterwards. Now sit down. We must discuss this calmly and sanely. Your grandmother demands that you come to New York at once. Blast my grandmother. I'm sick of having Lucy Van Steeden run my life. Why doesn't she leave me alone? Because she's fond of you in her somewhat specialized way. And it worries her when you get mixed up with a lot of Egyptians. Oh, Boise, Prince Ali's only one Egyptian, a very small one at that. Lucy ought to stop reading the gossip columns. They're too old for her. Listen to me. You know, you've got to go to New York, Cherry. I am not going to New York, and don't call me that foolish name. Well, Sarah Brown, then. And don't call me that either. I don't look like a Sarah. That's what you were christened. I was there when it happened. And Cherry or Sarah, you'll go to New York. Your grandmother gets her way. She always does. Well, this will be a nice change for her because baby's not going. For once in my life, I'm going to do what I want to do. She asks very little of you. Only my right eye. Oh, dear. Sometimes I wish I had a nice, restful job as a night nurse in a psychopathic ward. Oh, I know. I'm awful, Boise. But I'll be an angel from now on. I promise an absolute angel. That's my good girl. Now, run in and change your clothes. Hedda Manning from Movie Universe is coming to interview you. I won't be interviewed. I won't do it. I won't. I won't. Drop that lamp, my absolute angel. Oh, oh, boy, so you're wonderful. Put the lamp down. All right, darling. That's more like it. I'll go put on something that makes you look sweet and friendly. But I want to be aloof. I want to be mysterious. Don't try that. You're not Swedish. Now go get dressed and stop acting like an actress. But I am an actress, boy, see. First an actress, then a woman. My art comes before anything else. Save that for the interview, Sarah Brown. This is me you're talking to, not your press agent. This is Miss Chester, Miss Manning. How do you do, Miss Chester? How do you do, Miss Manning? I'm so sorry that I kept you waiting. 
But the moments fly by on silvery wings when one is lost in Tolstoy. Oh, you're interested in literature, Miss Chester? Interested? Oh, there's nothing I like better than to hide away by myself with a book. A good book. Oh, well, you may write that down. Thank you. But frankly, Miss Chester, I'd like to do an article closer to the hearts of our readers, like uh, love and marriage. Yes, that would be quite original, love and marriage. Let me see. Marriage should be like a ski jump, sudden, swift, reckless. Starting on the heights, leaping into the void, never knowing the end, never caring, breathless, defiant, exhilarating. I, I see what you mean. Oh, in love. There's only one way I could fall in love. Not as Cherry Chester, the actress, but as a plain, ordinary girl. I could only fall in love with a man I didn't know and who didn't know me. There should be nothing but us two, the man and the woman. No past, perhaps no future. Just the magnificent present. Oh, my. That's it. That's what I want. Oh, they're going to eat this up, Miss Chester. Oh, oh Miss. What is it, Hilda? I'm, I'm afraid it's another telegram from your grandmother. I thought I told you to take those telegrams and... Oh, thank you, Hilda, for bringing it to me. Just, just put it down. Yes, Miss. Well, I, I mustn't take any more of your time. Thank you so much. I know our readers will adore every word you've said. Goodbye, Miss Manning. Thank you. Well... If I recall your last interview, you were all for athletics. You hopped over a couple of fences to prove it. Romance was out, and you were wedded to the open air. That was the last interview. But you know, Boise, th there's something in what I just said to that woman. Well, if there is, it certainly escaped me. Read your telegram. All that about falling in love with a man you don't know and who doesn't know you. Oh, that's romance. But not for you, darling. If I know you, he'll have to Boise, be... Boise! What's the matter? This telegram is... Hilda! Hilda! Quick! Boise, call the railroad station and get a reservation to New York. But what are the... Hilda, go home, pack everything, everything. We're leaving for New York. Oh! Boise, don't stand there as if you were painted on the wall. Do something. Do you mind explaining what this is all about? You find I understand English like a native. It's Granny. It's my own darling grandmother. She's ill. Maybe she's dying. Oh, I've got to get to her right away. Hilda, hurry. It's Granny. Lucy Van Speeden. Hot or cold, she gets her way. <laughs> I can't sign all your books. I'd like to, but really, I haven't time. Conductor, we should have left five minutes ago. What's holding this train? Sorry, Miss Chester. We're waiting for a guy named Anthony Amberton. Hey, Anthony Amberton's here. Anthony Amberton! Anthony Amberton! Anthony Amberton! Anthony Amberton! Well, that seems to interest everybody. Who is this Anthony Amberton? He's a writer. Movies? Books. My wife reads herself to sleep with him. Oh, one of those writers. Yeah. Women of the Torrid Countries by Anthony Amberton. Below the Equator by Anthony Amberton. Igloo Nights by the author of Melee, Day by Day. Just between you and me, he gives me a pain. Just between you and me, he gives me a bigger one. Come on, dear. I've just bought a book for you to read. Astride the Himalayas by Anthony Amberton. Oh, you too. Oh, please, please. No, I can't. I've got to get on the train. Porter, where's my car? Right this way, Mr. Amberton. Oh, excuse me. Not now, please. Now, I'll miss my train. In here, sir. Quick, will you get me out of this? Your compartment's this way, sir. Boy, headhunters in the jungle, autograph hunters in Los Angeles, savages everywhere. I, I've climbed Mount Everest. I've swum the Hellespont. I've crossed the Andes on a llama. I never went through anything like that before. Right in here, sir. Oh, sanctuary. Yes, sir. Certainly it's nice to have you with us, Mr. Amberton. I'm a kind of explorer myself. I got as far as Honolulu one time. Oh, you did? Huh? Well, good for you. Well, we'll swap travel logs in the morning. Until then, I don't want to see a single soul. You understand? I'll have dinner in here. Yes. Uh, that time I was telling you about in Honolulu... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, goodbye. And uh, here, buy yourself a ukulele. Yes. Um, oh, we got another celebrity on board, Mr. Amberton. Miss Cherry Chester. Cherry Chester? Well, nobody's named Cherry Chester. Well, she says she... Well, what is Cherry Chester? Some kind of new soft drink or something? What no, sir. It? She's a moving picture star. Oh, oh, well, I never go to pictures. Those marshmallow-faced movie stars make me sick. Yes, sir. Now, give me the simple, primitive woman, the woman of long silences, consuming in love, enduring in marriage. Yes, sir. Me too. Cherry Chester. Huh. Emberton. Sounds like a hero in a costume picture. Let's see that book, dear. Anthony Emberton, The Great Adventure. I'll bet he's lost without his hot water bottle. Anthony Emberton, he makes me sick. Come 
Come here. Hello, Anthony. Welcome to New York. Hello, Holbrook. Nice of you to meet me. Al, how are things in the publishing world? Just marking time till the next Amberton bestseller. Where's your luggage? Oh, the porter took it. I'm waiting for that crowd to clear off the platform. I sort of wanted to sneak into New York quietly, yeah, just for a change. Oh, but Anthony, that crowd yeah, isn't don't here. don't tell me about crowds. And that way, all the way across the corner. You know, it's a funny thing, isn't it? If I were still Samuel Smith, heir to the Smith plumbing supplies, they wouldn't even notice me. But now that I'm Anthony Amberton, the boy explorer, well, just look out there. Look at me. Anthony, I, uh... I'm afraid your devoted publisher is your only crowd. Well, no, but the headhunters, look, they're out in full force. Yes, but uh, you see, Cherry Chester came in on this train, too. Who? Oh, oh, that movie, Marshall. Huh? Well, she probably lives on this sort of thing. I loathe women like that. Give me the simple, primitive woman, the woman of long silence. Well, I'm only a publisher, but I'll see what I can do. Oh, yeah. Well, let's go as long as they aren't here to see me. Come on, Gina, I can't stop now. The boys can get me out of here. I've got to get home to Granny. Well, where is he? Where's Granny? Don't tell me I'm too late. I'll... Well. Granny, oh, Granny, darling. Come here to me, Sarah Brown. Granny, why aren't you in bed? Let me look at you. You're thinner. Well, we'll change that. <laughs> you look fairly healthy, though. Yes. But you're the one that's ill, I believe. I? I never had a sick day in my life. Lucy, Lu you, you, you old folk. Thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy, you're magnificent. I, I thought you were dying that telegram. <laughs> it was a dirty trick. But anything's fair when you want to see your granddaughter as much as I do. Oh, darling. Now, what's all this I hear about you and that Egyptian prince, as he calls himself? Well, he's got a certain right to call himself one. He is a prince. Don't quibble. What about it? Oh, the papers make so much of every little thing. All he wants to do is marry me. Marry you? I never heard of such a thing. Oh, Grandmother, you modern. You know what I mean. Answer me, Sarah Brown. Are you going to marry that, uh, that camel thing? No, dear, not for a while anyway. A million years or so. Well, that's better. Now, there's just one thing more. No Cherry Chester of Hollywood is going to stay in this house. Look at you, all powdered and painted. Your ancestors must be spinning in their graves. Now go upstairs and wash your face. And when you come down to dinner, I want to see my granddaughter, plain Sarah Brown. Simply done hair, simple dress, everything simple. Simple? Lucy, I'll be positively idiotic. What's for dinner besides food? Oh, just a few old friends of the family. Wee! Paper caps and confetti! Yeah, don't be absurd, dear. And I believe Horace is dropping in, too. Horace? You mean Cousin Horace? Your third Cousin Horace. Oh, I think I'm beginning to understand. So that's your little plan, is it, Lucy? Horace Van Steeden is a monument of respectability. Rose Grant's tomb, but who wants to marry it? I said nothing of marriage. Not yet, you mean. You've been throwing Horace Van Steeden at my head since he was ten and I was three. And I won't marry him. I won't. I won't. Put down that vase. Where did you ever learn such manners? In Hollywood. Well, you're not in Hollywood now. Put it down. All right. Come in. Oh, hello there. Oh, come in, Horace. We were just talking about you. Oh, were you? Hello, Sarah. Hello, Horace. Uh, nice to see you again. Very nice indeed. Why, thank you, Horace. Thank you very much. Sarah. <laughs> I I've just been telling Sarah that I hope you two will be seeing a good deal of each other for the next few weeks. Oh, I, I think that should be very enjoyable. Very. Oh, do you? Do you, Sarah? Sarah, wait, where are you going? I'm going out for a drive. I shall go mad if I don't. And if Horace proposes once more, I'll tear him in pieces, I swear it. I've never seen you so upset. Oh, Boise, I'm so tired of being Hollywood's Cherry Chester, and I'm fed up with being Grandmother Sarah Brown. Oh, to be alone on a mountaintop, alone with the snow, the sunshine, the stars were... Where people don't know me, where I could live and do as I pleased without interference. That place doesn't exist, dear. Go on, have your ride. You'll feel better. Wait a minute. What's that thing out in the street? The carriage, dear. The carriage. Oh, yes, I'd forgotten. Good afternoon, Miss Sarah. Why, good afternoon, Higgins. I see that Grandmother still disapproves of motor cars. Yes, miss, it's the odor of gasoline. You no, know, this seems like old times. Already, miss. Uh, one moment while I adjust my hoop skirts and raise my parasol. Okay, Higgins, let's rip. Whee! Whee! Amberton in person, book department. He's autographing books. Come on, Hattie, this is our chance. Isn't he just too 
marvelous. Well, Mr. Amberton, I can just see you stalking through the jungle. Can you? Ah, thanks very much. Uh, who's next? Mr. Amberton, will you please write something personal in my book? My husband's so jealous. Yes, well, I... Oh. Oh. Look, Holbrook, oh, oh, what's the matter, Anthony? That perfume again, smell it. Well, what's the matter with I it? I don't know. Everywhere I go, on boats, on trains, in airplanes, women wear that perfume. Why? Well, it's very popular. It's cherry blossom, named after Cherry Chester. <laughs> cherry Chester? Well, look, I can't stand it. Come on. Anthony! I, I've got, get me out of here. I'm sick. All right, all right. Take it easy. We'll go out and get some air. Come on. Where is he going? Oh, where is he going? Well, how do you feel now, Anthony? Well, uh, oh, better, thanks. That fresh air always does the trick. That, that stuff gets me every time. I was marooned on a plague-ridden African village once for six months. It had the same odor. Ever since, the smell of musk knocks me out. Well, don't look now, but here comes the thundering herd. Oh, no, listen, I can't face that crowd again. I'm leaving. All right, run. I'll hold them off as long as I can. All right, so long. Call me at the office. <laughs> I don't know, miss. The crowd seems to be chasing somebody. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, do you mind if I get in here with you? Thanks very much. Uh, keep going, driver. Will you? Just sit here, will you, please? Uh, sort of let me hide behind you. Thanks very much. Hello. What's new? Uh, uh nothing much. Uh, you uh, Don't move, please, or I'm lost. Say, what do you think you're doing jumping in there? It's all right. He can pay no attention oh, to him. Very good, miss. Oh, well, you're very kind. Boy, that was a narrow escape. Would you mind dropping me off further on a bit here? I should hand you over the police. What did you steal? Steal? Oh, no, no. I, you think I'm a shoplifter. No, you're wrong. I haven't stolen anything. No, you should give it back. No, really, really. I, I haven't, I swear. Look, it's a very simple thing to explain. All you have to do is know who I am. Is yeah. that all? Well? Uh, well, take a good look at me. All right. I'm looking at you. Now what? You mean you don't know who I am? Of course I don't, but I'm sure the police do. No, but they don't. How fortunate. Well, I can see I'll have to explain. Please don't. Let's change the subject. I'm sure it must be very embarrassing for you. Oh, well, all right. Uh, do you like New York? Not much. Do you? No, it's a terrible place. I'm going to get out of it, too. Somewhere where nobody knows me, where I can be alone. No. It's funny you should say that. That's exactly how I feel. You? Really on the level? <laughs> on the level. Well, why are you looking at me like that? You know, you know, you could be quite lovely. <sighs> do you really think so? Yeah, in a curious sort of way. Well, are you sure you uh, haven't seen me before? You don't know who I am? Why, no. Is there any reason why I should? No. No, of course not. Say, uh, tell me, is this, uh, this your carriage? Here? Well, it, it belongs to my people. They don't understand me. They're trying to marry me to a man I loathe. In this day and age? Well, that's impossible. Well, he... He has a great deal of money. Money? And they'd sell you. Why, those are dark age medieval ideas. Well, you don't know my family. If, if I could only get away. Look, look. I, I must see you again and talk to you. You can't. Well, who's going to stop us? Well, I don't know, but... Coachman, coach, what's the matter? Keep going. Yeah, traffic light. Oh, a traffic light at a time like this. Now, listen. I must see you again. Free, untroubled by people or convention. Just yourself. Well, I don't know. I don't want to know your name or where you live. I won't tell you mine. Oh, listen. Look, they're after me again. Look. Who? That crowd, they'll tear me to pieces. Well, get out and run. Run. Well, no, I'll have to, but I'm, I'm going to see you again. Now, this is a dream, but we can make it more than just a dream if you'll come. Come where? Well, take this card now. I'll be waiting to see you. I'll come soon. Goodbye. Well, goodbye. Mr. and Mrs. Abner Simpson, Moonsocket, New Hampshire, winter sports, reasonable rates, home cooking. Higgins, can you imagine? What, miss? A shoplifter with an address. <laughs> Did you enjoy your drive? Oh, it was lovely, lovely. Isn't life glorious, Boise? Haven't been uh, drinking, have you? <laughs> Boise, are these flowers for me? For you, from Prince Alley. Alley, oh, how sweet. Remind me to send him a wire. You needn't bother. He's here in New York, and he's called 16 times this afternoon. Only 16? He's slipping. And we're sailing for Buenos Aires tonight at 12. Sailing tonight? Lucy's idea. Yes, conceived shortly after the flowers arrive. She's meddling again. I won't stand it. Buenos Aires. Buenos... Now, please don't break anything. Buenos Aires. And why not? It must be quite lovely at this time of year. What? Give me that phone book. Yes, yes. The ocean voyage would do Lucy a world of good. Uh, Horace is going, too. Oh, dear Horace. How thoughtful. How very thoughtful of him. 
Sarah, do you feel all right? I feel perfectly swell. Go and tell my doting grandparent that I'm delighted with her plans. All right, but I wish you'd tell me what you had to drink. Nectar. Hmm? Ambrosia. Get out, Boise. Mr. and Mrs. Abner Simpson, winter sports, reasonable rates. Oh, hello, hello, Grand Central. Can you tell me what time the next train leaves for New Hampshire? Oh, a very special place. Moonsocket. M O O N S. In just a moment, Mr. DeMille and our stars, Carol Lombard and James Stewart, will return for Act Two of The Moon's Our Home. And now, a last time announcement. Listen carefully, for tonight is our last offer of the Lux Flakes Gone with the Wind brooch. No wonder women are thrilled with it, for it's exquisite, an expensive-looking jewelry piece, and such a bargain. Let me tell you about it. It has the rich, authentic look of the heirloom jewelry of the Old South, for the original was worn in Gone with the Wind. It is even lovelier than the Scarlet O'Hara brooch we offered last fall, and entirely different in design. It is round and big, almost two inches in diameter, with a safety catch on the clasp. In the center is a big turquoise-colored stone surrounded by a circle of five exquisite simulated pearls. It has an antique-style gold finish, and the edge is daintily scalloped. Why, it's so good-looking that you'll want to wear it right around the clock, with party dresses, suits, and street dresses, too. Now, of course, you want to own one of these exquisite jewelry pieces. Well, it's not too late, but you must let us have your order at once. Tonight is the last time we will make this offer. Now, here's what you do. Buy a big box of new Quick Lux Flakes. They come in the same familiar box and cost you no more. Tear off the opening tab at the top corner of the Lux box. Mail this tab with 15 cents in coin, no stamps, please, to Lux, Box 1, New York City. Lux, Box 1, New York City. Be sure to include your name and address. With your brooch, we'll send an illustrated order blank showing how you can get a bracelet, ring, pendant, and earrings to match your brooch, all at wonderful bargain prices. Now remember, send the opening tab from a large box of Lux Flakes, 15 cents in coin, and your name and address to Lux, Box 1, New York City. This offer is good only in the United States. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of The Moon's Our Home. Starring James Stewart as Anthony Amberton and Carol Lombard as Cherry Chester. Cherry Chester Mystery! Nationwide search for movie stars! Cherry Chester disappears! Like the snows of yesterday, Cherry Chester has vanished into the snows of the present. For the snow is six feet deep in Moonsocket, New Hampshire. In an old fashioned sleigh, she jingles merrily toward the Simpson home her eyes sparkling with adventure. The driver of the sleigh, Mr. Simpson, is a fund of information. Uh, that's the old Redfern farm over there. Nellie's having her fourth baby. Big house, though, plenty of room. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, say, we've got another city border out to the place. Oh, have you? Yeah, queer sort of cuss, too. Mighty queer. Well, uh, is uh, the queer cuss, is he a young man? Well, I wouldn't be saying he was young, and I wouldn't be saying he was old. But uh, judging by appearances, I'd say he was around uh, 30. <sighs> That's fine. On the other hand, uh, appearances can be deceiving. Uh, now, uh, uh, take you, miss. Uh, I, I didn't quite catch the name. Brown. Brown. Hmm. Uh, his name is Smith. <laughs> well, what's so funny? Uh, uh, nothing much. <laughs> yes, Anne. I wonder if you have a room for me for a few days. You didn't write for accommodations. No, no, I didn't. But, but a friend of mine told me about your place, and I needed a rest, so I just came. I guess we can put you up. Oh, thank you. Uh, where does this grip go? Upstairs, silly. That's my husband. Yes, we've already met. Oh, it's lovely here. So peaceful. Oh, tell me, is there a, a young man named Mr. Smith staying here? Smith? Why didn't you say so? Say what? That you were Mr. Smith's cousin he was expecting. He was expecting? Yes. He said you'd come. He didn't tell me your name. Uh, Brown. Sarah Brown. You are his cousin, aren't you? Why, yes, that is distantly. You, uh, you see, we haven't seen each other for years. I, I ran into him the other day. I see. Well, he's out tobogganing. You can probably find him at the top of the hill. Thank you.
expect you. Oh, I shouldn't have come. He's too sure of himself. Hello, you. Oh, hello, mister. Well, I got here last night. What took you so long? Now, just a minute. Well, never mind. I'm glad you came anyway. Are you? I'm not so sure. And by the way, Cousin Smith, how are the rest of the family? Oh, uh, uh, splendid. Of course, little Archie fell in the cistern last week. Didn't he? No. Oh, yes, yes. Oh. Very sad. Well, there's so many at home, they'll never miss him. Yes. <laughs> well, how, how'd you like to take a ride in my toboggan? Oh, is it safe? Well, sure. Can't run out of gas. All right. Sit down. Uh, wait, is your name really Smith? Oh, yes, yes. But it isn't the name by which most people know me. I don't want to tell you my other name. It sort of spoils things. And what makes you think there's anything to spoil? Uh, well, you make me think so. Oh, I do, huh? Yeah, sit down. Where? Well, back seat. That's where women belong. Now, put your arms around me. I will not. All right, if you think you can hang on, let's go. Now, watch yourself now. <coughs> I told you, better put your arms around me. All right, all right. All right, there, that's much better. You think you're smart, don't you? Why, you frightened? Of course not. Do you like it? Oh, I love it. It gets steeper down here. Don't let go now. Wow. Oh, it was grand. Or frightened, though. Huh? Oh, just a little bit. Well, you'll never be frightened with me. We'll travel rougher roads and turn narrower corners. Will we? With... Say, you're pretty sure of yourself, aren't you? You know, you're lovely. Yeah, I, I, I told you in the carriage that you could be, you know. Oh, I, I, I hate you. Good, good, good. There's nothing more helpful to romance than a little hate. Now, just tell me one thing. Uh, is your name really Brown? Yes, it is. But it's not the name by which most people know me. I shan't tell you my other name. It, it would spoil things. <laughs> Ah, do you see that moon up there? That's where we belong, you and I. Alone on the moon, where nobody could ever bother us. Yeah, that's our home up there. Do you always go without a hat? Huh? Why? Well, I've heard of sunstroke. There's probably a moonstroke, too. Oh, yeah. Well, probably. Well, going without a hat's good for the hair. Yeah, I had a friend of my, on my father's side who always went without a hat. He was bald. Yeah, he probably didn't have any hair to start with. <laughs> you know, uh, you should never comb yours. Why? Well, I sort of like it that way. I, I, I think you're crazy. Well, I am completely. Well, it certainly is a glorious night, isn't it? Glorious, and what's more, there's nothing phony about it. No camouflage. All this could be paradise for the right sort of people. Tell me more about your idea of paradise. Well, for one thing, not being hedged in by a lot of crazy conventions is for me. I just discard them. <laughs> you sound like a heathen. Oh, no, nothing like that. It's just that I don't burden myself with a lot of illusions as to right and wrong. I don't believe in marriage. Well, what's the matter with marriage? Well, everything. In the first place, it's unimportant. Well, your father and mother didn't think so. Or did they? Uh, uh, <laughs> well, uh, uh, no. Uh, it's old-fashioned, outdated. It would only take one woman to make you change your mind. No, no. Marriage is the monkey wrench women throw into the machinery of love. Now, without it, there'd be no past to bother you, no future to worry about, nothing but the present. Interesting, but strangely familiar. I must have read it somewhere. Oh, read it where? I don't remember. Say, say, aren't we going too fast? Yes, as a matter of fact, we are. Hey, hey, easy, Nellie. Hey, whoa, Nellie. Well, pull on the reins. Well, what do you think I'm doing? Oh. I'm pulling on... Whoa, uh, whoa, Nellie. Oh. You see, feminine instinct all over willful, headstrong. Well, I can't stop her. You got any ideas well, on this Well, you thing? might try flattery. Flattery, that's not my idea. Uh, uh, no, uh, nice, Nellie. Uh, sweet, Nellie. Hey, hey, look up Whoa, whoa, now, hang on tight. Stop, Nellie. Uh, lovely Nellie, will you? Oh, oh, oh. Hey, hey, where are you? Here, Mr. Snow, help me out. Well, are you all right? <coughs> yes, I'm all right. That was nice driving, mister. What happens now? Uh, well, simple. We'll both walk home from a sleigh ride. Yeah. Oh, you think she'll catch cold, Miss Simpson? Can't tell, but I send her up to bed. We'll put this stone at her feet. Ought to be hot enough now. Well, here, uh, let me take it up to her. Careful, don't burn your hands. No, I won't. Thanks very much. Oh, Sarah. Sarah, are you awake? Who, who's there? What's well, me? Let me in. Let you in? Let you... Get away from that door. Why? What are you talking about? Listen. Get away, do you hear me? Maybe you don't believe in a lot of crazy conventions, but I do. Now get away from that door before I scream. Ah! 
Good morning. Good morning. Hey, wh why didn't you let me in last night? Did you expect me to? Well, I certainly did. Oh, you did, of all the nerves. Don't see anything to get so hysterical Not about. Not only are you a thief, but Oh, I'm... so you're going to bring that up again. Oh, oh God bless you. Now, you, you still think I'm a shoplifter, huh? Oh, what's the use? Exactly, what's the use? I don't blame you. I blame myself. You did what any ordinary man would do. I followed you here like a naive schoolgirl. I, I wanted to find out what kind of a man you were. Well, I found out. Are you trying to tell me that you think that last I'm night... I'm not trying to tell you anything. Oh, so you're putting me in a tough spot, huh? Well, just get this straight now. If you've got any funny ideas about my interest in you, just forget them. Your type of woman bored me. Give me the simple, primitive woman, the woman of long silences. You know, you're not even good-looking. You've got freckles. You, you, your face is covered with them. You've got red hair, and I hate red hair. You've got green eyes, cat eyes, and you're stubborn and bad-tempered. And what's more, you're ungrateful. Oh, he loves me. That's your move. Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, you, you could have taken my king. Oh, I didn't see it. Hey, you're very strange tonight. What's the matter? Thinking. What about? Things, many things. Of shoes and ships and feeding wax. Cabbages and kings. And why the sea is boiling hot and whether pigs have wings. Yeah. Yeah, you're different tonight. Warm and human. Somehow all woman. A doubtful compliment. But well meant. Oh, it's been heavenly, dear. But I'm leaving tomorrow. Oh, leaving? No, you can't. Why not? Well, I have plans, and strangely enough, they all concern you. For instance? Well, for instance, I'm going to teach you to ski tomorrow. You'll have to find another pupil. Well, now, no, wait. What makes you so determined? Something I'd almost forgotten. Oh, oh, listen. That, that man you told me about in the carriage that day, is he the reason? Maybe. Oh, well, that's why I, I feel better. Now that's all settled. You aren't going to marry him. You're going to marry me. Well, is that a proposal or a threat? No, it's just a statement. Well, it's quite impossible. <laughs> why? Why? Well, for one thing, I, I don't believe in marriage. You don't? Well, now, who's been putting those half-baked ideas into your head? <laughs> well, marriage may not be perfect, but it's the only solution for the average woman. I am not an average woman. What makes you think so? Would you have fallen in love with an average woman? Mm, no, I wouldn't, but would you have fallen in love with an average man? Well, what makes you think I have? Well, no, no, of course not. Well, there you are. The only thing left for us to do is get married. I mm -hmm. don't even know your name. Sam Smith. Sam Smith, oh, that's awful. Well, well, what about Sarah Brown? I have a violent temper. Well, I have had complaints about mine, we'll too. We'll fight every day. And we'll make up every night. I'll leave you ten times a year. I'll always find you. I'll always find you, Sarah Brown. Oh, darling. I'm authorized and empowered by the law to perform a marriage between two people of expressly desire to be married. Oh, Sam. Shh. I have here a license. Wait, folks, I can't marry you. There ain't no license. And in New Hampshire, it takes five days to get one. I have it right here. How's that? The license. I have one. Have what? <laughs> the license. Here it is. See, right here. I'm a little deaf. That's fine. I'll start the ceremony. Where did you, you get that license? Five days, days ago. You were that sure of me? Why, of course. Fine. To and you have been since before, the beginning, haven't you? Well, certainly. Good. After all that, do you still care expect care me to marry you? I do. That's well, I wasn't taking any chances. Do you, you still think I was presumptuous? Do I? Sir, do you really mean it? I most certainly do. Then I now pronounce you made a fool out of me long enough, I'll marry you. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Just a minute. Just a minute. What'd you say, mister? Man and wife. It's over, folks. Three dollars, please. After a short intermission, Mr. DeMille will return with our stars, Carol Lombard and James Stewart, for Act Three of The Moon's Our Home. Meantime, here's a new kind of quiz, a sort of uh, that-reminds-me test. Now, I've asked one of our Lux Radio Theater audience, Mrs. Tyler Johnson of North Hollywood, to come to the microphone. I'm going to mention four words, and she's going to answer right off the bat just what these words remind her of. Are you ready, Mrs. Johnson? Yes, Mr. Ruick. Kitchen. Um, cooking. Dinner. Dishes. Dishpan. Dishpan. 
Why, red hands. Good. Last word, gentle. Uh, that's easy when you're thinking of hands in the dishpan. Lux flakes, of course. Ah, uh -huh, you're a mind reader, Mrs. Johnson. That's just what I hoped I'd remind you of, that Lux in the dishpan is gentle to hands. You know, every woman dreads that red, rough, ungroomed appearance of the hands that we call dishpan hands. And that's why, more and more, women are turning to new quick Lux for dishes. Because with Lux, their hands stay soft and smooth. Now, we've proved scientifically the great difference between Lux and harsh soaps in our famous one-hand tests. Hundreds of women took part in these tests, and here is what they did. They dipped one hand in Lux set, the other in suds from another leading soap, under conditions similar to home dishwashing. The Lux hand stayed so much softer, smoother, and prettier that the women themselves were amazed. For example, take Mrs. Bruce Wilkinson, one of the many women who made the test. She says, My left hand was smooth, soft, and lovely after being a new quick lux. My right hand in another soap was so unattractively red and coarse that I was really ashamed for anyone to see it. After this, I'll never use anything but lux flakes for dishes. You'll feel proud of your hands if you use new quick lux for dishes. They'll stay so nice. These gentle suds are fast and thrifty, too. So why not get that generous big box tomorrow and use lux flakes for dishwashing all the time? We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. curtain rises on the third act of The Moon's Our Home. The romance of Cherry Chester, born Sarah Brown, and Anthony Amberton, born Samuel Smith, has been one long series of arguments, but now all arguments are over and done with. Safe in the bridal suite of the Moonsocket Hotel, they face each other as Mr. and Mrs. Sam Smith. Hello, darling. Hello, darling. Any regrets? Not yet. Are you happy? I, I think so. I am very happy. Oh, I'm so glad. Except for one thing, Sarah. There, there's something I must tell you. Oh, let it keep until tomorrow, please. You, you see, I have something to tell you, too. Well, tell me now. Well, even if I wanted to, I couldn't now. You're really not a shoplifter, are you? Well, would it matter very much if I were? Oh, not tonight. Perhaps tomorrow. Perhaps not at all, ever. Oh, my darling. Kiss me, darling. Oh, Sam. Sam. Uh, uh. Sam, what is oh, it? Holy smokes, that perfume again. You've got that perfume on your neck. Well, what's the matter with it? I can't stand it. I'm getting sick. Well, it's a cherry blossom. I know it is. Now open the windows. Will you open them quick? For heaven's sakes, are you crazy? It's named after cherry chestnut. I know, I know. I, well, why don't you do something? Don't stand there like a petrified forge. Well, open the window. Can't you see I'm sick? Well, do you expect me to freeze to death just because you've got a complex or something? No, no, I, I should have told you. But that perfume, I, I never thought, you know, all this time you've never used it, Sarah. You watch that. You, you would change your clothes. You would take a bath or something. So. <laughs> Oh, I understand now. You've got memories, haven't you? That perfume brings them back. Yes, but... Uh, oh, you admit it. No. Don't no. deny it. I can see it in your face. I'm sick. That's what you see in my face. Oh, our, our wedding night, and you're thinking of someone else. Oh, I hate you. Sorry, sorry. I'm going to pass out. Go on, pass out. Oh, Swoon no, all over the place. Oh, Sarah, you you can't fool me. Oh, you, please, you don't, leave, don't leave me here tonight. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Smith. Uh, did you sleep well, sir? I don't remember. Where's my wife? Your wife? Oh, why, she's gone, sir. Gone? Gone where? Uh, to New York, sir. Uh, she left last night. Well, where in New York? She didn't say. I didn't think it was my place to ask. I never right. interfered. Well, when's the next train out of here? The next train? Oh, why, there isn't any. What? No, sir. Uh, there was a snow slide early this morning. The track's blocked. All right, well, charter me a plane. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. We haven't any airport. Well, get me something. Get me a dog sled or anything. I've got to get to New York. <laughs> Hello, Anthony. Hello, Holbrook. I didn't expect you back for weeks yet. Have a nice trip? Had a rotten trip. Oh. Have a... Now, how did you like the Simpsons? Didn't like anybody. Well, uh, uh, 
how was the weather? The weather was foul. What's the matter, Anthony? Upset stomach? Now, listen, Holbrook. You've got to help me. Where can I find a girl in this town? A girl? Why, uh, mm, uh, oh, my, my, my wife has some very nice friends. Oh, no, no. I don't mean I want to meet a woman. I mean I've met one, the woman, but she's disappeared, vanished, gone. Oh. Well, if you know her name, why don't you try the telephone book? Well, there are 116 Sarah Browns in the telephone book. All ages, colors, nationalities. I've talked to every one of them. I've searched the city directory. I've been to the Bureau of Missing Persons. I've done everything. Well, uh, what does she look like? What does she look like? What does she look like? She's the sweetest, most wonderful, most beautiful girl in the world, Holbrook. She's... Well, now, we've got to find her, Holbrook. If you ever expect me to write another line, you've got to help me find Sarah Brown. Well, I'll, uh, I'll certainly try, but if you've done everything... Listen, what's that yelling about? Huh? Oh, uh, nothing very important. They found Cherry Chester. She's come back. Cherry Chester. She's the one I've got to blame for this whole thing, you know. A woman I've never seen has wrecked my whole life. Here's what Warner Wilson says in Broadway Lowdown. Although Miss Chester refuses to explain her whereabouts for the past few days, your correspondent has it on good authority that there is a certain guide in the main woods could shed some light Boise, on... Boise, stop it. I don't want to know about it. Well, just as you like. The other paper says you're in the sanitarium with the DTs. Well, I feel like I was. <laughs> Boise, Boise, why do the papers want to hurt me? Why are people so unkind? I've, I've done nothing, at least nothing, that concerns them. You're a public figure, and as such, your life is not your own. Oh. I've made an awful fizzle of things, haven't I? Things that I always do. I, I just wanted to get away to be myself. I didn't expect to get myself in a jam. And what a jam I'm in, you'll never know. I haven't bothered you with any questions. No, won't either. Oh, thank you, darling. Boise, Boise, do you believe in fables? Fables? I used to. Well, fables always have a happy ending, don't they? Always, darling. Good morning, Sarah. I want to speak to you. I thought you would, Granny. Boise, you may leave. Yes, ma'am. Sarah, everything is arranged. I've already talked to Horace and the newspaper men are waiting. Waiting for what? For the announcement of your engagement to Horace. Engagement? But, but, Granny... My dear, my dear, I've gone into the situation quite thoroughly. The immediate announcement of your engagement to Horace is the only step we can take to silence this scandalous gossip. But, Granny, it's, it's impossible. Why, Granny, suppose I were to tell you that I was already married. <laughs> I'd say it was your way of evading an issue. But I am. Huh? Who to? Why, to... Sam Smith, that's it. All right, all right. Who is he? Where does he come from? What does he do? Well, I, I don't... Granny, you've got to believe me. I'll believe you. Produce him. Where is he? I don't know. That is, I'm not exactly sure where he is. I'm trying to find him. Sarah Brown, if you must lie, do it more convincingly. Now, come on. Come on. Let's see the reporters and get this thing over with. Granny, please don't please. Are you coming with me or shall I see them alone? All right, but when I marry Horace and they come and arrest me for bigamy, don't say I didn't warn you. Fiddlesticks. Hello. Hello, Holbrook. Holbrook, this is Anthony. Find out anything? Oh, well, if they can't locate him, nobody can. Look, Holbrook, I've got to get out of this town. I can't stand it. Get me passage on the first tramp of sailing. Where? I don't anywhere. Just call me back, will you? I'm at the club. Have them page me in the lobby. Oh, oh, excuse me. Hi, I... Hello, Horace. Why, Sam. I mean, Anthony. That's stupid of me. I never can remember your pen name. Oh, that's all right, Horace. How have you been? Oh, fine, 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 fine. <laughs> well, aren't you going to congratulate me? Congratulate you? What for? Oh, don't tell me you haven't heard, but the newspapers have been full of it. Well, I haven't read a paper in weeks. Oh. Well, I, I'm going to be married. Married? Oh, well, that's great. Hey, what's the matter with you? Are you sick? No, no, no. Just dying. So oh, You look awful. See, I, I've got it, but you need a little relaxation. You're coming to my New Year's party tomorrow night. No, thanks. I don't think I can make it. Oh, I won't take no for an answer. You've got to meet my fiancée. You'll be crazy about her. And she may like you. <clears throat> Of course you're coming. Where's the old college spirit? Little conviviality is just what you need. Well, Horace, maybe you're right. That's exactly what I need. A seat on the merry-go-round. Of course I knew it. Meet me at the Club Continental at 10 o'clock. Club Continental at 10 o'clock. Uh, what was that trick you wanted, sir? A Stambul slide car. I, I think that's got me. You mean to say you've never heard of a Stambul slide car? Uh, no, sir. I don't know. What kind of a place is it? Where's everybody been for the last ten years? Well, I come from Milwaukee myself. Oh, well, never mind. Just mix me something strong. Make mine double. I need it. Sarah. Sam, I couldn't. 
couldn't believe my eyes. Sarah Brown. Sarah Smith. I'm the lady you married, remember? Oh, yeah. But you look different. Darling, why didn't you try to find me? Well, I, I did. Did you want to be found? Oh, what do you think? Well, I think the world's quite sane and we're completely mad. Now, come on, let's get out of here. Well, there's a terrace outside. Come on, quick. Darling, why didn't you tell me? I, I never would have run away from you. Well, I tried to tell you. I was too sick. I, anyway, you wouldn't listen. <laughs> I thought it was the memory of some woman you couldn't forget. On this earth, there's only one woman. And it's you. Oh, darling, I missed you so. I was going to drink myself into my grave. <laughs> you couldn't, sweetie. You'd have gotten sick. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I know. Tell me, though, you've changed. Well, what's it all about? Your, your clothes and everything. Where are my freckles? What's happened to Sarah Brown? Well, Sammy, there's something we've got to talk over, something important. Well, of course, darling, any time you want. Where is she, Horace? Where did she go? I don't know. She went toward the bars, and I lost well, her. Well, find her. I'm looking, I'm looking. I wonder if Anthony's arrived. I did, I did want Shelley and Anthony to meet. All right, I married Sarah Brown, and now I discover I also married Cherry Chester. So what? Now I married Sammy Smith, and I find out that I've also accepted Anthony Emberton. So what? Sweetheart, we're bigamous. And I love you desperately. Oh, Anthony. We, we, I mean, Sam. We did have fun, didn't we? Loads. And we'll have lots more. Lots. And with this, this inane career of yours, without that to worry you, why, think how happy we'll be. What? I said we'll travel the world's highways, we'll explore every hidden byway, we'll do crazy, ridiculous things, we'll, we'll live on the moon. But, Sammy, I'm not retiring from the screen. Oh, yes, of course you are. That's all settled. Well, are you giving up writing and exploring? Oh, no. No, certainly not. Oh, I see. The woman's place is in the home. Hallelujah. That's quite true. Oh, no, it's not. Well, she certainly has no place on a movie screen making faces for a living. You don't call that acting, do you? Well, I hope you don't cherish any illusions as to your ability as a writer. Oh, so you've read my books. I tried one. I couldn't finish it. I don't believe it. Which one? The one where you slide down the six pyramids. There are nine pyramids. Six? Nine. So I'm not only a bad actress, but a liar. Well, I never realized how utterly disagreeable you can be. I never realized you were so righteous and smug. I just merely said that you were a disagreeable, worthless little brat. You're That's a conceited, ill temper, impossible beast, and I detest All you. All right, now you listen to me. Take your hands off me. I'll show you. Oh, just let me get my shoe off and I'll show you. All right, just stand up here. Go on, stand Have up. Have you ever been hit on the head with a high heel? No, and I won't. That's what you think. Ooh. Come on, give me that slipper. Take it. Now, come on, oh. give me that, will you? Let me go, you big ape. Come on, stop kicking here. Stop, look out. Look out. Oh, knock me down, will you? All right, now give me that slipper. Hello there, Sarah, dear. I've been looking all over for you. Oh, Horace. Uh, is something wrong here? No, no, nothing at all. Oh, uh, Sarah, this is Anthony Amberton, my old friend. Anthony, my fiancé. Charm. Just a minute. Did you say fiancé? Why, yes, of course. Oh, I see. Well, I really owe you an apology, Miss Chester. You're not only a great actress, but a cheat. For a divorce, I suggest Reno. Oh, help me up, Horace. Oh, <clears throat> Sarah, this is awful. What did he mean about a divorce? Nothing. Nothing important. Well, where's my shoe? Well, I think he had it in his hand. Shall I go after No, him? let him go. Horace, you're sane, quiet, and soothing, aren't you? <laughs> well, I, I'm conservative, yes. Yes, and that's what I want from now on. Oh, it's 12 o'clock, Sarah. Well, Happy New Year, Horace. Happy New Year. Well, 12 o'clock and Cinderella's lost her slipper. that clear. I'm looking for Sarah Brown or Cherry Chester or whatever she happens to be calling herself today. She's not here. She isn't? Well, I'll look for her myself. Get out of this house. Get out or no, I'll have you arrested. No, I won't. Don't think you're frightening me. I've heard all about you, you antediluvian tyrant. Ooh. Yeah, you don't impress me. You, I don't see anything so terrifying about you. But, 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 but what do you want? What do I want? Do you see this slipper? I want the foot that goes in it. Do you see this marriage certificate? 
It's a claim check on a girl. A girl about five feet two, red hair, green eyes, face covered with freckles. She's willful, spoiled, has a terrible disposition. My granddaughter. My wife. Your wife? Oh, so you're Sam Smith. Yeah, yeah. Don't hold that against me. You're very masterful, aren't you? That's just what Sarah needs. Look, I don't know what she needs, but I need Sarah. Now, where is she? Thanks to your bad temper and, well, my stupidity, your wife is catching the 11 o'clock train for Reno, where in due time she expects to marry Horace Van Steeden. Well, wait a minute. I've got to stop her. How? Well, I don't know, but Wait, I... wait. I have some influence in this town. Boise, get me the police department. <laughs> Hurry, Sarah. Hurry. I'm hurrying, Horace. There he is, I'm... officer. Stop. There he is. Stop. Sam. Oh, hello, Sam. I... Oh, thought you'd sneak out of town, eh? Here he is, officer. Come along, you. Hello. Wait, what have I done? No, no, none of that. Come on, Benny. Benny? Boston, Benny. We know you. Escaped from Altoona a year ago. Oh, that's ridiculous. I've never been in... Uh, what'd you say? Altoona. In Altoona in my life. Have I, Sarah? What's the use? They've got you dead to rights this time, Benny. Sarah! Come along, Sarah. Come away. This is a horrible mistake. You can't... Oh, Sarah. Oh, Sam. Uh, darling, uh, le let's talk things over. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. So ends Act Three of The Moon's Our Home. In just a moment, Mr. DeMille and our stars will be back for their curtain call. And now, let me remind you that this is our very last offer of the Lux Flakes Gone with the Wind brooch, the one designed from the exquisite pin worn in the movie Gone with the Wind. You'd better send your order in immediately, or it may be too late for you to own one of these stunning jewelry pieces. And they really are stunning. So many of my friends have remarked about mine especially about how rich and expensive looking it is. But, well, the thing I like best is how lovely it looks on many different outfits, from a tailored suit to an evening dress. I think my gun with the wind brooch is one of the nicest presents I ever gave myself. And it certainly is the biggest bargain. Sally is right. This brooch does make a beautiful present for yourself or to give to your friends. And yet it costs so little. It's entirely different from the Scarlet O'Hara brooch we offered last fall. Even lovelier. It's round and big, almost two inches in diameter, with an antique-style gold finish and a lovely cluster of simulated turquoise and pearls in the center. The kind of jewelry piece that every woman loves. Because it's not only beautiful in itself, it's fashion right. Now here's how to get this wonderful bargain. Listen carefully, please, because this is the last time we are making this offer. First, buy a big box of Lux Flakes. You'll need this to take care of all nice washables, stockings, underthings, sweaters, and dresses. Next, tear off the opening tab at the top corner of the Lux box and mail it with your name and address and 15 cents in coin, no stamps, please, to Lux, Box 1, New York City. Lux, Box 1, New York City. With your brooch, you'll get an illustrated order blank for matching jewelry pieces. Ring, pendant, bracelet, earrings. All amazing bargains. But don't delay. Now remember, send the opening tab from a big box of Lux Flakes, 15 cents in coin, and your name and address to Lux, Box 1, New York City. This offer is good only in the United States. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. Once more, the spotlight turns to Carol Lombard and Jimmy Stewart as they come back to this microphone. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. You know, the thing I like about this Lux Radio Theater is the way everything runs so perfectly. You never miss anywhere. Say, so you're not going to play the accordion now, are you, Jimmy? Oh, no, uh, I didn't bring it tonight. I, uh, I should have been applause there. <laughs> <laughs> Now, uh, this is no place for my accordion. Why, even the boys and girls that collect autographs at the door won't take just anything. For instance, there was that girl who stopped me on the way in tonight. You, she... uh, you surely didn't disappoint her, Jimmy. Oh, no, I signed, and then I asked her what she was going to do with it, and she said, well, if I can get Carol Lombard when the show's over, 
Why, uh, I know where I can trade both of you for Clark Gable. <laughs> I know. I'll have to speak to her. She can't make a bad bargain like that. Oh, now, be polite, Carol. I might have to take back my autograph. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, Mr. DeMille, I have enjoyed very much coming back to Lux Radio Theater. Well, in the past few months, I think you've really taken on a new assignment here. All entertainment is a premium now, and anything that lifts us out of the everyday routine for an hour or so is what we need at a time like this. America must be strong, and we must keep it free by making it stronger still. While we're all working toward that end, to the limit of our strength, we need the emotional outlet that a theater like this provides. Let me show you a little of our mail sometime, Carol, and you'll understand why we think of this as a national theater. Oh, uh, what's going on in it next week, Mr. DeMille? Plenty of action, Jimmy. Our play is Johnny Apollo. And our stars are Dorothy L'Amour, Edward Arnold, and Burgess Meredith. Johnny Apollo is the story of a father and son who lost faith in each other, and of a girl named Lucky who brought them together again. Next Monday night, you'll hear Edward Arnold as the father, Burgess Meredith as the son, and Dorothy L'Amour as the girl named Lucky. The 20th Century Fox picture made a hit on the screen, and I have a distinct premonition it will do the same for us. Well, that's a great story, Mr. DeMille, and you have a swell cast. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Our stage doormat has welcome on it for you two any time. Good night. <laughs> Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, Join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Dorothy L'Amour, Edward Arnold, and Burgess Meredith in Johnny Apollo. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. This week, the nation is celebrating Boy Scout Week, the 31st anniversary of the Boy Scout movement in America. Today, a million and a half scouts are training for democracy as active members of this great organization. Ladies and gentlemen, we invite you to join the Lux Radio Theater in saluting the Boy Scouts of America. James Stewart appeared tonight through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and is currently seen in this studio's production, Come Live With Me. Carol Lombard's current screen hit is Mr. and Mrs. Smith, the RKO production, which was directed by Alfred Hitchcock. Heard in tonight's play were Clara Blondick as Lucy, Verna Felton as Boise, Hans Conried as Horace, Lou Merrill as Holbrook, Charles Seal as Justice of the Peace, Ralph Sedan as Abner, Stanley Farrar as Coachman, Gloria Blondell as Hilda, James Hegels as Hotel Clerk, Jack Carr as Porter, Celeste Rush as Miss Manning, and Noreen Gamil as Mrs. Simpson. The brooch, offered you by the makers of Lux Flakes, was designed from one worn and gone with the wind, the Selznick International picture, produced by David O. Selznick and released by Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. Our music is directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future 
adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand would-be worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents X minus one. Tonight's story, The Man in the Moon. Attention, attention. This is the Federal Bureau of Missing Persons calling all local agencies. Attention, this is a coded report nationwide. Missing since 9 o'clock this morning, the following persons. Smigley, Jonathan, 5 feet 8 inches tall, brown hair, brown eyes, mastoid scar behind right ear, last seen wearing blue top coat and tan cap, wanted by Los Angeles... Hello, get off this wavelength. Hello, this is a restricted Earth. band. Hello, hello, Earth. Uh, whoever you are, you're on a hello, coded wavelength. Earth. Tune out. This frequency is reserved hello. for the Federal Bureau of Missing Persons. Hello, Earth. This is the moon Whoa. calling Earth. Hello, Earth. This guy is loony. This is Jake in transmission. Jake, this is Charlie of the code room. Some crackpot is on our frequency. Yeah, I heard him, Charlie. CQ trying to trace a source now. We should have a triangulation any second. Well, hurry it up, will you? Some ham is in for a good stiff fine by the FCC. Yeah, they ought to take his license away. Oh, well, here comes Lenny with the directional fix. Right. Thanks, Lenny. Hey. hey, what's this? This is impossible. What's going on down there? How about it? Get that ham out of my killer cycles. Oh, listen, Charlie, unless this is a gag, that interference is being beamed from 240,000 miles away. Oh, now, Jake, you know there ain't no such thing as 240,000 miles away. Yes, there is, Charlie, straight up. Oh, now, wait a minute. Charlie, that signal is coming from the moon. Are you nuts? Well, somebody might be bouncing it, like a radar signal. Radar? On this frequency? Where'd you study basic radio? Now, listen, Flathead, you asked for a fix. I gave the best fix our instruments can find. Take it or leave it. Somebody on the moon is calling the Bureau of Missing Persons. Well, what's the sweat, Charlie? Shouldn't you be broadcasting? Listen, Mr. Timken. You know I'm a sober citizen, right? Mm-hmm. Remember, once have I broadcast with the smell of alcohol on my breath, right? Right. In all your 12 years here at the Bureau, did I well, once what's ever... What's the matter, Charlie? We're picking up a message on our wavelength. Well, did you report to the FCC? I ain't got the nerve. Well, what's wrong? You'll scream when you hear this, Mr. Timken. You'll jump right out the window, but... We are getting an SOS from the moon. <laughs> Well, that's it. He started on voice and switched to Morse. The way the signal repeats sounds like a phonograph record or automatic sender of some sort. Well, what's it say? Uh, let's see here. Can you read me? Help, Otterburn. We'll contact when Moon is in phase. Let's have that again. Can you read me? Help, Otterburn. We'll contact when Moon is in phase. Otterburn. That sounds like a name, huh? Otterburn. Otterburn. Wait a minute. Something registered? Cornelius Otterburn. Holy jumping Jehoshaphat. Hey, where are you going? Talk to the chief. Hey, wait a minute. What are you going to tell him? We just got a CQ from the man in the moon? That's exactly what I am going to tell him, Charlie. Hey. Oh, no. This just too much for me. <laughs> Washington Star Ledger. Uh, let me have O'Brien on city desk. For a moment. O'Brien. Seamus, yeah. Charlie Starbuck, down at the Missing Persons Bureau. You want a hot one? No kidding. This will cost you a beer, okay? All right, shoot, Noodle Brain. I'll stay on your wavelength for 30 seconds. Okay. We just got a radio message from the moon. Yeah. What? From the moon. Call me back when you're sober. Okay, Seamus. If you don't know a story when you see one, I'll... I'll send you the name of a good psychiatrist. So long, Orson Welles. How do you like that? He don't believe me. Otterburn, Mr. Wade. Now, does that name ring a bell? You're the man with the photographic memory, Henry. What about Otterburn? Cornelius Otterburn, atomic physicist, reported missing from his home in Baltimore on June 5th, 1945, just five years ago, vanished completely. Are you trying to tell me you really think there's something to this man of the moon business? Henry, I'm surprised at you. 
This is some crackpot trying to jam the airwaves. Yes, but the name Otterburn is so unusual. So Mr. are a lot of names. But I have a theory that... I was afraid uh, of that. Henry, you always have a theory. Let's see, what was it last year? Oh, yes, that people disappear in occupational cycles. But it's true. Please, I... Henry, I'm a busy man. You expect me to believe that this Otterburn is sitting up on the moon, sending out shortwave messages? Well, he might be on Earth bouncing the messages off the moon. And... But who's to say he isn't on the moon? Henry, as chief of this bureau, I have my hands full trying to coordinate reports from 48 states in Alaska. I have no time to include the moon. But, Mr. Wade... Out, Henry. Uh, but, Mr. Wade... Out, I'm busy. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, here. Take this folder of reports for the dead file. Yes, sir. And no more nonsense, eh, Henry? Yes. I appreciate that you have a very dull job filing old missing persons reports, and I appreciate that you take an active interest in the affairs of the Bureau. But no more nonsense, eh? No, sir. No more nonsense. Hmm. Uh, pardon me. Hmm? You are Mr. Henry Timken. <laughs> That's my name. Uh, permit me, Jefferson Philo, scientific feature writer. Oh, how do you do? Oh, are you a newspaper man? Not exactly. I write as a hobby. Occasionally, the papers give me leads on an assignment. If I may have a moment of your time... Well, certainly. Just sit down at my desk over here. Thank you. <laughs> my, that's quite a stack of papers. <laughs> Filing. Uh, I'm the records custodian of the Bureau. Twelve years and never misplaced a record. Magnificent. I admire the precise mind, Mr... Uh... Timken. Of course. Now, Mr. Timken... Mr. O'Brien, the editor of the Star Ledger, said I might drop by and investigate a rumor. Only a rumor, mind you, that a message from the, uh, moon... Well, we aren't certain it's from the moon. It, it may be a bounce. They have bounced radar waves off the moon, you know. Yes, and, I know. I wrote the first newspaper article on it. Really? I'd be interested to read it. I must have a copy in my book. Well, I, I don't bother. I... Oh, but I insist. Oh, yes. There you are. I'll leave it on your desk. Oh, thank you very much. Now... About this message from the moon, Mr. Timken... Well, now, we don't know for sure, as I said, but I believe that this message, wherever it originates, is from Cornelius Otterburn. The physicist? Oh, do you know him? I once wrote an article on his contribution to nuclear mechanics. A brilliant man, Otterburn. Years ahead of his contemporaries. Mm. Well, whoever is sending those signals, if he isn't on the moon, is at least using the moon as a sounding board, bouncing the signal. But why, Mr. Timken? Why? Well, if you will come here tomorrow night at 8, Mr. Philo, we may learn the answer to that question. I've arranged with Charlie, our radio man, to let me use the equipment. May I consider this an invitation? You certainly may. Very well, sir. <coughs> Until tomorrow night, then. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Philo. Hmm. Uh, let's see now. Aiken, Abelard, Abramson, Rano, Atch... Well, that's funny. Now, where did this list of names come from? Paul Aaron's. Astromathematician, Robert Simons, electronic engineer, Carl Parker, mining specialist. Well, this must have got mixed up with the papers on my desk by accident. Peculiar list of names. Oh, good morning, Charlie. Oh, hi, Mr. Timken. I see we made the papers. Oh? And how? And as the chief steamed up about it, he really gave me one for it. What did the paper say? Oh, mostly ha-ha. Here's a herald, listen. Man on the moon contacts missing persons bureau. Missing atomic scientists sitting on the moon, say bureau experts, etc., etc. What a panic. Well, no wonder Mr. Wade is hopping. Say, about tonight, Mr. Timken, I don't now, know... Now, you promised you'd give me a key to the radio room. Yeah, but I didn't expect... Well, this. I'll take full responsibility uh -oh. with Mr. Wade. Uh, the time for the morning broadcast. We got quite a list today. Well, mind if I listen a while? We may hear Otterburn. Why, well, ain't self-conscious. Just stick around. Yes. <clears throat> attention, attention. This is the Federal Missing Persons Bureau calling all local agencies. Nationwide. This is a coded broadcast. The following persons are missing. Aaron's Dr. Paul, what? five feet five, brown hair, brown eyes, scar on left side of chin, thick glasses. Aaron's. Occupation, astromathematician. Missing, missing since 6 o'clock this morning, uh, being sought by uh, Bel Air police. Uh, Charlie. Repeat, Dr. Paul uh, Charlie, Aaron. Charlie, turn it off a second. Hold it. A delay, one minute. Listen, Mr. Timken, it's okay to stay, but you can't interrupt now, us. This is important. Did you say Dr. Aaron's was reported missing this morning? 6 a.m. We got the report from Bel Air less than an hour ago. That, are you certain, Charlie? Positive. What is this? Charlie, what's the next name on the list? Uh... Let's see. Simons, Robert, what? engineer. What? 
came in less than 20 minutes ago. 20? Hey, what's the matter with you? You look like you've seen a ghost. It's nothing, Charlie, except that last night, quite by accident, someone left a list of names on my desk, and that list included the names of those two men who were reported missing within the last hour. What? Oh, that doesn't sound right to me. Well, it isn't right, Charlie. It leaves a big question to be answered. Who would make up a list of missing persons before they were missing, not after? And you say this list of names was left on your desk accidentally? Well, I believe so, Mr. Wade. Do you have any ideas, Henry? Well, it's hard to say. Mr. Philo left some papers from his briefcase. Mr. Philo? Well, uh, a science feature writer. I see. You were the leak on that story, then? Yes, sir, I'm afraid I was. I didn't think it would be treated as a laughing matter. Well, we'll deal with uh, that later. Yes, sir. What's this Philo like? Well, he's, he's a strange old duck, bald, thick glasses, tall. He walks stooped over. Uh, seems to know a great deal about scientific data, but, of course, being a science writer, he... Is there wouldn't... any other possibility? Well, I believe that this is all hooked up with the broadcast from Otterburn. That seems to be a very remote possibility. Well, <clears throat> A missing persons bureau deals in remote possibilities, Mr. Wade. I do not require a statement of policy. Yes, sir. What's the theory? Well, for some time now, it has been my contention that in a country like ours, where even the cleverest criminal can be ferreted out and located eventually, there is no such thing as a missing person. <sighs> I was afraid of that. Now, uh, for 12 years now, I have kept the central files, where information from all over the country is channeled and recorded. I have made a private study. This is beginning to sound familiar, Henry. And I have discovered that each year literally thousands of persons vanish, leaving no trace. They are never located. Where do they go? Nobody knows. And? And they disappear in interesting cycles. What sort of cycles? Occupations, for example. One year we'll have a run on, well, say, coal miners. Next year the proportion of engineers increases. And then scientists. And What do you think happens, Henry? I don't know, Mr. Wade, but I'm beginning to suspect that somebody else has discovered the same phenomenon even to the point, perhaps, of being able to predict who will turn up among the missing next. Philo? Well, I don't know, but I would like to find out. And you think Otterburn may be a part of this picture? Mr. Wade, I definitely do. Henry, do you honestly expect me to buy an idea like well, that? It is more than an idea. The, the two top men on this list are missing, and... Maybe and, so, uh, but the rest of them aren't. Parker, Watson, Gibbs. Why, I saw Parker in the restaurant where I had lunch today. Yes, but... And Mr. if you Wade, think I'm going to make myself a laughingstock by accepting such a crack brain theory... Well, I... Excuse me. Yes. Hello, Wade speaking. Yes. Yes. I see. Uh, what name? Uh, just a moment. Uh, Henry, let me see that list again. Uh, here you are, sir. Go ahead. I see. I'll get back to you. I, uh... I guess I owe you an apology, Henry. Sir? Carl Parker was just reported missing. Parker? Third man on your list. Holy mackerel. Exactly. Henry, for a good many years now, I've ridiculed these theories of yours. I don't know. Perhaps I've underestimated you. Maybe this time you've really stumbled onto something. What do you intend to do, Mr. Wade? I don't know. I haven't thought it out yet. I, I was planning to listen for another broadcast tonight in the hope that Otterburn might try to contact us again. Good idea. I believe I'll join you. I also invited Mr. Philo, the feature writer. Oh? I'll be glad to meet him. I'm beginning to get interested in you, Mr. Philo. Wait, you don't think... That he's that... mixed up in this? Yes, sir. I don't know, Henry. But it suddenly strikes me that we don't know very much about him, really. We ought to contact the police. No, Henry. I, I no. think we're better off keeping this between ourselves for the moment. We're dealing with the unknown... And in solving an equation for the X factor, it's often easier to limit the number of terms. You follow me? I don't know, Mr. Wade. I... There may be more danger in what you have discovered than you are aware of. Let's keep it quiet. Do you agree? Maybe you're right, Mr. Wade. I, I hadn't thought of the danger involved. <laughs> Mr. Philo is late. Well, he said he'd be here. He strikes me as a man who keeps appointments. Look out the window. Yes, sir. The moon is almost in direct phase. We can't wait much longer. Well, it's a perfectly clear night for transmission. If anybody's sending, we ought to pick it up with this equipment. You'd better switch on the set. Yes, sir. 
I never realized how eerie this office could be when it was empty. I left a light in the hall for Mr. Filer when he comes. Are you getting anything? Uh, just some foreign stuff, I think. That's a peculiar transmission sound. Earth. Earth. Now that sounds like something. See if I can work the selector. The moon is in phase. Yes. Hello. Earth. Can you hear me? Uh, I'll try to return. Hello? Hello? Hello. Earth. Uh, hello, do you hear me? Oh, I get you now. Thank God. Uh, who are you? Can you hear me? Uh, who are you? This is Professor Cornelius Otterburn. Hello? Uh, go on, I hear you. Not much time. They're on to me. They've located my sending point. You hear me? Uh, go ahead. Keep talking. I've only enough oxygen for a few minutes more. Well, where are you? I'm on the Earth side of the moon. You get that? The Earth side of the moon. A volcanic crater. Could you start that recorder, Mr. Wade? Uh, go on. Explain, please. Explain, please. Now listen closely. There is an Earth, Earth colony on the moon. There is an Earth colony on the far side of the moon made up of renegade scientists and criminals. P Professor Ernst Halsman... Halsman, he, he died in an insane asylum in 1938. Professor Ernst Halsman discovered nuclear rocket power in 1935. Turned his plans over to escaped inmates of the asylum. They, they took off and set up a colony on the far side of the moon in 1938. Uh, go, go ahead, we're recording you. Each year, they recruit new colonists, colonists from Earth. S slave labor, mostly. Uh, I was kidnapped in 1945. Yes, I, I, I know. Uh, keep talking. They wanted me to work on atomic drive for their flying disc. Uh, Still getting you. Go on. Last month, six others and I escaped. Uh, speak louder. You, you got to stop them. Stop them. Stop who? The moon colony, planning to take over the Earth. Invasion. Oh. Hang on. No, 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 no oxygen. Hard to, to, to breathe. Can you listen? They, they have agents on Earth. You hear me? Agents on Earth? Well, where? Who? Uh, hello? 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 Agents in. Henry, look out. Lights. Someone at the window. Get down. Henry, are you all right? I, yes, I, I, I think so. Shot smashed to the transmitter. And the lights. Strike a match. Careful. It was close. I got a look at him. From the description, it was your Mr. Philo. We got a recording anyway, but, but not the most important part of the message. Poor Otterburn. Suffocating to death. Henry, we've got to get you out of here. You said they have agents. Philo was probably one of them. He'll be looking for you now, trying to kill you. The police... Do you think the police would believe a fantastic story like this? People being kidnapped to the moon as slave labor? Moon colony planning an invasion of the Earth? But Henry, believe me, they'd, they'd clap us into straitjackets before we could finish. We've got to do something. We need time. Time to get cool. You don't think my theory was bunk then? I know it wasn't, Henry. Right now, my only concern is for your safety. But we can't walk out of here. Philo's probably waiting. Listen. There's a service elevator that leads to the basement garage. Yeah? We can get down there. There are some delivery trucks parked there all night. We can probably get one started. The garage door's off the ramp, work from the inside. We'll start the mechanism and make a run for it. I, I don't know. I think if we call the police... By the time the police get here, we'll be dead. You think Philo will wait outside all night? Come on. That's an order. Okay. But what about the recording of Otterburn's notes? We'll leave that here in, in the safe in my office. They'll never get into that. Let's go. You buzz the elevator while I hide the recording. This is the basement. Come on. Keep to the side. Yes, sir. Shh. Let's try that delivery truck over there. I'll get in. All right, Henry. You start the mechanism to open the garage door, then jump onto the truck. Yes, sir. We'll make a dash for it. Uh, where can we go? I have a farm outside Chevy Chase. It's private. Miles from the nearest neighbor and completely hidden by trees. We'll run for that. Go ahead. Start the door up. All right. Quick, jump in. Where do we go, Henry? 
Cross your fingers. We made it out all right. Anything doing? There's a blue coop behind us, Mr. Wade. It's easily following. I'll cut up Pennsylvania Avenue. Now Route 1, toward Baltimore. It is following. He turned with us. Can you go faster? Not much faster. Oh, he's gaining on us. I've got an idea. Hang on, Henry. Yes. Why'd you stop? I'll turn off the lights. <sighs> it worked. He shot right past us. Now we'll double back and go out another route. I don't see anything. I think we've lost him. Good. I think everything is going to be all right now. We can be at my farm in less than an hour. Not much longer now. Is anyone behind us? I, I thought I saw the blue coop again, but I, I was mistaken. Whew. This place is really hot in the wilderness. You can stay here indefinitely to we'll figure out the next move. Now, just up this dirt road now. There's the house up ahead. You're not going toward it. No, I have a better idea. There's a big abandoned wheat silo on my grounds. It's down a hollow where it can't be seen except in the air. And even then, the oak trees shield it. We'll hide you out there. Now, we we'll leave the truck here. It'll never be seen. Come on. Yes, sir. How did you ever find this place, Mr. Wade? I've always liked seclusion. I bought it about 12 years ago. Come up here in the summertime to get away from it all. There's the silo. Uh, it's certainly well hidden. There's a small door around the side. Come on. Be careful of those bushes. Uh, uh, yes. It's hard to see them in the dark. Do you suppose Philo will find us? I assure you, Henry, Mr. Philo will never find us here. Not in a million years. Here's the door. It's dark. Hold my arm. I know the way. Just a few steps up and another door. Steel. This is an unusual silo. It's double walled, wood outside and steel inside. Completely fireproof. An army couldn't wreck it. We're inside the inner shell. Careful. Yes. We're in a circular room. Stay here a moment. I'll go outside and see if the coast is clear. In a moment, your eyes will become accustomed to the darkness. I'll bring back some food and water. Uh, don't be long, Mr. Wade. I, this, this place gives me the willies. Just a moment. Mr. Wade. I swear I hear something. Mr. Wade. What's that? There is something. Good Lord. There's someone in here. It, it's locked. Oh, no. Mr. Wade! Mr. Wade, let me out! I'm not alone in here! Mr. Wade! This must be a light switch. Thank God. Huh? Oh, no. People. 10, 15, 20. Mr. Wade, help! Help! It will do you no good to shout, Henry. Mr. Wade, where are you? Outside. Speaking over the intercom. Mr. Wade, there are people in here. 15 or 20 of them. They're... they're Sitting like statues, just, just staring at me. They won't hurt you, Henry. What? They've all been drugged. They're even more helpless than you. But, but, who are they? Permit me to introduce them, Henry, since they are currently unable to introduce themselves. The gentleman seated before you, the one with the scar, is Dr. Paul Ahrens, the astro-mathematician. Next to him is Mr. Robert Simons, electronic engineer. Names on the list. Yes, you're familiar with the rest. They've all been, uh, shall we say, recruited to work with Professor Halsman's group on the moon. Moon? Then you, you... You're one of them. Of course. Oh, yes. There's one whose name was not on our list. If you'll turn around, Henry, you'll recognize the drugged form of your old friend, Mr. Philo. Uh, Philo? But I... 
I thought... That he was part of the conspiracy? No. On the contrary. His snooping made it necessary for us to include him. Please put the man in the window, the one who fired the shot. An agent of mine. The pilot of this ship. Ship? What ship? This silo is camouflaged for a rocket launching platform. In a moment, the roof will slide back for the rocket's takeoff. A rocket ship? In exactly 70 hours, you and your companions will join Professor Otterburn on the moon. But you... You, you can't do this to me! We have done it. No! You see, there was another name omitted in that list, which I carelessly mixed up with your papers. That of no. Henry Timken. No! Bon voyage! I won't let you do this! You can't! Last night, the following persons, Timken Henry, age 45, height 5 feet 8, 165 pounds, brown eyes, slightly balding, occupation, records custodian. Repeat, Timken Henry, age 45, height 5 feet 8, 165 pounds. In just a moment, a word about next week's adventure. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Man in the Moon, an original radio drama written by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Louis Van Ruten as Henry, Santos Ortega as the Chief, Ross Martin as Charlie, Sidney Smith as Otterburn, Bob Haig as Jake, Joe DeSantis as Philo, and Ed Latimer as O'Brien. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is an NBC Radio Network production. And now, next week, the sign on the window said Perigi's Wonderful Dolls. A woman and a child waited outside. The little girl peering eagerly through the window and the woman glancing impatiently at her wristwatch, as if expecting someone who was late for an appointment. And there was nothing about Parigi's doll shop to warn them that they were waiting to keep an appointment with doom at X, 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 X minus, minus, minus one. 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 Bold Venture. Adventure, intrigue, mystery, romance, starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. Together in the sultry setting of tropical Havana and the mysterious islands of the Caribbean. Bold Venture. Once again, the magic names of Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall bring you Bold Venture and a tale of mystery and intrigue. Is your name Slate Shannon? That's right. And this is Miss Duval. I'm very happy. Then I'm happy too. Hello. My name is Cameron. I have a plantation outside of San Tomas. Sugar. Sugar? For the time being, just call me Sailor. What can we do for you, Mr. Cameron? I've never come to a man and, and begged before in my life. Well, then you've come to the wrong man. You don't have to beg anything from me. It's about a girl. A young girl. Wild, impetuous, and spoiled. No, thanks. Mr. Shannon already has one. Sailor, why don't you go and put a new point in our desk pen? Where am I going to get a new point? Post office is closed. Please. It's about my daughter. It's about Kathy. Kathy and the Blue Moon. Oh, yes. There's a gambling ship in the bay called the Blue Moon. Look, if you're a man in trouble, I'll listen to you. If all you want to do is hire someone to spank your daughter for gambling, get yourself somebody else. Because nobody else can do what I want you to do. You haven't told Slate yet what it is. Maybe he won't Do you want... mind if I make my own decision, sailor? 
Go ahead, Miss Cameron. Kathy's involved with a man named Norton. Oh, yes, I've heard of him. He owns the Blue Moon. How did your daughter get mixed up with a guy like that? I don't know. All I know is that since she's met him, she's... Well, she's changed. She's a stranger to me. She's on that boat all the time. I have an easy solution. Why don't you just tell Mr. Norton to buy your daughter from the boat? I've tried that. He laughed in my face. He told me... Hold it a minute. Sailor, there's a guy over there at the cigar counter. Take care of him. Go ahead, sailor. I'll remember every word Mr. Cameron says and tell you later. All right, Cameron? Well, Norton knows something about Kathy I don't. I know my daughter. It's more than just a lust for gambling. Please, will you help me, Shannon? Go there, talk to Kathy. Convince her that she she need never go back to that ship again. Please, please, I'll, I'll give you anything. Put your wallet back. Your daughter's in trouble with Norton? I'll, I'll try to straighten her out. You don't understand, Shannon. I'm a rich man. When I bring Kathy back, you'll give me a box of lump sugar? You not too loud, Paul. You disturb our boss. Tell Greg I want to see him. Our boss sleeps. His brain goes all the time. He needs rest. Wake him up, Mickey. I've got something for him. I don't wake up, boss, till he asks me. Wake me up, Mickey. Who wants me? It's your croupier, Paul. The wheel jockey says he's got something. He can keep it to himself till you get your share of sleep, boss. Let him in. Our boss says for me to let you in. I'll let you have something for me, Paul? Well, give it to me, but make it tender, because I just woke up. I uh, was in Shannon's place a little while ago. And you had fun. Rub my neck, Mickey. There's a crick in it. Yeah, thanks, boss. Ah. Oh, that's good. That's very good. There was someone else there. Kathy Cameron's father. Now the other side, Mickey. Ah. He's sick with worry about his daughter. Wants Shannon to take her away from you. You three must have made a jolly group. They were so wrapped up in it, Shannon, his girl, Cameron. They thought all I wanted was to buy a pack of cigarettes. You're a good boy, Paul. The thing of many talents. Shannon's coming out here to the boat. I thought you'd need to know. Paul's a good boy, isn't he, Mickey? I'm better for you, boss. He can't do the things for you I can do. He can't... Of course he can't, Mickey. Nobody can that's why I keep you around, isn't it? See? See? That's why he keeps me around. That's why... He... Sure, Mickey. <laughs> so they want to take Kathy away from me. And Kathy will never leave me. Because I fixed it that way, didn't I, boss? Mm-hmm. Because you threw yourself in front of her car because she thought she'd killed you. That's why you've got to keep out of her sight because for as long as she thinks you don't exist, she belongs to me. Till I use her up. Her and her daddy's money. And so clean. She loses it to me at the roulette table. Clean and legitimate. Boss, this Shannon could... No one's going to spoil it, Mickey. Not a well-paying corpse like you, I give you my word. Look through the porthole, Greg. That's Shannon's boat coming alongside. Go hold his hand, Paul. Then bring him to me. I want to tell him how he can't part two sweethearts like Kathy and me. You do me and my gambling ship great honor, Mr. Duval, Mr. Shannon. Your boy brought us to you. We asked for Kathy Cameron. He didn't want to deny me the pleasure of meeting you two. He has standing orders to deliver to me first the illustrious, the renowned. You see, Slate, I keep telling you that's what we are. You never believe me. Go on, Mr. Norton. You were saying... That I would have shuddered if you came aboard and deprived me of yourselves. Gee, you're smooth, Mr. Norton, the way you talk. The waxed mustache... That's the only word for you. Smooth. So you saved yourself a shutter, Norton. Now, is it all right if we go find Kathy? She may not care for you disturbing her at the gambling table. Now, what did you want with Miss Cameron? We're going to take her back to Havana with us, Norton, because her father's lonesome for her. He's a funny guy. He thinks his daughter ought to spend more time at home. Any objections? Uh, I only asked you because you stuck your nose in. <laughs> no objections. I only fear for you. You think you can stop me? I know I can. However, Miss Cameron is in the casino on a deck. And uh, please sign the guest book. I'll want something to remember you by. Now, 
number 12 on the black. Black page, 12 page. Miss Cameron? What? Mind if we talk to you? Place your bets, ladies and gentlemen. Place your bets. You mind if we talk to you? Go away. I can't do that, Miss Cameron. Why don't you two try the poop deck? It's a good place to jump from. Jump from? Oh, your preposition is dangling, Kathy. Your father must have picked the wrong finishing school for you. My father? Oh, you made me miss my bet. Sailor. I know. You want me to kibitz that hot game of old maid over there. Come on, Kathy. Let's get some air, you and I. Oh, you're hurting my arm. It's an advice I use to make myself clear. Come on. I made a suggestion to you before concerning the poop deck. Or if that doesn't suit you, why don't you try it from this rail? Oh, you're just a kid, Kathy. You've got to grow up a little more before that kind of talk becomes you. Oh, you think I'm a kid. Nineteen, twenty. Kids that old and women over 40 use lipstick the way you do. Another suggestion. A girl 19 is better for you. Want to know why? I'll put my arms around you and show you. Hey, take it easy. And hold you. Okay, Norton. Yes! Yeah. <clears throat> ah. Did you notice, Miss Cameron? I only had to do it once, right in back of the neck. Well, get him out of here. I think I'll give him back to Miss Duval. <laughs> Don't you think I'm considerate? Mr. Slate, he stood on moonlit deck. Man from behind hit him in he neck. Lady sailor, she bring from ship blue moon. Her winnings to date, Mr. Slate in a swoon. Because they tried to do one very good deed. Bring daughter back to father who cried his need. He waved at them, a face full of war. Mr. Slate, he said, don't cry, I go. You see, Slate, if you didn't make such a hobby of helping people, this never would have happened to you. Yeah, that's just what a fellow needs at a time like this, sailor, a kind word. Now you are hurt, Mr. Slate, because you love a good deed too much? <laughs> yeah, I live for the moment when I can bring a wandering girl back to her daddy. Let Norton have her. I don't think I could go through this again. You go through with it. Your neck is my neck. I read that once in a poem. I'm going back to the Blue Moon, sailor. Mend me real nice because I've got some things to do there. I want to look good. Uh-uh. If you go back, they'll kill you. Those were Norton's parting words to me. He said, tell him not to come back. Next time, I'll give them to you in pieces. You're a complicated man, Slate. I could never put you back together again. Give me another whiff of your smelling salt, sailor. That ringing noise is back in my skull. You're a ham bone. That's the telephone. Shannon's place, Sailor Duval. Mr. Shannon, please. Oh, uh-huh. For you, Slate, the man who grows sugar. He's in a tizzy. Anyway, he makes sounds like a tizzy. I'll let you know. Slate Shannon speaking. Forget it, Mr. Shannon. Forget it or I'll call on you. I don't need you any longer. Where are you, Mr. Cameron? I'm at home. But you're not to come here. You're not to... Get me a clean shirt, sailor. I've got to see a man who doesn't need me. <laughs> I told you What's that... this all about, Cameron? Did anyone follow you here? I didn't bother to look. Let's go inside. If they follow you... Inside. I... Norton's got you scared, too, huh? You don't know what you're doing coming here. Who did he threaten? You or your daughter? Get out of here. You made a big noise when I first met you, Cameron. Now all I hear is chicken. Your daughter needs help. What happened to all your worry about her? I'll kill you. I'll kill you. Hey, you're kidding. Oh, let go of me. You're going to oh. calm down. Oh. Hey. Oh. That's better. Now, well, don't let us throw you. It's just a matter of age and condition. They'll kill her. Now, they won't kill her. That's not what you're afraid of. Yes, yes. They're taking all your money through her. Killing you would be a safer investment. That way, they'd get the money a lot faster. I... I don't want to die. Well, neither do I. You started something with me. Now it's got to be finished. Back 
to Bold Venture. Our stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, and the second act of our story. I give you two words, Slate. You're crazy. Yeah, I get psychotic when I'm beat over the head. Now, look, it's three o'clock in the morning. Go get some sleep. I've gotten better prizes than you in the bottom of a crackerjack box. Why don't you do what I tell you? Look, if you tried to handle the bold venture now, you'd drive her into the rocks. In your condition, you... have got a condition? The man said he'd kill you if you came out to the blue moon again. He said that... Aren't you going to help me aboard our boat? All right. Sometimes I wonder why I even bother. I had a spaniel once who had better manners than you. Talk to me, Slate. Out of the way. Ah, come on. Now, you're going to give me trouble. Who are you talking to? Out of the way. Taylor. What do you want? Come here. Look at the motor. Wires all over the place. Someone's... Someone's come aboard. Who's there? I can't see your face. Who is it? But you can see my gun, can't you? Who are you? How about you, Mr. Vall? Can you see it? Uh, move it a little to the left. Thanks. My, it's pretty in the moonlight. If you get that boat fixed, take it north. If you take it south, you might get too close to the blue moon. Then everything will blow up in your face. I've been pushed around long enough. I've got about... And next time, I'll put the bullet into your head, Shannon, instead of into the woodwork of your boat. Want to try? No? <laughs> See? You can be sensible. Good night, mechanics. You do yourself nicely on my money, Paul. Your apartment, charming. The decor, excellent taste. And now that I've performed the amenities, you have something for me? It'll take Shannon a long time to fix his boat. And you convinced him not to annoy us anymore? Mm, it's hard to tell with a man like Shannon. Yes, you're ever so right. But it's up to you, my dear Kathy. If Shannon should discover you're a murderess, a hit-and-run killer, they'd take you away from me. And that would make you desolate, wouldn't it? You wanted me to do something? Just tell me. Don't claw at me like a fat cat. Emotions have their way with you, don't they, my dear? All right. Call Shannon's place. Ask for Miss Duval. Tell her to come here because you need her so desperately. In ten minutes. You do need her, Kathy. So you won't waste your precious life away in prison. Shannon's place, Sailor Duval speaking. This is Kathy, Miss Duval. Kathy Cameron. Is Mr. Shannon there? No, he's sitting up with a sick boat. He's up now. Good. To... Listen, you must come here alone. 16 Paseo Gomez, apartment 12. In 10 minutes, if it matters to you whether I live. Well, that's the other side of town. How do I get there this time of night? There are no cabs. What do I do? Wave a wand over a pumpkin? Oh, you must. Please, find a way. Well, maybe King Moses will lend me his jalopy. What's wrong, Kathy? Why do you In want... In ten minutes, Mr. Val. The way you wanted it, Craig? Your choice of words was exquisite, my dear. And it is a matter of whether you live. <laughs> Dum, da, dum, dum, da, da, da. Hey, watch out, you crazy fool. Look, I, I didn't see you. I, oh, you're hurt, aren't you? I'll go get help. Hey there. Am I glad to see somebody? This man I ran... saw what happened. Get a doctor, will you? Your car was weaving from side to side. You ran this man down. What are you talking about? He just ran out in front of the car. And you tried to run away. If I hadn't stopped you, you'd have just left the man lying there. You know something? You don't have anything to worry about as long as you listen to me. You know something? No, your voice fits your face. First it was your face. You spin the wheel on the blue moon. And your voice happened a little while ago, aboard our boat. 
Wait a minute. It doesn't matter who I am. You hit that man. Ouch! Hey, you out of your mind, lady? Did I pinch you too hard? You're supposed to be dead. Hey, we got a clever one on our hands, Paul. Yeah. She's done being clever. Throw her in the car, Mickey. The boss will tell you where to throw her after that. Welcome, Mr. Slit. I got coffee perking for you in the kitchen. Uh, thanks, King. You didn't have to wait up for me. What I have and have not to do, Mr. Slate, is my own affair. I go bring your coffee. Oh, no coffee. Stay here, King. Sing to me. Right now I need sleep. I do not think sleep will come to you, Mr. Slate. You just sit there and watch it. It will not come because Miss Salo is not here. If she wants to roam Havana this time and I'd let her. I got other things on my mind. Two hours ago there came a phone call. Miss Salo scribble address on part, borrow my auto. Here is the address. I think you better go look for her, Mr. Slate. <laughs> Because you're afraid she'll have gone with that heap. Take 20 bucks out of the register, King. That'll take care of it. Because the call came from Miss Kathy Cameron. Huh? I told you sleep would not come, Mr. Slate. Banging on the right door, mister. Yeah. Banging on the right head. Oh! Ah. Now we'll drag you inside. Come on, up on your feet. Get with it, Buster. Start talking. What's the matter with you? Oh. Up. This is where we were ten seconds ago. Start talking. Uh, not gonna get you anyplace, Shannon. You know my name. Huh? Oh. That's for taking the liberty. What did you do with Sailor? Blue Moon. She's there. How come she's there? You're going to answer me, Buster, because you happen to be fresh off the Blue Moon. You're the guy who spins the roulette wheel. I tried to frame her. Didn't work. How? Make like hit and run. Blackmail. Little guy, Mickey, used to make a living at it. Run in front of the car, make out he's hurt. People get scared. Pay off. Sailor was too smart. Didn't bite. Same gambit you pulled on Kathy Cameron, huh? Get out of it, Shannon. You know, for a guy who spins a roulette wheel all day, how come you keep one in your apartment? Hobby. Uh-huh. Hobby. And you'll enjoy this. I read where a croupier in Monte Carlo practiced and practiced. He got good. He could put that ball in the black slot or the red slot almost every time he wanted. You're buying grief. He couldn't do it every time, but his average was great. All right, all right. Like you and Norton are doing to Kathy Cameron. Blackmailing her on a hit-and-run caper. She pays off by playing the wheel, loses money every night. Knows it's rigged against her and can't do anything about it. <laughs> Stealing money legal. Uh-huh. Because I woke you from a deep sleep. Oh! I give it back to you. Hey, amigo, your boat for hire? Let me hear a number, senor. Five bucks. Not the right number. Try Carlos with the cat boat. Ten. Ten bucks. Put your money where my hand is. Here. Eight bucks and change. The blue moon, skipper, she's anchored a few miles out. First, I count the change. Well, look, you. Do you want the blue moon, senor? Then let me count the change. Ninety-seven, ninety-eight, ninety-nine. Oh. Here is the other penny. You, you almost didn't make it, senor. You want I should wait for you, senor? Yeah, wait. I give you a hand up the side. Now, this rope hanging down from the side. Just hold the end of it. I'm going up hand over hand. Pick a cabin, Shannon, and see how your luck is. Sailor. 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 Hey, it's the middle of the night. 
Yeah, isn't it, though? I'll get back to you. Sailor. Is that you, Slate? Let me in. I can't. The door's locked. You got a hairpin? What's the matter? The night wind playing hard with your hair, too? Slip it under the door. All right, here. Where did you learn how to pick a lock? A friend of mine taught me. Gee, that reminds me, I owe her a letter. I'll stay like this, sailor. It's been too long since I felt your arm against my cheek. Just think. All this while, there's only been a hairpin. But... Get back in there, sailor. Put your hair up. I'll be back. Can't get away, Shannon. You made a mistake, Shannon. I'm going to find you in that boiler room and kill you. I see you, Shannon. Well, I've got to hand it to you, Shannon. You tried. Too bad you had to die on a coal pile. You almost did. Come on down to the coal pile with me. I'll brain you. Start with this. I can still hear you. Ah. Can't hear you anymore now, Norton. Slade, are you all right? Look, I spoiled a nice clean shirt you washed for me. I'll wash your other one. First, there's a couple of guys on this boat. I've got to collect them for the police. What about Kathy? She's got nothing more to worry about. Her father can get her. Well, it happened again, Slate. You did your good deed, and you got your lumps for it. Don't you get tired of it. Till the next time. Let's get out of here, sailor. All fixed, sailor. The last wire's in place. The bold venture's gonna run like a dream. Fine. Where are we going? Well, I didn't say we were going any place. I just said the bold venture'd run like a dream. You want to hear it? If it makes you happy. All right. Wait till you hear that motor purr. What kind of a dream does that sound like? Oh, I had it running a minute ago. Let me try. What'd you do to it? Touched it gently. You want to see how? See? Your eyes, your cheeks, your lips. You purr too, don't you? <laughs> Full speed ahead, sailor. There's a smooth sea tonight. And so our two stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, have brought to a close our latest Bold Venture story. Special music was composed and conducted by David Rose. May we invite you to listen again next week at this time for another exciting adventure starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall together in Bold Venture. The National Broadcasting Company, in conjunction with the Fund for Adult Education, presents Democracy in America by Alexis de Tocqueville. Eighteen thirty-one. Are Americans well educated? Look for the learned, and you will be surprised how few they are. But if you count the ignorant, the American people will appear to be the most enlightened in the world. It cannot be doubted that in the United States, the instruction of the people powerfully contributes to the support of democracy. Common Sense and Moonshine. A study in American education. Item 10 in the series Democracy in America. 
prepared by the Division of General Education of New York University under the direction of George Probst, American historian. A series designed to bring to life the America of 1831 as recorded by Alexis de Tocqueville and so to illuminate the image of democracy itself. A study in American education, common sense and moonshine. When Beaumont and I landed in America in May 1831, we were overwhelmed with the multitude of sights and sounds of the city of New York. But one thing struck us so forcibly by its absence. Where are the children? You are quite right, Beaumont. There are no children to be seen. Whereas Paris is overrun with children. Perhaps they are working in the factories. They were not working in the factories. Far from it. They were in school. The New York of 1831 had universal, free, public education. Out of a population of 200,000, 50,000 were in the schools. One quarter of the entire population. And this is true of the whole of New England and New York State. Every citizen, as a child, receives the elementary notions of human knowledge. There is no country in which there is more respect for education. Or more suspicion of the educated man. Or more indifference to the position of teachers. These are strange contradictions, Beaumont, but they are ever present in this country that believes so ardently in the power of education. All the people you see, to whatever rank of society they belong, seem incapable of conceiving that the advantage of education might be doubted. They never fail to smile when told that this opinion is not universal in Europe. My dear Mr. Tocqueville, it's not a matter for discussion. Every American is sure that universal education is an absolute necessity to a free people like ourselves. I sympathize, but I am by no means convinced. My dear sir, there is no money qualification for either voting or holding office. Every man is a citizen. Every man must be educated. Is there no hostility between education and religion? None whatever. Schools, churches, roads. Those are three universal needs that all Americans agree on. But don't you find men educated beyond their position in life? Isn't there a danger that indiscriminate education can make men discontented? Discontented? What about? This is America. Yes, but... In America, sir, the resources of nature are far beyond the claims of man. There's no moral energy or intellectual activity which does not find a ready outlet. In America, sir, schoolhouses are the Republican lines of fortifications, the factories of citizens. I know that this is an idea that is alive in every American mind. And it's not merely an idea, sir. I have the figures by me. You are very fond of figures. <laughs> All Americans like statistics. We may not always have much use for history. We are too much interested in the past. But statistics, now they can be a clue to the future. You can get an idea of the direction of progress. We like that. Progress and education. Now, in the state of New York at present, out of a population of around two million, there are 509,000 children between the ages of five and 16. And 97% of them are in school. Around one in four, sir, of the entire population. Furthermore, any citizen, any citizen at all who, who sees a child at play during school hours will ask, why aren't you in school? And unless he gets a good reason, he'll take that child straight off to the nearest schoolhouse. And people do it, sir. I've done it myself. That's the meaning of universal free education. Indeed it is. But how can you possibly afford to educate so many children? Well, all European visitors ask that question and are surprised at what we're accomplishing. We can afford it because we must afford it. The principal expenditures of our states are on education. For every American, sir, knows in his heart and will brook no contradiction, Mr. Tocqueville that a people that is to govern itself must first educate itself. As a matter of fact, sir, James Madison, our fourth president, said once that popular government without popular education is a prologue to either a farce or a tragedy. The 
Thus, in the northern states, at least, education remains the first consideration, even in a new community. Even the farmer's almanac says... The prudent farmer looks first to three things to prepare for winter. Secure your cellars from frost, fasten loose clapboards and shingles, and secure a good schoolmaster. And they are secure. Not less than 60,000 New Englanders are employed as teachers in the different states, which is more creditable to New England than all the praises which could be bestowed on the industry and ingenuity of her inhabitants. Even the laws relating to public education shed the clearest possible light on the original nature of American society. The preamble to the Massachusetts Education Law of 1650 is unmistakable. Well, as Satan, the old enemy of mankind, finds his strongest weapons in the ignorance of men, and whereas it is important that the wisdom of our fathers shall not remain buried in their tombs, and whereas with the help of the Lord, the education of children is one of the prime concerns of the state, there follow clauses establishing schools in every township and obliging the inhabitants under pain of heavy fines to support them. And so it has been ever since. Education needs schools, and schools need teachers. But even in those parts of America where custom exalts education and the schools, you will not find a similar respect for the teachers. That is why so many teaching in our schools are men whose mind is set on something else. In what way? Why, sir? In that they intend to become lawyers, ministers, or physicians. They have been obliged, so to speak, to resort to teaching, either to finish their college education or to earn the means to study what they consider their real professions. But is this the general view? It most certainly is, sir. I can assure you, an old teacher like myself of many years' experience is only sure of being considered as a man of inferior talents, else he would have followed his colleagues in their professional careers. Certainly, sir, as long as this opinion of instructors is entertained in the United States... The schoolmaster's task will be degraded. It is not only a humble occupation, but a humiliating one in the eyes of many. I know of teachers who feel that the necessity of being reduced to teaching has defamed their fair reputation. Certainly they take the first opportunity to leave it with disgust and detestation. But why? Why should this be so in a country that places so much faith in the power of education? Money, sir. Money? This country also places much faith in the power of money. But our teachers' wages are mere pittances. If you can change, you are almost sure to better yourself. There is too much turnover of teachers and consequently neither discipline nor continuity. I tell you, sir, many a fashionable gentleman of the large cities would be glad of the company of the instructor of his children to a family dinner, but would think himself disgraced if he appeared with him in public. I ask you, sir, with what zeal can a man devote himself to teaching in America, a profession at once laborious and difficult, but in which the greatest success is incapable of procuring distinction, which exposes him to unmerited contempt and reproach? And why should a pettifogging lawyer or a quack consider himself better than an honest and successful instructor? The Americans talk so much of the immense extent to which they carry the education of their people that one is apt at first to suppose that greater progress is made in the celebrated march of intellect than the result is found to justify. At 16, education ends and money-making begins. To say nothing of the fact that all this interest in education is centered in New England and New York, so that as you go west or south, education diminishes. Yet they believe themselves in all sincerity to have surpassed, to be surpassing, and to be about to surpass the whole earth in the intellectual race. Uh, for example, there was a Vermont farmer who, hooking his toes in the underrail of his chair legs and hooking his thumbs in the armholes of his waistcoat, gave his opinions with an interesting mixture of the pride of simplicity and the authority of indifference. Well, sir, there are some men like to talk of politics and agriculture. That's reasonable, very reasonable. Interesting to hear how many British were thrashed in this place, how much wheat was thrashed in that. But I take an interest in literature. I have what you'd call a literary bent. A little more cider? Uh, no, thank you. Take a taste of the Olson Crow rum? Thank you. 
Well, that keeps the pork and beans clear from the bunk and pie. Well, now, sir, out here on the farm, I always vote my evenings to reading and learning. Writing, you know, and sometimes kind of geometry. What kind of geometry, sir? The arithmetic kind, I guess you'd call it. Now, I reckon myself a tolerable good scholar, for I'm a great one for reading. What do you read? Well, there's three books I'm always reading. The Bible, the Almanac, and the Dictionary. But that's not all. I'm glad to hear it. No, sir. I take in a weekly paper. And once a fortnight, I ride over to Burlington, Vermont, to see what there might be new and cleverish in the bookstore. And what is there? Well, there's Goldsmith's History of Rome. That's a rather cute book, I reckon. I like it very much. And then there's the Natural History. That's considerably well done, I think. And Buchan's Medicine and Murray's Grammar. And some more, the like, I know pretty well. Them are all judgmatical books, I reckon. What do you think, Arnhem? Alas, I have not read them. But do you read novels or poetry? Well, I tell you, I never read no romances or poetry but two. Pilgrim's Progress and Robinson Crusoe. And how did you like them? Oh, I don't see there's much genius in them. They're too belittling, as Mr. Jefferson says, for a man to read. I see. Of course, you, sir, are an educated man. Yes, sir, I am. I've been able to get quite a sufficient lot of learning without going to any great trouble or cost. Do you know any of the classical languages? Latin? Greek? Ah, what in all creation have living people to do with dead languages? That kind of rubbish is only fit for colleges and universities, and such like aristocratic places for the high-born and the rich. All they ever learn at those places is gaming, drinking, and wenching. I don't need them. I'm self-educated. The Americans set their own standard and judge for themselves. But because they all use the same rules for the direction of the mind, they nonetheless end with something very like their neighbor's opinion. This follows from their philosophical method. What is the philosophical method of the Americans? To evade the bondage of system. To accept tradition only as a means of information and existing facts only as a lesson to be used in doing otherwise and doing better. To seek the reason of things for oneself and in oneself alone. To look for results without being bound to means and to strike through the form to the substance. And, of course, their idea of education is based on this down-to-earth practical philosophy. This means that while there is respect for education itself, there is suspicion and perhaps even scorn for the educated man. Do you remember when we were in Boston, exposed to a rolling fire of dinners, balls, and receptions? How often we heard this sort of conversation among the leaders of Boston society. They warmly approved the use of elementary education, but there was a very different attitude towards higher education. Instead of respect for the calm cultivation of the mind, they were for nothing but practical education, whose motto is common sense. Common sense. Yes, gentlemen, common sense is the genius. Genius, Caleb? I do not like that word. Common sense is the essence of society and good government. And I think no people in the world have inherited a larger share of this commodity than the Yankees. Our cool, calm, calculating, money-making Yankees. Correct. Uh, you, sir, being a foreigner, did you ever see a more intelligent people than our Bostonians? Did you ever see a city more quiet, more prosperous, more orderly than Boston? The appearance of Boston certainly warrants all you Yes, sir, to... and I can point out to you at least 100 persons in this city worth upwards of $100,000. That certainly argues in favor of the industry and perseverance of its inhabitants. Say, uh, it argues in favor of their common sense in which industry and perseverance are necessarily included. We are a common-sense, matter-of-fact people. We leave genius and enthusiasm to Europeans. Uh, thank heaven. I have no genius in my family. My children are all brought up to be industrious. Ah, uh, you may thank the Lord for that, Seth. I never saw a genius yet who was either himself happy or capable of making others so. Uh, yep. 
I have brought up my sons to become merchants or manufacturers. Only Sam, who is a little hard of hearing and rather slow of comprehension, shall go to college. Our merchants, sir, are the most respectable part of the community. What college do you mean to send him to? I shall send him to Harvard University, the oldest literary institution in the country. Have you been to see it? We have been but a few days in Boston, but I shall certainly take an early opportunity. Do so. You will find it well worth your while. It will convince you that while we have been making money, we have not altogether neglected arts and sciences. Which are your cleverest men in the various departments of science? <laughs> Why, they are none of them very clever in our sense of the word. Yeah. We consider professors as secondary men. Our practice is to give the different professorships away to young men in order to induce them to devote themselves to the branch they are to teach. Our country is too young for old professors. Besides, they're too poorly paid to induce first-rate men to devote themselves to the business of lecturing. But in this manner, you will never have eminent men in the higher departments of philosophy. We have as yet no time to devote to abstract learning. We are too young for that. Our principal acquirement consists in common sense. All the rest we consider as moonshine. Let me tell you, a young man learns as much in six months in the counting room in Boston as in four years at college. Uh, all our friends don't entirely agree. Uh, not all. But I tell them that our colleges only make poor gentlemen and spoil clever tradesmen. Name over the rich men in Boston. Most of them are self-taught country boys, possessed of no other learning than the art of making dollars in a neat, handsome, clean manner. And this has given them a higher standing in society than they could have acquired by all the philosophy in the world, and has enabled them to marry into the oldest and most aristocratic families in Boston. Take, for instance, the case of our friend we were with last night. Yeah. What does he know except making money? Nothing. Fine man. What has he ever learned except negotiating notes? Some of them pretty sharp, too. What college did he ever go to except that of our brokers in State Street? None. And has he not married the daughter of one of our richest men? Ah, uh, yeah, fine man. And is he not now connected with some of our first people, with the real backbone of our Boston aristocracy? Ah, uh, yeah. And do you know the answer his father-in-law gave to one of his old friends who remonstrated with him for giving his daughter away to a parvenu from the country? What answer, monsieur? I give my daughter to any man, he said, who will come to Boston and have wit enough to make $100,000 in six years. Uh -huh, there's common sense for you. That's what we call practical philosophy. It is a melancholy fact that a great number of our young men who have gone to college have afterwards been unsuccessful in business. I think our education is not sufficiently practical. We are still attached to the uh, European system. Not only that... Most of our students contract habits of idleness, which will never answer in this country. They want to imitate English gentlemen. They all are to be told what my partner told his son when asked how to succeed in business. Take off your kid gloves, he said, and go to work. That's philosophy. That beats Aristotle. But if this be the prevailing taste, why do you call Boston the Athens of the United States? Oh, that refers to our ladies, not to our gentlemen. Our ladies read a great deal. What else have they to do? Besides, admire their husbands. And we have, besides, a lot of literary twaddles manufactured by the wholesale at Harvard who attempt to turn the heads of our young girls with the nonsense they call... Poetry, <laughs> which fills nearly all our papers instead of clever editorials. If we have one good poet among us, we have at least 50, the joint earnings of whom would not be sufficient to keep a dog. Hey, yep. <laughs> but how do your literary men manage to get along? They marry rich women who can afford paying for being entertained. They show common sense in that. It's quite the fashion for our rich girls to buy themselves a professor previous to taking a trip to Europe. You see, um... All this moonshine is well enough for rich girls, but the thing to teach all the children is the necessity of working. And in what manner is this done? In the best manner common sense could dictate. The instructors make them study for money. They distribute annually a certain sum, say from 80 to $100, in the shape of prize money among those who obtain the highest marks. The pupils are numbered as high as plus seven and as low as minus seven a certain number of positive marks entitling the child to one cent prize money. At the end of the school term, accounts are made out when each child receives a check on a bookseller or stationer for the amount due in. 
for which he may now select a book, a penknife, or some trifling article. On which, of course, the instructor himself enjoys a liberal discount. Ah, ah. But does not this practice induce sordid habits at an age in which the mind is most susceptible of receiving impressions and in which it is of the greatest importance to instill more elevated notions of honor and justice? You are entirely mistaken. Yep, entirely. <coughs> One can see that you are a little dyed in the speculative philosophy of your country. No, sir. No stimulus to learning can be half as great as when a boy can figure it out on his own slate how many dollars and cents his geography, grammar, spelling, reading, and good conduct come to per annum. <laughs> In America, most of the rich men were formerly poor. Most of those who now enjoy leisure were absorbed in business during their youth. The consequence of this is that when they might have had a taste for study, they had no time for it. And when the time is at their disposal, they have no longer the inclination. I do not believe that there is a country in the world where, in proportion to the population, there are so few ignorant and at the same time so few learned individuals. Primary instruction is within the reach of everybody. Superior instruction is scarcely to be obtained by anybody. Their education generally ends at the age when ours begins. If it is continued beyond that point, it aims only towards a particular specialized and profitable purpose. One studies a branch of knowledge as one takes up a business. And one takes up only those applications whose immediate practicality is recognized. Thus, a middling standard is fixed in America for human knowledge. All approach as near to it as they can, some as they rise, others as they descend. Man cannot prevent the unequal distribution of the gifts of intellect, but although the capacities of men are different, as God intended they should be, the means that Americans find for putting them to use are equal. Practical education, therefore, is a form of enlightened self-interest. The clearest lesson of wisdom on this concerned a hard-working Massachusetts mechanic. Here tell they're fixing to build a normal school. Right. Normal school. That's to educate teachers for all the public schools. Right. I guess it would be right good. We can use one of them. I guess so, Amos. Well, I guess you'll be raising money. Don't get much done without it. I brought along a subscription. Here's my check to help establish one of those teacher training places. Well, thank you kindly, Amos. I'll just give you a receipt. Uh, wait a minute. It says here one thousand dollars. You better change that quick. Why? You're not a wealthy man, Amos. Didn't you mean one hundred dollars and put down a cipher too many? No. Nope. Well, you can't afford that much. After all, you're the father of a family. Right. I am the father of a family. And how can I help my children better than by seeing they get decent teachers? If I want to educate my children, I've got to educate the community they're living in. In Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Working Men's Committee said in 1830, while pressing for common public schools as a matter of legal right instead of charity... When the committee contemplates their own condition and that of the great mass of their fellow laborers, when we look around on the glaring inequality of society, we are constrained to believe that until the means of equal instruction shall be equally secured to all... Liberty is but an unmeaning word, and equality an empty shadow. Education is the priceless advantage, as the great Benjamin Franklin said. If a man empties his purse into his head, no one can take it from him. But yet better not be found out. However, this passion for education does not apply to the South, where a few receive a good non-practical contemplative education. Yet, in general, it may be said that education languishes in the South. Indeed, you can find people on the extreme borders who are totally illiterate, as in France. But even in the South, the power of education is respected. 
All laws relative to slavery forbid the education of slaves. Not only are the public schools closed to them, but their masters are forbidden to allow them the most elementary instruction. One South Carolina law imposes a fine of 100 pounds sterling on the master who teaches his slaves to read. The penalty is no greater if he kills them. In general, however, Beaumont, the effort made in America to spread useful education is truly prodigious. The universal and sincere faith that they possess here in the power of education seems to me one of the most remarkable features of America. Their results, one of those powerful efforts, quiet but irresistible, that nations sometimes make when they march toward a goal with a common and universal impulse. There has never been under the sun a people as enlightened as the population of the north of the United States in the year 1831. Because of their education, they are more strong, more skillful, more capable of governing themselves and enduring the condition of liberty. You have just heard Common Sense and Moonshine, a study in American education, item 10, in a series based on Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. This series, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, was prepared by the Division of General Education of New York University under the direction of George Probst, American historian. Produced in the studios of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation by Andrew Allen. Script by Lister Sinclair. Music by Lucio Agostini. This series, Democracy in America, is made possible by a grant from the Fund for Adult Education as part of a general course of study of the nature of American society. For information about the use of these de Tocqueville dramatizations for study or discussion, and how to secure these new materials about American democracy at a reasonable charge, write to the American Foundation for Continuing Education, Post Office Box 749, Chicago 90, Illinois. Now this is Ben Grower inviting you to listen next week to The Chief Instrument of Freedom, Item 11, on Democracy in America. This program was pre-recorded and is an NBC Radio Network presentation. Wherever you are, stay tuned to World Events on NBC Radio. Afternoon Theatre. We present Coral Brown and Virginia Maskell in Waters of the Moon by N.C. Hunter. Waters of the Moon. Say, hey, Evelyn, look at this magazine. Pictures of the Grahamsland expedition I was talking about. S.S. Curlew. How can you go on an expedition like that, John? It's very so silly to think of things that are absolutely out of the question. Everything I suggest seems to be out of the question. Well, in a year or two... Oh, a year and another year and another year. Dr. Gresford says I'm decidedly better and I feel better. Have you once heard me cough this last week? Have you? I challenge you. Besides, I, I put on weight. That's a fact. All the better. Aha, excellent. Still snowing. What's excellent about it? Oh, glorious snow from heaven. Bury us all in your whiteness. One gets so tired of this Devonshire lushness. It's enervating. I've often thought I should be a damn sight better if we lived in some sort of bitter, bracing place like Aberdeen. Doesn't anyone want a historic Georgian gem on the edge of delightful Dartmoor, skillfully converted into a private hotel? It gives us a living, remember. There's that to be thankful for. Living? It's more like being buried alive. Yes. Go and get a couple of logs, will you? All right. I say, 
Are you by any chance losing your heart to Herr Julius Winterhalter? Oh, don't be absurd. But why not? He has considerable charm, those soft brown eyes. I like him. Don't laugh at me. I'm not laughing. On the contrary, I'm delighted. Oh, good evening, Mrs. White. It's still snowing. Dreadful. <laughs> I wonder if I might have a glass of hot water. Certainly. Oh, and Evelyn. Yes? Uh, you will see my hot water bottle is really hot tonight, won't you? Wasn't it hot last night? Not really hot, no. I'm so sorry. I'm not complaining. I just mentioned it. I'll see to it myself. Thank you. Good evening, Colonel Selby. Oh, good evening. Snowy. Yeah. We might have quite a fall. Oh, dear. Yes. Well, after tea, I put some crumbs out for the birds. Oh, oh listen. Do you hear that? What is it? I thought I heard wild geese passing over. Now, that's uh, usually a sign of hard weather. Oh, is it? Uh, in, uh, this morning, I uh, I shot a duck. Oh? Why? Well, I thought it might make a welcome addition to our diet. In a way, it seems curious to feed some birds and shoot others. Hmm. Yes, yes. If one thinks of it logically, that is so. But there it is. I was brought up to use a gun. I shot my first grouse in Dumfrieshire when I was 12 years old. That was in uh, 1889. Now, let's see, it's uh, 1950 now. Well, that's 61 years ago. The Italians have a saying that every bird thinks its own nest beautiful. Uh, extraordinary race, the Italians. <laughs> Almost anything, in fact, is preferable to a communal nest. Especially one where people smoke in the bathroom. Oh, I do assure you, Mrs. White, I... I wasn't never... accusing you, Colonel Selby. I know exactly who it was. It wasn't a man at all. Why she stays here, why she doesn't go back to London where she belongs... No doubt I should be told that that's a very snobbish way to talk. But the longer I live, the more I dislike modern bad manners and inconsiderate behaviour. It's one thing to face old age and poverty and ill health. But it's a little hard to be condemned to lead a communal life with people whose education and upbringing have been so entirely different. Here, one has simply the privacy of an animal at the zoo. Oh, come now, Mrs. White, come now. Oh, please, forgive me. I'm really ashamed of myself. In summer, one can spend a good deal of time out of doors or sitting in one's bedroom. Now the snow has come, we shall be cooped up together in this room like dogs in a kennel. And it's still December, December. The winters here seem interminable. It's coming down as thick as anything. You'd be lost on the moor in no time. And I wouldn't care to be in a car either. While I was getting these logs, I heard a tree fall on the drive. You talk as if you liked the snow, John. Liked it? Yes, yes, I do like it. I don't quite know why, but... I've always enjoyed stories of Arctic travels and exploration. <laughs> Although polar expeditions don't benefit anyone much, well, there's something rather heroic, don't you think, in this struggling against cold and pain, just for the sake of struggling? Johnny! Johnny! Oh, that's Mother. The latest theory is that I talk too much. The sooner I expect to be rationed to monosyllables. Excuse me. <laughs> oh, poor boy. He talks of polar expeditions, and he's not fit to do an ordinary day's work. Well, what do you think of the weather? Quite a change, isn't oh, it? Oh, do sit here, Mrs. Ashworth. Anyway, it's snug in here, that's one thing. No, don't move, please, Colonel. Now come and sit by me, Mr. Winterhalter, and then the magic circle will be complete. No, thank you. I have a letter to write. He says the snow reminds him of Vienna. When I was a child, I was excited each year by the first snows of winter. When I woke in the morning and there was in the room, I remember a particular sort of light, quite different from the usual grayness of winter. And when one looked out, there it was, the snow, whiteness everywhere. But that was in the old days, of course, <laughs> the bad old days. Yes, Vienna has seen some misfortune since the end of the Habsburgs. Yes, yes, the storms of history have swept over it, you might say. Now it's like a beautiful woman who has grown old and tired and wrinkled and fallen on hard times. How sad. Your hot water bottle, Mrs. White. No, thank you, Ethan. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Ah, now for a game of patience. I can't knit all the time. It looks as if we're going to have to stay indoors quite a lot now. Now, where did I put the cards? Ah, oh, yes. Here we are. <laughs> the Colonel's gone to sleep again. He's always going to sleep nowadays. Oh, I suppose when one's 73, there's not very much else one can do. 
Since his brother died two years ago, I don't believe he's had more than half a dozen letters. Ah, two red kings. Well, two red queens, isn't that a nuisance? Funny to think how a life changes. There he is, DSO, MC, all the rest of it. And all he can do is to potter about by himself and feed crumbs to the birds. Oh, good gracious. Uh, 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 what is it? <laughs> it's all right, Colonel, don't be alarmed. It's only the bell. Well, who could be ringing at this time of night? I'll have a look. I do hope we're not disturbed. Yes, motorists. I expect they'll want to stay the night. What sort of people? Well, I only got a glimpse, but they look rather smart. Fur coats and all the rest of it. Two women and a man. Smart? Oh, how tiresome. Uh, this is the lounge, Mrs. Lancaster. Of course, we don't cater for many guests, especially in the winter. Lounge? But it's the most handsome room. And it's got a fire. Well, that's everything, everything. Oh, please, don't anybody move on any account. Come along, Robert. Uh, uh, do sit here. Oh, how kind, how very kind. Tony, darling, come and thaw. This is my daughter, Tonetta, everybody. Oh, and uh, my husband. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? I'd really resign myself to freezing to death in the ditch. Oh, we were absolutely in the ditch. You know, we skidded into the side of that nasty little bridge down the road, and there we were, benighted in the snow. Oh, well, what an experience. Yes. Oh, how far we've had to walk, I couldn't say, and through an absolute blizzard, you couldn't see a yard in front of your face. About half a mile. Oh, now, don't keep saying that, Robert, dear. It must be much nearer three. It felt like ten. Oh, look at my legs, absolutely soaked, drenched. As for accommodation, Mrs. Lancaster... You know, I knew I... it would snow. I said so at breakfast, but of course my husband had listened to the wireless. Cold winds with a chance of showers in the west. Showers, I ask you. A blinding blizzard. Oh, now look at us, simply monopolising the fire. It really is too bad. No, 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 no. no, no, no we do please. apologise. We really do. It's a dreadful intrusion. As to accommodation... No, please, uh, sit down, everybody. Please, please. Darling, you're interrupting all the time. No, I'm not, dear. What do you mean? I was just going to say, we have one double room ready, uh, though it's not a front room, I'm afraid. Four walls and a bed will be the very height of luxury for us, Mrs... Uh, uh, Daly. Mrs. Daly. Wouldn't it, Robert? And if we might possibly have a fire, well, even an electric thing or an oil stove would do. I shall never get warm again. Well, now, the question of the other room... Oh, Tony I... will be happy in any little room, won't you, darling? Of course, of course. Now, don't worry at all about that. Well, the trouble is, the other rooms are in the part of the house we close for the winter. I wouldn't care to put anyone there tonight. I was going to suggest, oh, just for one night, if she could manage on the sofa... Oh, but of I... course, it's perfect. Well, tomorrow night, of course. Oh, I, I hope we shan't have to trouble you tomorrow night, Mrs. Daly. Well, I'll sleep on the sofa. The young lady can have my room. Oh, oh but how very, very kind and chivalrous. Helen, I really don't think... Oh, we but I, could... I couldn't really. Well, I accept this gentleman's extremely kind offer on behalf of my daughter, and I do it on principle. Goodness knows there's a little enough courtesy and chivalry in the world today, and it's entirely the fault of the stupid women who insist on discouraging it. Let me say how extremely obliged I am to you, Mr... Winterhalter. Winterhalter, but like the painter. Precisely. Yes, like the painter. Tonetta, thank Mr. Winterhalter properly for his great kindness. This is my daughter, Mr. Winterhalter, Tonetta Landy. Thank you, you very much indeed, Mr. Winterhalter. Oh, and I've always pronounced it Winterhalter. Her father was an Italian. Oh, soup. Hot soup would be really delicious if such a thing were wildly possible. Well, uh, cocoa or tea. Cocoa or tea, Tony? Tea, please. And I'll have tea. Oh, and some toast, I think. Oh, no, a few biscuits. Uh, a sandwich. Oh, thank you so much. We are upsetting you, aren't we? My daughter will get the rooms ready. Then everything's arranged. Well, Robert, dear, you must phone the Maitlands. They'll be dreadfully anxious. Tell them we'll come along tomorrow for lunch. Oh, no, uh, tea would be safer, perhaps. Well, that'll depend on the weather, dear, and how much the car's damaged. But we can't stay here, dear. You can see it's quite impossible. Well, it may be a question of force majeure. The roads may be blocked for weeks. Oh, don't be silly, dear. Uh, we were supposed to be going over for the New Year to some friends near Yelverton. Oh, the fact is, of course, one ought to stay in one's own house over Christmas. It's madness to move. Madness. Would you care to see your rooms? And what about the luggage? Oh, I'll take the suitcases. Help him, Tony. I'm not going up now. I must get warm. i just go and tidy up my room. <sighs> Warmth. <laughs> what an adventure. <laughs> Do tell me... Are you all staying here for Christmas? We live here. What? Live here permanently? Yes. Oh, really? 
Oh, how amusing. Oh, but it does solve the servant problem, doesn't it? It solves quite a number of problems, more or less. It's very nice. It's very comfortable. Oh, and it's a beautiful room, even if the furniture isn't did exactly... Did you manage to carry some of your luggage? Oh, no, my husband did. Oh, thank goodness, he's immensely strong. What poor Renzo, my first husband, would have done, I really don't know. I think he would have lain down in the snow and simply given up the ghost, poor lamb. <laughs> oh, you know, I talk far too much, but it's a dreadful habit. I've none of the traditional British reserve, but then my mother was French, so that explains it, doesn't it? I'm a mongrel. Here's the tea and some sandwiches. Ah, so you're the son of the house. Yes. Oh, it's quite an Adonis. I beg your pardon? How old are you? I'm 22. Let me know if you want any more sandwiches. Twenty-two. Oh, to be twenty-two. Has he got a weak chest? Yes. Yes, I was afraid so. He has that heartbreakingly romantic look. Poor Mr. Winterhalter. He's tidying his room madly. It's too kind. Oh, he's a lamb. I saw it at once. It would have been merely unkind not to let him give up his bed. There's nothing so disappointing as to have one's chivalrous offers refused. I suppose he's a Jew. Oh, just an Austrian, I believe. Oh, delightful people. Peckless and incompetent, but, oh, such dears. They ought to be preserved. The whole of Austria should be taken over by the National Trust. <laughs> <laughs> now for some tea. Oh, won't you all have a cup? And hadn't we better introduce ourselves? I'm Helen Lancaster. Uh, Mrs. White. Mrs. Ashworth. Selby, Colonel Selby. Ah, so you are a Colonel. I was right. Not everyone would have spotted it. But I flatter myself I never mistake a retired soldier. There's, there's something about them. They look, well, properly washed. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find it dull here? But then perhaps you don't mind. Well, at 73, one's activities are necessarily somewhat limited. Uh, one reads, potters about, sleeps. Well, of course, of course. One ought to live quietly, quietly and with dignity. Thank you. Oh. Uh, I can carry them myself. Oh, excuse me. Oh, Mr. Winterhalter, what a shame. All those bedclothes and pillows. Now, I insist that you have a cup of tea and a sandwich. Quite all right. No trouble. I hear you come from my dearly beloved Austria. You know Austria. Oh, good heavens, man. How many, many times have I been to Vienna and Salzburg for the Mozart? It's an enchanting country. But I wouldn't go back for all the money in the world now that it's overrun by soldiery. <gasps> poor, poor Europe. Où sont les neiges d'antan? If you'll excuse me. She's uh, rather quiet, isn't she? Oh, I expect I upset her by making so much noise. Oh, she keeps herself very much to herself, Mrs. White does. Rather superior, you know. It's an interesting face, but it's unhappy somehow. Oh, come on and have some tea, Bobby. Please, Tony. Oh, don't give him tea or he'll kick all night. Oh, darling, I must have tea. You know, Winterhalter, I really do feel rather badly about this sofa. Now, don't go on about it, dear. It pleases him to give up his bed. Don't you understand? Yes, just so. It wouldn't please me. So, Mr. Winterhalter isn't English. He's a romantic, like me. <laughs> Tell me, that rather cross-looking girl we saw outside, is that Mrs. Daly's daughter? Yes, that's Evelyn. Her fiancé was killed in Germany just a week before the end of the war. Quite a tragedy. Oh, why do these things happen to people? A girl like that must wonder if there's any coherence or purpose in the universe at all. What regiment uh, were you in, Colonel Selby? Uh, I, I was a gunner, a horse gunner for many years. I had a friend called Claude Wilmington who commanded something or another called the um, Chestnut Troop. Oh, such uniforms he used to wear. Oh, well, that was years ago. <laughs> uh, I knew old Claude. I've got some photographs of him upstairs in the attic. If you cared to see them sometime, you I... haven't. <laughs> How absurd. Oh, of course. I would love to see them. I can't wait. Well, it may take a little time to dig them out. Bottom of the trunk, you know. Oh, please don't bother now. No, Tomorrow. No trouble at all. None at all. Helen, you really shouldn't. They're in the attic. Darling, it is a shame. Oh, what nonsense. He'll enjoy digging for them. I don't suppose he's shown them to anyone for years and years. It will be a great excitement for him. Oh, he's got six or seven albums. We've all seen them several times, except Mrs. White. Heavens! Now I'm 15 already. Excuse me, won't you? It's my variety night. Her what night? What in heaven's name? On Friday night, she always listens to some wireless program in her room. <laughs> Tonight, <laughs> of course. Oh, how amusing, aren't they? 
Oh, poor dears. How we upset them all. Their patients and their pipes and their programs. Can you imagine living here, making this one's home? Oh, poor Mr. Venterhalter. How you, of all people, brought up in one of the most beautiful and civilized capitals of Europe, how you can vegetate here. No. No, it's too much, and I can't allow it. You must find somewhere else to live, somewhere civilized. The Riviera, or Paris, or Florence. I shall make it my business to arrange it. Oh, oh yes, yes, I shall. One good turn deserves another, and we shall have a long talk about it in the morning. How long have you been here? Nearly a year. A year? I was rather ill a year ago, and the doctor advised some quiet, so I came here. It's not too expensive, you know. How much? Helen. Well, there's no use saying Helen. I must know if I'm going to help him. Well, perhaps he doesn't want help. Well, of course he doesn't. Don't be silly, Tony. You don't mind me asking, do you? <laughs> not at all. I pay four guineas a week. How much will we be paying for that nice little hotel in Montreux, Bobby? Uh, two and a half guineas a day each. Oh, we weren't. Well, it's really scandalous. But you leave it to me, Mr. Winterhalter. I shall think of something. I shall find a solution. It's very kind of you. Oh. Now that I'm warm, I see... Suddenly feel overpoweringly sleepy. Come, dears, to bed. You can't go yet. You've got to look at the Colonel's photographs. You said you couldn't wait. <laughs> well, no, I can't wait to go to bed. There it is. If I looked at a single photograph, I should simply fall down unconscious. Besides, he may be hours digging them out of the attic. I'll look at them tomorrow. But darling, you really are. I'll be just as delighted to show them to you tomorrow. It will give him something to look forward to. Come along now. We're keeping poor Mr. Winterhalter from his sofa, too. Good night, Herr Winterhalter. Schlafen Sie vor. Good night, Gnady Frau. Ah, charming. Now, bed. Good night, Mr. Winterhalter. Good night. Good night, and many thanks. Good night. <laughs> This is a nice windfall, I must say. If they can go tomorrow, we should have to open the other wing. All the carpets are up to, and the curtains are packed for the cleaners. She's very charming, Mrs. Lancaster. Oh, yes, very. She seems to have plenty to say. Ah, I hope this won't be too uncomfortable for you. No, no, no. Quite all right. One can tell she's lived, traveled. I really can't think why you gave up your bed. The girl could quite well have slept here. She's smaller than you and much younger. Oh, well, I was pleased to. You're too good-natured. It annoys me to see people who have everything in the world taking advantage of you. It's a strange coincidence that tonight, just when the snow had reminded me of Vienna, somebody should come here and talk of Vienna in Salzburg. I've been reading that little German grammar you lent me. I don't think it's as difficult a language as people say. In Salzburg, it will be white now, until March. It must be wonderful to travel, to speak several languages. It makes one so much more interesting to talk to. Though perhaps people like that become rather tiring after a time. Tiring? I can't imagine that. There's such, such life, such gaiety. It seems to me that, that one could never tire of such a person. No, perhaps not. In any case, it doesn't matter. Matter? The snow will thaw and then she'll go. Tomorrow or the next day or the day after. She'll go. Gute Nacht. Hmm? Uh, oh, what did you say? Am Brunnen vor dem Tore Da steht ein Lindenbaum Ich träumt in seinem Schatten Gar manchen I don't know whether anything could possibly be said, Evelyn, but last night, when I went up at the usual time for my bath, both bathrooms were occupied. And when one of them became vacant, there was no hot water left. I'm afraid the only thing to do is to try to come to some arrangement with the Lancasters. Mr. Winterhalter didn't get a bath yesterday either. There's the bread, Colonel Selby. Oh, thank you. Oh, what I object to is the lack of consideration. After all, this is our home. The Lancasters have been here two days, and now they seem to own the place. 
This is just an hotel to them, and they feel they have a right to enjoy every amenity without consideration for others. The bath, the chair nearest the fire, everything. Well, of course, in a sense, this is an hotel obliged in law under the regulations of the Innkeepers Act, or whatever it is. Oh, yes, yes, I know all that. That isn't the point at all. There's such a thing as being a little sensitive to other people's feelings. Oh, yeah, snowballing. Young Daly and the girl. Oh, hey, it's a great thing to be young. <laughs> well, I'm afraid we're likely to be with you for a little time yet. The road's terrible. I doubt one could get up the hill even with chains. Oh, really? Bread for the birds, Colonel. Yes, yes. The trouble is to prevent the blackbirds and starlings chasing away the tits and the wrens. It... It's the law of the jungle, you know. The weakest to the wall. Well, I shall feed them just outside the French window. You'll be able to see. Extraordinary piece of luck that we happen to stop so near here. I'm afraid, though, it's a mixed blessing for you. I know what it is to have one's routine upset. Oh, it can't be helped, Mr. Lancaster. If this were an ordinary hotel, of course, it would probably not affect us at all. These grottos and statues in the garden, uh, there's a suggestion of Italy. Yes. An interesting period, architecturally, though not, of course, so essentially English as the earlier ones, Elizabethan or Tudor. I'm insular enough to prefer them myself. No, oh, I quite agree. <laughs> All this far too ornate. Mm. Uh, my husband and I had a small Elizabethan manor house near Andover. Did you? How very delightful. Yes, we were very fond of it. It was just the right size, you know, for a small family. At one time, I looked forward to ending my days there. Life teaches one not to plan too far ahead, doesn't it? Or at least not to take one's planning too seriously. And my son was killed in the war. Then my husband died of pneumonia in 1945. Much of his money was in business in the Far East, and a great deal of it was lost. Many people suffered similar losses during the war. My case isn't in any way exceptional. I quite realize that. At least I have sufficient money to live quietly here. The only thing is, it seems such a short time ago that I had a husband, a child, a house, servants, money, friends, and a varied and interesting life. Now I knit, read a little, go for little walks, sit here day after day, rather ill-tempered. I sometimes wonder at myself how and why it has happened. Oh, one shouldn't talk about these things and complain, I beg your pardon. Oh, please. Oh, to listen to other people's misfortunes, well, it's so embarrassing. Ha have you been to the lake? The rhododendrons and azaleas, there are beautiful in the spring. Johnny! Johnny! It's only supposed to take the gentlest exercise, and there he is snowballing, and in this cold, too. Oh, look at them, Mrs. Bailey, throwing snowballs and tumbling about just like a couple of school children. Oh, but he shouldn't be doing it, Mrs. Lancaster. Really, he shouldn't. Oh, but it couldn't hurt him. It couldn't possibly. The sun and the air like champagne. Oh, let them enjoy themselves. Let them laugh. Oh, very well. But one has to listen to the doctor, though. Oh, doctors. One should never take doctors seriously. What about the car, Robert? Well, beyond the bent wing, I don't think there's any damage. Well, is it here? Have you got it? Got it? My dear, there's not the slightest hope of moving it without a tow, and the road's impassable for miles. Oh, but surely something can be... Oh, but what does it matter? I'm beginning to like it here. We shall stay and make thorough nuisances of ourselves, and I shall brush up my German with Mr. Winterhalter. Es wäre mir ein Vergnügen, gnädige Frau. Oh, do you know, I felt terribly guilty last night, Mrs. White. I believe Tonetta and I ran off all the hot water in the house and you never got a bath. Now, did you? Oh, it really doesn't matter. There, I knew it. Oh, how dreadful of us. Such typical thoughtlessness. But I shall do penance. I won't have a bath for days. I am so sorry. The boiler's not very big, you well, know. Of course it isn't. How could it be? At home, we have an enormous thing. You could drive the Queen Mary with it. But, of course, it's wildly extravagant. One must have hot water. Yes, it's one of the comforts of life. <laughs> Excuse me. I hope I said the right thing. She looks terribly reserved and sad. Now, I should like a drink. Is there any alcohol in the house? Oh, good heavens. We've got all that champagne in the car. Of course, that will have been stolen by now. Why on earth didn't you fetch it up yesterday, Robert? I did. Did you? I told you, dear, but you didn't listen. <laughs> How exactly like me. 
He does all the right things, and I don't appreciate it a bit. I don't even listen. Oh, bless you. Why don't you shout at me sometimes? You'd like that, I'm sure. Oh, for goodness sake, go and change your shoes, my dear man. You're wet to the knees. And I'm not prepared to nurse you if you get pneumonia. Yes, all right. Men are so silly. Oh, Robert, do find some sherry. It would be so comforting. Right. Oh, what a day. How I adore the unexpected. And being here is unexpected. And, of course, you're totally unexpected, my dear Mr. Winterhalter. What's your other name? Um, Julius. I shall call you Julius, and you shall call me Helen. Since you've come, the house seems to have wakened from its sleep. And one feels that there's, there's not only sadness in life, but happiness, too. You radiate such, such life, such vitality. Vitality? Oh, yes. I have plenty of that. Oh, far too much, in fact. If I don't go charging through the day like a train through a tunnel, I feel depressed. I feel, oh, bored. Oh, surely not. <laughs> uh, what do you know about me? Nothing. I'm a shocking creature, I warn you. And if there's any justice in the world, then I'm sure I shall go to hell for my sins. Oh, but I don't want to talk about myself. I want to hear about you. Tell me, tell me what you are. No. Let me guess. You're a writer. No. Artist? Musician? I used to think I was a musician. I played the piano. You did, and you're brilliant, of course. Then you shall play for us tonight. If there's one thing I really love, it's the piano properly played. I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I don't play any longer. You don't? Well, why not? This. But your hand? Oh, no. Not a bullet. A baronet. Dreadful. Abominable. Oh. Poor hand. You kissed it. <laughs> oh, my poor Julius. <laughs> Your face. Helen, I... What's the matter? Oh, uh, Evelyn, you're the very person I wanted to see. I'm one of those tiresome people who can't sleep properly without a whole lot of pillows. I don't know why it is, but if my head's too low, I wake up with a stiff neck. I don't quite know if we have any more pillows. I'll ask Mother. Thank you so much. <laughs> I wonder why she looks so cross with me. It isn't a crime to ask for more pillows. Oh, I'm sure our being here is a nuisance, but good gracious me, it's only for a few days. A few days, of course. Ah, now you look sad. But of course, we shall see each other again. You come up to London, don't you? Not now. Oh, but you must. Besides, I'd like to introduce you to all kinds of people who could help you and so on. Help me? Well, I shall help you. Oh, oh I... yes, I shall. Now, who do I know at the Austrian embassy? Oh, dear, just to think of Vienna makes me feel sentimental. Does it make you sad to talk about it? No, I can talk to you. No one else can understand. No one else knows what it means. They know nothing and just sit here all day knitting and playing cards and calling me Winterhalter. Winterhalter. Oh, I, I, I don't mean to complain. Everybody's very kind and after all I'm... I'm just a foreigner in England, a displaced person. But when one meets somebody who knows something of one's country and one's language, why, then one feels, one feels grateful and, and excited and, and, yes, a little mad. Mad? How mad? Why, for people like us, you know, sympathy, understanding, such things act like drugs. We become intoxicated. We see, we see visions. We dream. We imagine all kinds of queer and ridiculous things. You must be careful, please. Careful? Oh, my dear man, you don't know what you're asking. I've never been careful in my life. Tell me your dreams. Do you think I would laugh at them? Oh, if you were free. With you, I could begin life again. I would, I would have courage, energy, confidence. I would work. I would, I would slave for you, throw my whole life and being at your feet for a, for a smile, for a for a touch of your hand. Uh, what am I saying? I'm simply dreaming. Such wild, impossible fancies came suddenly into my head. The colonel's still waiting for his birds. Uh, excuse me, please. Robert, it suddenly occurs to me that tomorrow is New Year's Eve. Well, we must have a party. 
We've got six bottles of champagne upstairs, and it's not the slightest use taking them back to London. Yeah, one feels sorry for some of these people. For an Austrian refugee, for instance. He can barely take his eyes off you because you've been to Vienna and speak a little German. I warn you, Helen, you'll have another heartbroken admirer on your hands in a minute. Oh, now, is it my fault, Robert? Do be fair. What have I done but show him the most ordinary friendliness? <laughs> my dear, don't ask me what you've done. What do you do? Well, when I meet nice, sympathetic, cultured people, I simply have to give sympathy for sympathy. No, it's no good, Robert. I really cannot stay on formal, polite terms with people I like. And I will not go through life measuring out friendship and affection grudgingly, spoonful by spoonful, as if it were some sort of rationed luxury that one hid in the back of a cupboard. It's not my nature, and I can't do it. Heaven forbid that you should try. Oh, you think I behave disgracefully. You disapprove. Oh, I know you do. My dear Helen. You think I'm immoral? Well, you can't deny it. Immoral? Well, in a sense, perhaps. There. You know... I sometimes think that all really attractive, generous, and lovable women have something of the harlot about them. Robert! I don't mean it offensively. <laughs> oh, isn't that delightful? Isn't that typical? So polite. So English. I don't mean it offensively. Ah, and you're so right, darling. You're perfectly right. I'm a wanton, shameless creature. And you're so patient, so well-behaved. And I treat you quite shamefully. Oh, oh yes, gosh, yes, I do, quite disgracefully. Aren't you tired of me? Aren't you sorry you didn't marry some really nice, virtuous, dependable young English spinster? Aren't you? Aren't you, darling? Helen. <laughs> Nobody's looking. <laughs> Don't be so respectable. Jeanette was nearly over that time. Don't go yeah. under the trees. <laughs> oh! 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 There, what did I say? Yes, she oh, hurt oh not a bit. Well, I'm beginning to feel like a nice hot cup of tea, Colonel. Yes, yes, I, I think I'll come with you. It won't go off, will it? Your gun. Go off? I'm terrified of firearms. Oh, no, 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 no. See, it's empty. Yes, but... Uh, I believe even empty ones, sometimes dreadful accidents happen. Oh, here comes Mrs. White. On Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, she walks down the river to the bridge and back. And on Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays, she goes the other way to the village. Lovely afternoon, isn't it, Mrs. White? Yes. Uh, won't you... Oh, uh, no, don't uh, move, please. Have you had any sport, Colonel Selby? I thought I heard two shots. Yes, I, I, I fired twice at a snipe and missed it clean. I heard a cock pheasant somewhere. Now, if you could shoot that. It's a pleasant noise in the stillness of a winter evening. The woods seem silent and deserted. And then you hear suddenly this noise of life. Oh, the girl skates quite nicely. Yes. And, of course, Mr. Winter Halter's there with her mother. Oh, if he knew what a fool he was making of himself. I've never seen anyone come over quite so sloppy. He gazes at her like a spaniel. She's very attractive, very self-confident. I imagine she's always been a success. Rolling in money. And tonight we're all drinking their champagne. Six bottles. Mm, no doubt it's amusing to astonish the bourgeois. Oh, it's chilly. I, I shall go in. <laughs> She can't bear them. She can't bear them. She's jealous, of course. I believe she was pretty well off some time ago, and she's never got over it. <laughs> some people are lucky in life, others aren't. But it's no good complaining. You've got to be philosophical. My wife was very good at skating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to glide about on ice with the sun shining and the snow glistening all round and a band playing... Oh, it's an exhilarating sensation. Well, one can imagine what it was like once upon a time when all these walks were beautifully kept and there were gardeners to trim the hedges and sweep up the dead leaves. It must have been beautiful. Oh, but at my age, I rather like this atmosphere of decaying splendour. It's melancholy, of course, but restful. <laughs> I'm a romantic, Mr. Winterhalter. Ah, uh -huh, evidently. Oh, how I like to see a man with a gun. 
When I was a girl, I used to load for my father sometimes. Did you? Oh, the excitement of it with the beaters shouting, over, over. Oh. <laughs> you ought to shoot, Robert. Bad luck on the birds, I say. Well, of course, the whole business is highly immoral, really, quite shocking. But the sheer ridiculous extravagance of it only added to the pleasure. <gasps> There's hardly anything ridiculous and extravagant left for us now. Oh, except Ascot and the House of Lords. The world is getting duller and duller. There. I've lost one of my nice new gloves. Oh, well, perhaps you dropped it by the lake. Shall I uh, stroll back? I, uh... I'll go uh, with pleasure. No, I'll go. Oh, no, please, don't anybody bother. I'm so careless. No trouble, no trouble at all. They've both gone. I've disturbed everybody. Colonel Selby. Colonel Selby. Oh, it's no use shouting. He's a bit deaf. I'm going in for tea. I'll tell him. Well, tell him I'm not at all sure that I have both of them with me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Robert, what's the time? Quarter past four. Do you notice how interminable the days are here? How these people don't die of boredom living here month after month. They haven't had much chance of dying of boredom since our arrival, anyway. <laughs> Have we caused a commotion? Well, really, they ought to be grateful. Oh, look at poor little Winterhalter, searching for my glove as if his life depended on it. Poor little man. I meant to speak to you about him. I, I know what you're going to say, that it isn't fair, that I'm leading him up the garden path. I know, I know. But is it all selfishness? Oh, now put yourself in his position. Wouldn't you sooner be hopelessly in love with some unattainable woman than not be in love at all? Living here like a cabbage, wouldn't you? And suppose he does suffer. Suppose he does We Well, I've wept for love a dozen times. We all have. That's life. That's tea. I should like to leave here tomorrow. For one thing, I'm bored. And secondly, there's... There's an atmosphere about this place that makes me sad. Take me in, dear. Tomorrow there must be a change. We must have a thaw. We really must. I'll arrange it. I came to fetch Johnny. Oh, he's down at the lake still. Thank you. It's getting so late. Johnny? Seriously, surely something can be done about the car. Well, with trains, for instance. Yes, we might at least get as far as Yelverton. I found it. Found what? Her glove. She lost the glove, and I, I found it over there by the pond. How clever of you. She's just gone in. You'd better run along quickly after her. Yes. You look so angrily at me. Angry? I'm not angry, but I'm sorry to see you making such a fool of yourself. Is it, is it very noticeable? Noticeable? Can't you see they're all talking about it and laughing at you? Yes, laughing at you. I never knew a man could behave so foolishly, at least not a man of your age. It would be funny if it weren't so sad. Don't you realise that in a day or two she'll go away, that she'll have forgotten your name before she even gets halfway to London? She's only amusing herself with you because she's bored. It's not true. To imagine she loves you, is even interested in you. It's so absurdly naive, so childish. Do you think she hasn't a dozen more attractive admirers in London? And lovers, too, probably. That's shameful. Outrageous. Just because she's elegant, just because she speaks half a dozen words of German and has been to Vienna, you're hypnotized by her. Don't you see it can all come to nothing? Nothing at all. You're so kind, so sensitive. I can't bear to see you lose your head for a woman like that. What can it end in but unhappiness? And meanwhile, everybody laughs at you and despises you for being such a fool. I think I shall always hate snow now, as long as I live. Evelyn, I must ask you, please, to mind your own business. You have no right to speak to me like this. No right? A year ago, you were glad enough for me to speak to you when everyone else ignored you or made fun of you. Now this woman comes along with her wealth and her continental glitter, and you discover I'm just a dull, uninteresting creature who must be treated as a servant and mind her own business. I... I won't run after him as if I were a I can't help it. I tell you, I, I can't help it. What can't you help, Mr. Winterhalter? Do Nothing. tell us. Nothing. Goodness, what's that? Is the house on fire? It's only Mother ringing for tea. She's madly punctual with meals. <laughs> yes, yes, we're seven minutes late. Uh, it's no use. I can't hurry. When did you learn to skate? Oh, ages ago. I was taught at St. Moritz. I suppose to go to Switzerland, it's pretty expensive. Well, 
there are pensions and little places where they charge practically nothing at all. Why not come? What? I'm going at the end of January. <laughs> I'd teach you to skate in no time and we'd waltz together. Honestly, it's tremendous fun. Do come, why don't you? I should like to. More than anything in the world. <laughs> oh, but I don't suppose for a minute I shall be able to. Why ever not? Well, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to have a weak chest. Last winter I was in bed for four months and oh. I'm not supposed to get tired and so on. Of course, I, I'm much, much better now. I only cough occasionally. Johnny! Johnny! Yes, coming. You know, I feel perfectly certain that if I could get right away from here for perhaps a year or so, I should soon be completely cured. I'm so tired of this place, Tanetta. <laughs> of course, it's imagination, but some days I have the impression that the trees, the ivy, the undergrowth and the weeds are all going to grow higher and higher until they cover the house and choke me. What I would like to do more than anything in the world, what I dream of is to go on some kind of polar expedition and, and live for a year, two years in the Arctic, where there is nothing but clean, biting air to breathe and space and silence and whiteness. If that's what you want, then I expect you will. I believe one only has to desire something desperately for it to happen eventually. Do you really believe that? Absolutely. <laughs> Perhaps it seems to you quite a simple matter to go to Switzerland. But for us, it's about as accessible as the end of a rainbow. Suppose I lend you the money. Say, 50 pounds? 50 pounds? For that matter, I could give it to you without noticing it, if you'd accept it. Give it me? Well, why not? I'm rich, you're poor. It seems quite natural. It's not natural at all. It, it's simply quite unbelievably kind. And out of the question, of course. But if you had my money and, and nothing to do but amuse yourself... Well, you'd think it perfectly natural to help your friends, wouldn't you? If only as a sop to your conscience. But I, I oh, couldn't... Oh, people are so extraordinary about money. They're always taking attitudes and, and feeling insulted. Oh, if you need the money, why not take it? Why not? Johnny, dear, the time. Didn't you hear me call? Yes, Mother. It's my fault, Mrs. Daly. I was keeping him. I've been trying to persuade him to come to Switzerland with some friends of mine next month. Switzerland? Oh, well, really, I... I think that's a matter for the doctor to decide. I should very much like to lend him the money, if it would help. It's so easy for It's me. very kind of you, but of course, we couldn't consider that at all. Tea's been on the table for ten minutes, Miss Landy. I'm sorry. I didn't really mean to interfere. It was just an idea. It's really such impertinence of people. Just because they have money to think it gives them the right to arrange other people's affairs. She meant it kindly. Ever since they've been here, they've done nothing but upset and annoy people treating us as if we were just servants. But, Mother... It's so hurting. When one has tried one's best to do the right thing, when one has worked and saved to have an ignorant girl come along with her grand ideas offering money as if she were a duchess, haven't I always done my best for you, Johnny? Haven't I? Oh, yes, Mother, yes, yes, yes. For goodness sake, don't let's talk about it. It was only an idea. I don't want to deprive you of anything that would do you good, dear. If the doctor thinks you should go to Switzerland, then go you shall whatever sacrifices we have to make. But you know what he said, dear. You must rest. You must go to bed early and avoid all excitement. Try to be content to live quietly, Johnny. Live quietly? Yes, but what for, Mother? In God's name, what for? Oh, my dear. To creep through the world in cotton wool, never putting one's nose outside to smell what life is like. To have one's whole existence regulated by a dumpy little doctor with a threepenny thermometer. If that's the only life I can ever look forward to, then I'd just as soon not live at all. Oh, Johnny! Charlie. Oh. Oh, Charlie. There, Mother, I I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean it. It was just an explosion, you know. Uh, of course I'll be patient. Yeah. Mother, don't cry, darling. I was only joking. You're perfectly right, of course, and I must live quietly. Uh, don't worry. I'll be patient. You'll see. I'll be patient. Just a second, dear. Oh, heavens, if I drink any more, I shan't be able to tell one card from another. I suppose she's never drunk champagne before. I beg your pardon? I can't shout it. Oh, half past 
11. Personally, I'm ready for bed. No one is going to bed until midnight on New Year's Eve. Oh, Robert, dear, poor Mrs. White has had nothing to drink all evening. Come along, Mrs. White. Johnny, dear, it's so late. Mrs. Daly, a glass of champagne? No, thank you very much. I'm afraid wines and spirits don't agree with me. Just a little longer, Mrs. Daly. It's a special occasion. Oh, very well, then. A little longer. I've never felt better. I shall take to drinking champagne regularly. <laughs> Splendid. I've had too much already, you know. Well, for once, I don't think it'll hurt you. Very well, then. Thank you. Partner. Partner. Oh, hark at Mrs. Ashworth. But she's very good-hearted. Goodbye. Goodbye. I shall go to sleep if we don't finish this rubber soon. <laughs> oh, rise and shine, Miss Landy. Rise and shine, dear. It's your deal. <laughs> rise and shine, these extraordinary barrack room expressions. <laughs> now, Julius, what were we talking about? The future. Please tell me the future. Now, let me look in your hand. Let me reflect. There's nothing like champagne for inspiring clairvoyance. <laughs> I see a, a change in your fortunes followed by a series of journeys. Yes. You mustn't allow circumstances to dishearten you. Well, we're none of us presented with happiness on a plate, you know. We must continually pursue it in spite of all obstacles. Well, just as a huntsman will plunge into a dark forest in pursuit of his quarry. <laughs> I think that's extremely funny. It's not as funny as you think, my dear girl. There's a sound philosophical truth behind it. Mother always starts getting philosophical about this time of night. Too hot. Too hot to talk. That voice. Don't oh. pay any attention to them, Julius. I see clear signs of a new happiness in your hand. Worry and loneliness are behind you, and you are about to enter, as it were, the gateway of adventure. Hooray! Oh, be quiet, Tonetta. He's swallowing every word, aren't you, Mr. Winterhalter? He's quite spellbound. Please, Eve. Tell me something now, Mrs. Lancaster, something really wonderful. Tell me I'm going to marry a beautiful young man with 2,000 a year and live happily ever after. It's an interesting hand. I should say your character is full of strange contradictions. Your personality is complicated. Imagine that. And I should say you had some kind of a disappointment a few years ago. There's something like a scar on your heart line. <laughs> I don't believe you can see that at all. You've been talking to Mother or Johnny. Oh, my dear girl, if you don't believe me, why ask me to read your hand? Oh, no, do go on. I believe anything you say, really, I will. But don't tell me about the past, all that's so terribly dreary. Tell me about the future. Your line of life is strong. I don't see any sign of serious illness. How old are you? I'm... Twenty-eight. Oh, she's telling the truth in vino veritas. I see quite a happy marriage, but not for a few years. You must be patient. Your heart line suggests that there's quite a lot of happiness in store for you. Happiness? Johnny, do you hear? There's happiness in store for me. Hallelujah. Shall I be rich? Oh, do tell me, shall I be rich? You will not. Money brings its own troubles, doesn't it? No, I can't see any more. Thank you so much. Happiness is in store for me. After all, I suppose it is possible. <laughs> Fill my glass, Julius, there's a dear. Yes. Tell me when you're coming to stay with us in London. Well, I thought... What I about the week after next? Uh, Tony, what night are we going to Covent Garden for the Mozart? The 11th. Ah, then you must come on the 10th and you shall come with us. It isn't Salzburg or Vienna, but still, it's adorable music. You shall stay a week or 10 days and I'll introduce you to a delightful friend of mine who'll make you feel, well, a little less of a stranger. He was our secretary to the embassy in the days of that poor, unhappy little doll. So kind of you. Kind? <laughs> it will be lovely. We'll poke around the art galleries together and be quite bohemian. It's not kind, you know. I beg your pardon? Playing with people's hopes and dreams. You shouldn't do it, Mrs. Lancaster. Oh. <laughs> dear girl, what nonsense. You're strong. It doesn't matter to you. But most of us spend all our time trying not to hope for what is quite unattainable. Trying to be content with what we have. It's not kind to make us dream of the waters of the moon, of, of all kinds of happiness that are out of reach. Why do you 
come here to disturb us all. Evelyn. Oh, poor dear, she's overexcited. Oh, oh, you think you're going to Switzerland, don't you, John? And Mr. Winterhalter thinks, well, really, I don't know what nonsense he thinks. Something ridiculous. Please. And I have to be married and live happily ever after one day. Such splendid futures are waiting for us all. Next year, sometime, never. Now, I think perhaps she should go to bed. Why don't you leave us alone, Mrs. Lancaster? We aren't your sort of people at all, you know. We are just dull little people leading dull little lives in a backwater. Evelyn, for heaven's sake. Oh, nonsense, my dear girl. Nobody's dull. We're all of us extremely interesting. I tell you, we're dull. And I ought to know. I'm an expert on dullness. Dull? Huh. This is Ditchwater Hall. Evelyn. Don't stare at me, John. I'm all right. Why don't you go on with your game? Wouldn't you like to go to bed? What a beautiful dress that is. Is it real silk? Oh, yes, it is. Mine's real imitation wool. It's very nice. Oh, do you think so? I'll change with you if you like. I've only had it for about seven years. Evelyn. Now, now, come along, dear. We'll go upstairs together and you'll have a nice lie down. What's the matter, Mrs. Ashworth? You take an aspirin and pop into bed and you'll be as right as rain in the morning. I don't want to pop anywhere. And I don't want to see the new year oh, in. Dear. I expect well. it will look exactly like the old one. I don't see the sense of us sitting here drinking and being sentimental just because another stupid year is starting. Now, if you could put back an old one occasionally, that might be worth celebrating. There are one or two old years I can remember that I wouldn't mind having over again. Well, there's one anyway. But the new year, you can have it. All of you. I don't want it. It's no good to me. Oh, well, there's a cheerful way to talk. Now, you say good night, dear, and come along with me. There's a good girl. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, Mrs. Lancaster. And thank you so much for inviting Johnny and me to your party. Good night. I hope you feel better in the morning. Schlafen Sie wohl, Herr Winterhalter. You see, I speak German, too. Sprachen, sprach. Gesprochen. That's right, dear. You come along. I'm not in the least sleepy. Gute Nacht, mein Damen und Herren. Schlafen Sie wohl. I, I'm so sorry. She doesn't use... Well, I hope you don't think no, that... My Evelyn... dear boy, I think nothing at all. It's of no kind of significance whatsoever. I haven't heard her speak as much as that in the three years I've been oh, here. Then we've achieved something. That's all to the good. She wouldn't let me take her upstairs. Said I was to go back and enjoy myself. Poor thing, she's just had one too many, I'm afraid. <laughs> as a matter of fact, I feel a bit silly myself. Don't you, Mrs. White? I do not, as it happens. Oh, well, there's no need to bite my head off. There is no need to get on your high horse. I dare say you do think I'm rather a vulgar sort of creature, but there it is. You must make the best of it. We all have to live in that station of life to which it has pleased God to call us. Fiddlesticks. It is not fiddlesticks. Oh, pass the wine, Robert. I quite agree, Mrs. Ashworth. The rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate, each has his place in the scheme of things. Oh, that's all very well for the rich man. Well, it's all very well for everybody. Suppose you had been the daughter of a poor Neapolitan laundress. I should have accepted the conditions of my birth. I should have made just as good a washerwoman as anyone else, just as good. And probably I would have contrived to have got myself kept by a wealthy spaghetti manufacturer. Oh, darling. I should have been perfectly happy and contented, and I certainly shouldn't have sat about feeling sorry for myself. I don't know whether that remark is intended to suggest that some people here sit about feeling sorry for themselves. I'm suggesting nothing. I merely state that I would never have been aimless or hopeless under any circumstances. One who has never turned his back but marched breast forward, never doubted clouds would rise or break or whatever it is. I've always admired Browning. God in his heaven, all's right with the world, boot saddled to horse and away. Uh, I beg your pardon, what was it? That was Browning. Oh, Browning, yes. I rather like Browning. Of course you do. Yes, of course he does. He's 22 years old and all his life before him. I'm 65, and I naturally prefer something a little more adult, shall we say. 
Something that gets rather nearer to the heart of things. But you assume sadness is at the heart of things, whereas I see gaiety. Now, that's the difference between us. It's not the only one. Our circumstances are hardly similar, are they? You're still young enough to live for the future, I'm not. One day, you too may be left only the pleasures of recollection. I should advise you to bear that in mind. Really, this sermonising and on New Year's Eve. Now, Helen, I think this would be an excellent moment to start talking about something quite different. Oh, I'm sure. I don't care what I talk about. Uh, 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 what's the time? Five minutes to midnight. In five minutes, we shall stand on the threshold of a new year, my friends. Well, it's been a very jolly evening. Huh? <laughs> jolly evening. <laughs> he hasn't been conscious for more than ten minutes. Uh, still a bottle of champagne. <laughs> then pass it in mercy's name. I'm parched. I don't know why, but the end of the year always excites me somehow. Time like an ever-rolling stream. Oh, let's make a noise. Let's have a little life and gaiety. Turn on the wireless. We can't let the poor old yes sink out unwept, unhonored, and unsung. Roll back the carpet. <laughs> Don't mind trying. Come on, Mr. Winterholter. Oh, dreadful noise. Quite dreadful. Oh, oh really, Mrs. Oh, White. So typical. Well, don't you think that's a little high-handed? Why shouldn't the young people dance and amuse themselves for once? I've no objection to them dancing. But I object very much to that vulgar, ugly noise. Well, how can we dance without music? Well, I try to be a little understanding. Didn't you like to dance when you were young? If you still wish to dance, I will play for you. Now, dance, if you want to. Would you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm beginning to like this woman. Dance, everybody. You should be good at this, Julius. Come on. Shall we, Tanetta? Of course. I'm afraid we're keeping you from your bed, Colonel. It isn't so much my head as my digestion. It's always the same after sprouts. Oh, stop! Stop, everybody! Listen! Yes, the bells. Oh, the bells are ringing out the old year. Glasses, everybody. We must drink a toast to it. Oh, what a moment this is. It always makes me feel emotional. One is conscious suddenly of time passing, of standing poised between the past and the future. Now, silence, everybody. He always makes a speech on New Year's Eve. Midnight. Hail and farewell. <laughs> oh, you mustn't mind me being sentimental and silly. I, I can't help it on New Year's Eve. May the new year bring you all nearer to your heart's desires. May you find health and vigor, John, my dear boy, and a new interest in life. Thank you. And may our Austrian friend discover a companionship in England that will cheer him in his exile. Thank you. Oh, it's been such a pleasant, cheerful evening. I, <laughs> I feel quite warm with friendship. Thank you all for your kindly welcome to us. And now let us raise our glasses and drink to the future. Ladies and gentlemen, the new year. The new, the new year. year. Don't be forgotten. Never forgotten. Now join hands, everybody. Half of the inmates, inmates, if that's the word I mean, how grateful we are to Mr. and Mrs. Lancaster for arranging this very jolly party for us tonight and providing us with so much delicious wine. Yeah, here are most generous. <laughs> I'm sure we, we've all enjoyed it very much and it, it certainly made a nice change. <laughs> Very kind. 
We do thank you. We do indeed. It's raining. Raining. It's raining. I've just been out and there's a soft, wet wind and everything's thawing and dripping and the snow is sliding off the roof and off the trees. Look, I'm quite wet. Oh, a thaw. Thank goodness. Then it looks as if we shall be able to go tomorrow. Yes, you'll be able to go tomorrow. (laughs) Delightful. Speed the parting guests. I didn't mean... Why don't you go to bed, spoiling everything? She didn't mean, I'm sure. Johnny, dear, bedtime. Yes, all right, Mother, all right. Thank you so much, Mrs. Lancaster. Uh, And thank you, sir. I did enjoy it. I I really did. Good night. Good Good night. night. I'll see you before you go, Tanetta. Of course. Good night. Good night. Oh, I'm suddenly so sleepy I can hardly keep my eyes open. Bed, Robert, dear. Tomorrow morning we must pack. So tomorrow you'll be gone. Ah, but we shall see you again. I hope we'll see all of you whenever you come to London. Look in whenever you like. We're just off Grosvenor Square. Where's my bag? Here. Oh, thank you, dear. Good night, Colonel Selby. Uh, good night. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't settle down again, whatever you do, or you'll fall off to sleep. Oh, no, I'm going to bed at once. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, Mrs. White. <laughs> Isn't she funny? Oh, she's such a character. She intrigues me enormously. I'm only sorry I didn't get to know her better. Good night, Mr. Winterhalter. Good night. After you, Colonel. Oh, thanks. Good night, Winterhalter. Good night. Extra Cuvée, 1945. I must remember that. One day when I'm engaged to marry my handsome young man, I shall make him take me to a restaurant. and I shall say to him, I want a bottle of Extra Cuvée, 1945. Oh, poor young man. Whatever would he say? Perhaps I shall keep this bottle and sleep with it under my pillow. Good night. Good night. Poor, silly Mr. Winterhalter. Did you think I was rude, Mrs. White? I didn't mean to be. Or did I, perhaps? I don't know. Nothing seems to matter tonight. Nothing. But I'm glad they're going tomorrow. They don't belong in a place like this, among people like us. It's as if some beautiful swans had suddenly landed on a duck pond and all the ugly ducks felt envious of their fine feathers. The girl is beautiful, isn't she? Perhaps I could be pretty if I didn't always feel so tired, so bad-tempered. If I didn't have to work so hard every day. Every day. My face is beginning to get quite lined and I'm not yet 30. Don't you think life is unfair to some people? It's stupid to talk like that. Life isn't fair or unfair or tragic or comic or anything else. Life is life, that's all. One must accept it. I like Chopin. Do you know the sad little prelude all on one note? Yes. Yes, that's the one. Go on playing. He used to play that. How I wish I could sit here like this forever. (sighs) If only the morning would never come. White. Good morning. So typical of Devonshire, isn't it? One day it's bitterly cold, the next the wind has changed, the sun shines, the snow's disappeared, and all at once there's a feeling of April. Colonel Selby says it's the Gulf Stream. Yes, one does get a comparatively short winter here, though goodness knows it feels quite long enough. During the war, I once had to spend a whole winter in Lancashire. <laughs> there's no Gulf Stream there. Mm-hmm. My husband tells me you used to have a nice old house near Andover. Yes, 
between Andover and Wayhill. Well, next time you're in London, perhaps you'll come and see us. Oh, it's very kind of you. I'm afraid I hardly ever go to London nowadays. I'm a complete country bumpkin oh, now. I don't think I should care to live permanently in the country. In fact, I'm sure I shouldn't. Well, the autumn, for instance, it's so dreadfully depressing. Well, Tony, dear? It won't be long now. The breakdown people are just hauling it out of the ditch. You haven't seen Johnny Daly, have you? He's in bed. He's got a temperature, poor boy. Then he is ill. Oh, it's really dreadful, isn't it, at that age? Yes, it's sad, very sad, poor boy. Oh, if Robert doesn't hurry, we shan't go to the Maitlands for lunch. And Mrs. White, I wonder if I might ask you to give John Daly a message for me if I don't see him before we go. Oh, now, darling, you can't worry Mrs. White like that. It's too silly. Oh, it's no trouble. What would you like me to tell him? Oh, just that I'm sorry I didn't see him again and that I, I hope he gets better and that, that I'll write to him. I should hate him to think I'd just gone off and forgotten. I dare say he'll be down again in a few days. I'll tell him. Thank you. These people make me feel guilty. We seem to have so much, and they so little. Their lives seem to be so, so drab. Do you know who lights the fire in the morning and sweeps out the room before breakfast? Evelyn Daly, and she's done it every day for years. And I suppose she'll go on doing it. I've never lit a fire in my life. Oh, my dear girl, there are hundreds and thousands of people doing precisely the same thing all over the country. I'm sure it's most disagreeable. And I'm extremely grateful I haven't got to do it myself. Is that all? All? <laughs> what else can one say? There are millions of people in the world with lives ten times as drab as Evelyn Daly's. <laughs> and hundreds and thousands suffering from starvation and illness and oh, every sort of misery. But what can one do? Where can one start? What? As well, try to mop up the sea with a pocket handkerchief. I feel I should like to do something. Yes, will you do anything you please, dear, and you'll probably get no thanks for it. Don't you ever feel that you almost hate your money and your leisure? Well, doesn't it ever seem to you that you've no right to it, and that you're simply skating over the surface of life without seeing or understanding what's happening beneath you? Oh, darling, you're so sweet. <laughs> you're so serious. But I understand quite a lot, you know. And I'm sensible enough to realise that I can't turn the world upside down, whatever I do. Oh, don't be so superficial. Don't speak to me like that, dear. I don't like it. You're a little too young to know quite what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, you're a silly child. I'm just going to finish my packing. Did you hear that, Julius? Such a difficult age when they're just growing out of childhood. So serious. As one gets older, the mind gradually builds for itself a kind of protective armour. But when one is 18 and begins to see for the first time all the inescapable sadness of life, one is so tender at that age and so easily wounded. Oh, now she's unhappy because John Daly has a weak chest, because Evelyn Daly has to scrub and clean and light fires. She'd like to take the whole hotel under her wing. <laughs> Well, one sorry, of course. But one must be reasonable. Yes, one must be reasonable. When I was quite a successful sort of person some years ago, I was often asked for help by rather unfortunate people. And when one was busy, one found such people rather a nuisance and really wished they would go away with their shabby clothes and their sad faces. Misfortune separates one from the happy and successful. It tastes as if one had some sort of some sort of infectious disease. <laughs> so I think perhaps it would be best for me and for you if I were to decline your kind invitation. Oh, what nonsense, Julius. Of course you're coming. It's quite settled. The only difficulty is the dates. Robert reminded me there were some people coming on the 11th and then we're going away, so it will have to be, well, say, early in March. What I'll do is write to you nearer the time, and I shan't take no for an answer. Oh, you smile as though you didn't believe me. Do you think I'm insincere? You are very kind, but I don't think I should like to come to your house. I have another suit, but it's older and shabbier than this one, and I have no evening dress. I should feel out of place. Do you understand? Oh, nonsense. I'm sure you wouldn't. And what do clothes matter? Not very much, perhaps, except that they remind me that I am what I am, 
A homeless refugee receiving charity? Ah, oh, now that's being touchy and difficult and silly. Yes? Well, you know, I am rather touchy and silly nowadays. And that's so boring for other people, so tiresome. Don't you see? There are some friendships that should be short and sweet, that should be exciting for a few hours or a few days, and then melt away like the snow. Look at me, Helen. Will you really be very disappointed if you don't see me again? Come, you are a frank woman, an honest woman. You are not afraid to tell me the truth. Dear Julius, I shall always have a special place in my heart for you. Whenever it snows, I shall think of my little Viennese friend in Devonshire. Thank you. Thank you. You're so wise. So very wise. That's the whole art of friendship, to know and to kiss and part. Ah, oh, here's our sportsman. And what's in your bag today, Colonel? Oh, I didn't shoot anything today, I'm afraid. There was some nice snipe about, but they were all too quick for me. Still, it's a nice walk. The great thing is to enjoy nature. After all, one doesn't want to kill the birds, really. Oh, I, I put one foot in a sort of bog. <laughs> no, I should think you did. Just look at it. Mother wants to know if you're staying for lunch or would you like sandwiches? Ah, oh, how very kind of her. But we're supposed to be lunching with friends at Yelverton. Oh, goodness knows when we shall get there at this rate. Oh, for goodness sake, go and change your stockings, Colonel Selby. Do you want to catch your death of cold? Uh, oh, uh, yes. Yes, very well. I, I think I will. I don't really know why I should interfere with him, but I can't bear silliness. I'm afraid he'd get on my nerves very quickly. Is your mother anywhere about, Miss Daly? Yes, I think she's in the kitchen. Well, I'll just go and finish packing. Then I should like to have a word with her. Why are you looking so sad, Julius? You'll be seeing her again in a few weeks. You're going to stay with them in London, aren't you? Oh, I'm sure you'll have a very gay time with dinner parties and concerts and all the rest of it, and you'll meet a lot of interesting people. I don't suppose you'll even come back here. We shan't be smart enough for you. Well, to tell you the truth, I shan't care very much if you don't. I, I think I was happier here before you came. Much happier. <laughs> What could be stupider than caring for somebody who falls head over heels in love with the first middle-aged woman who comes along? Please, stop. Well, isn't it true? You do love her, don't you? Will you please stop talking about it, please? Perhaps you won't believe me, but I'm sorry for you. Yes, I'm sorry. I don't want your sympathy. I want nobody's sympathy. Do you understand? Don't talk to me, not now. Just leave me alone, will you, please? All right. If that's what you want. There's a fallen tree across the front drive. Your car is uh, rescued? Yes, it's quite all right. I've just brought it round to the stable. Oh, well, you'll be able to move on. I believe you're coming up to stay with us a little later on, aren't you? My wife mentioned something. Mm, yes, yes. Uh, it was most kind of Mrs. Lancaster. But I told her this morning that I'm very much afraid I shan't be able to manage it. I'm, I'm working on, a, on an opera. It's difficult to make plans. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm very interested in music, as an amateur, I mean, and perhaps if you required any um, financial assistance... For what? Well, this opera you mentioned. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> no, I don't think so. But it's most kind of you to offer, very kind. Oh, yeah. I just remembered that I'd left my gun here. I was afraid Mrs. Ashworth might have seen it. Oh, <laughs> women are funny about firearms, very funny. I think I shall go for a stroll before lunch. In case I don't see you again, I shall say goodbye, Mr. Lancaster. Oh, goodbye, Ben Halter, and good luck. Thank you. I'm going to take a snapshot of us all sitting in the sun on New Year's Day. <laughs> You will come, won't you, Mrs. White? Must I? Oh, please do. I want everybody. Yes, I always look so miserable in photographs. Where's Mr. Winterhalter? Over there, somewhere. Mr. Winterhalter! I gather your car has been rescued, Mr. Lancaster. Yes. You'll be glad to leave, I expect. There's really nothing whatever to do. Mr. <laughs> Winterhalter! Course, when one lives permanently in a place, one gradually slips into a kind of routine and... Then the days pass very quickly. Uh, yes, that's true. Uh, just to give you an instance, now, uh, Monday we have cottage pie for lunch. In Berry. <laughs> well, believe me or not, 
it seems sometimes that we're eating cottage pie every third day. <laughs> it's amazing, you know. Yes, yes, time certainly passes. Tempest Fugit. No sign of him. Oh, where's the Colonel gone? Oh, I wanted to tell you how much I enjoyed the party last night, Mr Lancaster. Last year, you know, it was very quiet. We were all in bed by half past ten. And I remember waking up at midnight and hearing the bells and thinking, whatever's that? It quite startled me till I realised it was only the new year coming in. <laughs> and for some reason, I felt so sad I could have burst into tears. <laughs> Silly. Mrs Lancaster, sir, she's ready for you to take the suitcases. Oh, thank you. I'll go and fetch them. I don't expect you and your mother will be sorry to see them go. Must have meant a lot of extra work. Oh, the work doesn't matter. There should be some chance of a bath tonight, anyway. Poor girl. She's had her nose put out of joint, I'm afraid. Our little Austrian friend quite lost his head. <laughs> what on earth he imagined could possibly come of it, I really don't know. Oh, dear. Oh, I'm not used to these late I'll nights. Don't worry about it. It's so silly, dear, when you've got a temperature. He insisted on getting up to see them go. Well, that's not sensible, Johnny. It really isn't. I'll go back when they've gone. See what I mean? How come on do? Uh, by the way, Miss Landy asked me to give you a message. A message? Uh, she said if she didn't see you again, she would write. Oh, thank you. She would write. <laughs> she has an idea, you see, that I'd go out to Switzerland a little later. Oh. It's very good of you to help me, Colonel. No, not at all. I'll say goodbye then, Mrs. Ashford. Well, you'll just wait a minute. I'm going to take a photograph. Oh, we're rather late, I'm afraid. I should go and get the car ready, pack the luggage. Oh, I wanted to have everybody. If there's time, I'll come back. Thank you. Goodbye, Mrs. White. Oh, goodbye. I only hope we haven't been too much of a nuisance. Of course not. Goodbye. 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 But come back, do. Oh, would you gentlemen mind helping me to move the bench? It must be facing the yes. sun. Yes. Like this. All right, Colonel, I can manage. John, I thought you were in bed. No, I, I'm quite all right. I just wanted to see you to say that I, I mean to come, if it can be arranged. Oh, but that's splendid. Of course it can be arranged. Now, the photograph. Tonetta! Yes, somehow I'll come. I'll write to you. Whatever happens, I'll come. Tonetta, where's the hat box? I've got it, darling. Oh, Mrs. Lancaster, will you come <coughs> in the middle? Would you mind? And we'll have a nice group. Oh, you can't want to photograph me. Oh, yes. Besides, we're going. Well, I shall sit here for just five seconds and no more. Now, if we only had Mr. Lancaster... Oh, won't we do? It's getting so late. Oh, well, well very well, then. Now, uh, still, please. Colonel Selby, you're pulling faces. You are not. Oh, poor man. Now, everyone, look this way. Still. There. Now, Tony, the car. Goodbye, Mrs. White. Goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. It's been Goodbye. such fun. Can you manage that suitcase, John? Of there course. we appear to be going at last. Oh, and what a beautiful morning we're leaving behind us. Really, it's enchanting here. It's quite enchanting. Look, the first snowdrops. Oh, bless their hearts. The promise of spring. You know, I believe I quite envy you all living in such a place. Envious? Oh, yes, I mean it. Oh, if only I could settle down in the country miles from anywhere and simply do nothing all day long but cultivate my garden and watch the seasons change. It's the only dignified way of living. I'm quite convinced of that. Now, I must brush. We're shockingly late. Goodbye to you all. I've so enjoyed meeting Goodbye. you. All Goodbye. of you. Oh, uh, where's Mr. Winterhalter? Uh, he went out for a walk. Oh, well, do tell him... Uh, no, no. Just say goodbye to him for me, will you? Goodbye. 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 <sighs> there. They've gone. Yes. Today's Wednesday. They came on Saturday. Three days and a bit. <laughs> I can't help laughing when I think of last night. That poor girl. Ah, oh, here's Mr. Winterhalter. Now the party's complete. Mrs. Lancaster told us to say goodbye to you for her. Oh, there. Uh, thank you. That's very kind of her. Last night I heard her inviting you to stay with her in London, didn't I? I do hope you'll go. I should like to know what sort of establishment they keep. I think that was just one of those invitations that people make rather late at night. Ah, uh, well, forward. Johnny? Hmm? Mother wants you not to go back to bed. Listen. You'd better go. She's upset. Oh, it's always the same. Excuse me. 
I hear a welcome sound. Oh, he always says that. I hear a welcome sound. Oh, do I? Oh, you don't notice it, perhaps, but you do, doesn't he? Now we all have our pet habits. <laughs> That's true. After you, Mrs. White. Oh, please, go on. <laughs> this always happens, doesn't it? I say, after you, and you say, please, go on. <laughs> <laughs> the coming winter halter. Yes, yes, I'm coming. Oh, well, uh, forward. Winter halter. <laughs> Colonel Dumkopf. I suppose it's too late, is it? They have gone. Yes, they've gone. Oh. I found this coat in Miss Landy's room. On it was this note. Dear Miss Daly, I'm leaving this coat behind in the hopes you may find some use for it. T.L. I suppose this was left as a tip. It's quite ridiculous, and of course I shall have to send it back. I shouldn't think she's worn it three times. Must be worth at least 30 pounds. How can she imagine I could accept a present like that? I don't know. Perhaps she meant it kindly. Yes, but really. If it had been a scarf, say, or a pair of gloves, I could have accepted it. This is so much too much. Do you like the coat? Yes, of course I like it. It's, it's a beautiful coat. I could never afford to buy anything half as good. But of course it's out of the question. If you send it back, you will probably hurt her. Is that what you want to do? Why did she leave it for me? I hardly spoke three words to her. She didn't even like me. Oh, I don't know. The fact is, I suppose that I'm gradually becoming the sort of person who takes offence at kindnesses, who can't say thank you for anything. Very well. I shall keep it. I shall sit down and write as nice a letter as I possibly can thanking her for her generosity and kindness. I shall try for once to be a little generous, too. Oh, oh what am I crying for? <laughs> what a miserable couple we are. Poor Julius. You know, I begin to think that the only sin in life is to be unhappy. How shameful it is to sit here in the sunlight nursing our little sorrows as if they were important. What a fool I've been. Oh, what a fool. Evelyn! Evelyn! Never mind. Never mind. That was Coral Brown as Helen Lancaster and Virginia Maskell as Evelyn Daly in Waters of the Moon by N.C. Hunter, adapted for radio by Molly Hardwick. The rest of the cast was as follows. Mrs. White, Mary O'Farrell, Mrs. Ashworth, Dorothy Holmes Gore, Julia Spinterhalter, Gerard Heinz, Colonel Selby, Martin Lewis, Mrs. Daly, Anna Burden, Robert Lancaster, Patrick Barr, John Daly, Peter Marinka, Tonetta, Eva Haddon. The pianist was Cicely Hoy, and the play which was recorded was produced by Betty Davis. Stay tuned for Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall, missionary from the world of the mysterious and the macabre. Things would be better all around, easier, certainly, if evil looked evil, sounded evil, smelled evil. Good and evil, it's reached a point where these days, to so many people, they appear to be so much alike. Our mystery drama, The Moonlighter, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Howard Da Silva. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Way back in 1876, it was brewed and aged to deliver a taste, a smoothness, and a drinkability found in no other beer at any price. I'm talking about Budweiser. And it's still brewed that way today, with pride, without compromise, to be the king of beers. The largest-selling beer in the history of the world, for one simple reason... 
That beechwood-aged Budweiser taste. And that speaks for itself. Hear it talking? When you say mud, you say you care enough to only walk the king of beers. There is no other one. There's only something left. Because the king of beers is leading all the rest. When you say mud, why this? You said it all. And I'm the bush saint. What's for Thanksgiving dinner? Your ShopRite supermarket has the answer. Start with turkey. ShopRite Young Grade A Tom, 16 to 24 pounds, 57 cents a pound. Or hens, 10 to 14 pounds, 63 cents a pound. Serve with ShopRite cauliflower or broccoli spears, just 99 cents for four 10-ounce packages. And ShopRite jellied cranberry sauce, of course, three one-pound cans for 89 cents. For dessert... Shoprite premium quality Elizabeth York ice cream, one half gallon for a dollar thirty-nine. Start a family tradition. Shop Shoprite for values. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets Shoprite do the rest. Hey, ma, what's for dinner? Shoprite has the answer. Hey, skiers, get ready for the Ski Show Expo Winter 75. This year, the focus is on the great ski bargain hunt, the best thing that ever happened to your ski budget. Plus a dozen different shows with champion freestylers, films and fashions, trips and tickets, and equipment displays for first-timers to hot doggers. Apres Ski meets you at the brewery for music and mixing at the Ski Show Expo Winter 75. Take someone you like to the ski show opening Thursday at 6 at the New York Coliseum. There is so much talk these days about the quality of life and how it's gone down. I'm not prepared to argue the point one way or another, but one thing I admit has certainly gone down. And that's the quality of argument, especially between husbands and wives. It seems to me that husbands and wives used to have heated, passionate arguments over great emotional issues, love, faithfulness, even sex. Today, it's mostly been reduced to ill-tempered spats and tantrums over money. Oh, is this our brave new world? Is this what it all comes down to? Well... Stanley and Gladys Morrison are at it again. Well, what answer do you get? I, I don't know. I've, I've added it three times, and it keeps coming out differently. Well, how can you concentrate on the figures with that damn recording blaring in your ears? It is not a damn recording. It is Mozart. I have to know how many checks you wrote this week. Performed by the Boston Symphony. I'd add it up myself, but I can't read your handwriting. And uh, what's his name is conducting. You went to the most expensive girls' private school. You went to the most exclusive girls' college. Darling, you've got it twisted. The private school was exclusive. The college was expensive. Didn't they teach you to write? Stanley, why do you become so excited about money? Gladys, I don't want the account to be overdrawn. Your cheeks are all flushed. Your eyes are filled with fire. <laughs> it's almost a sexual thing. Gladys, listen to me. But I've been listening, darling. And I have solved the problem. You don't want the checking account to be overdrawn? Well, let's just put in an extra hundred dollars now and then to act as a, a sort of cushion. In the first place, it's wrong. In the second place, I don't have an extra hundred dollars. Oh, darling, you say that as if a, a hundred dollars is a fortune. I never heard you fuss like this over a hundred dollars before. Gladys, we have to cut down. Well, I do my best, darling. <sighs> okay. I guess it's not fair. No, it certainly isn't. Oh, you were brought up a rich girl. You never learned how to worry about money. Oh, well, darling, it did seem silly to worry about money. After all, there was so much of it. <laughs> and when you married me, I was making plenty of money, huh? And you still are. No. I'm not making that much anymore. Stanley. Do you mean you received a cut in salary? No. Well, then how can you say you're not making as much money? Because the money isn't worth as much. We simply have to economize. All right. I'm willing. We have to sit down and draw up an entire list of ways to save money. 
Okay. Here's one. At the club, I won't order from the a la carte menu. I'll yeah, just is... have a sandwich and coffee. What we should do is resign from the club. What? It's become very expensive. Stanley, why suddenly are we... Well, is everything so tight? I don't know, Gladys. Things have been going up, 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 steadily, quietly, and one day you turn around and there just isn't enough money. Why don't you ask for a raise? A raise? Do you realize that... I realize that you're not getting paid what you're worth. I'm not sure this is the right time. All you have to say is, look, I must be paid more money. The dollar is worth only 57 cents oh, now. Oh, come on, Gladys. That's what you told me it was worth. Say, look here, Chris, I have to resign from the country club. I'd take my daughter out of private school. I can and assure I... you that Chris Delavan couldn't care less whether I belong to a country club or send my daughter I'm to a... I'm mo- sure he does. That's the sort of man he needs. A man who, who travels in the kind of circles where he can meet potential customers. Gladys, you should never ask your boss for a raise if you're not prepared to quit. I know that. <laughs> then you know I couldn't afford to quit. Mm, I suppose not. What does that mean? Stanley, the minister said for richer, for poorer. And I really wasn't paying much attention. I'm sorry. It's the state of the economy. No, I, I think it's the state of your mind. You are the most important man in that company. Well, not really. Why don't you ask for a raise? I told you. You didn't tell me the real reason. You're afraid. Oh, that's ridiculous. Darling, this argument has lasted six minutes. If it goes on much longer, it will become a quarrel, then a conflict, which will lead to a rupture. And before we know it... All right, all right. I'll see what I can do. I know you will, Stanley, darling. Chris, got a minute? Sure thing, boy. What's on your mind, Stanley? Well, I... Uh, just a second. Uh, well... What's the matter, Chris? Oh, I'm beat. I need some coffee. You want a cup? Okay. Sally, bring in two coffees. Well, boy, what can I do for you? Chris, it seems to me Yeah, that... just a second. Uh, Sally, make mine black. Yeah, sure, Miss Louise. This one has to be told everything at least 400 times. Well, but that's my problem. <laughs> uh, what's your problem? Well... Hold it. How do you want your coffee? Oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, Stanley, you're so easygoing. Well, not anymore. I wish I had your temperament. Especially last night. Oh, 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 that was a session. Well, Chris, I simply... I really blew my stack last night, Stanley. And I guess I did it for you. For me? And for what I thought was best for this company. The chairman of the board took me to dinner. We had all this talk about the economy, how scarce money is. And that's exactly why I... Well, had... you know where that kind of talk leads. Where can we cut? And so old man Sullivan said, cut out the research department. My... My department? And do what, I asked. And he said, well, we can subscribe to outside services and get the same No, but they can get the same information, the same analysis. Well, yeah, that's what took me the better part of five hours to hammer into his skull. Well, anyhow, you're safe for at least a year. But, Stanley, you watch every dollar. Okay, Stanley. Your turn. Hey, 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 old buddy. You still have the eye. All six in the bullseye. Just lucky, I guess. Hey, I see you have a new revolver, Frank. Yeah, I picked me up a three fifty seven Magnum. Oh, that's a lot of gun. Well, that's my motto. If you're going to have something, have a lot of it. Yeah, but that's the kind of gun you use to kill people. Well, that thirty eight of yours isn't exactly a little kid's water pistol, either. <laughs> Ah, uh, come on. Let's go somewhere and have a drink, huh? I have to be getting home. No, 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 no. You come with me. I, um, uh, have a serious matter to discuss. You know, Stanley, the only place I ever run into you these days is the pistol range. 
It's the only thing you haven't given up. Ah, what are you talking about? Well, nobody sees you anymore. You're never at the club for golf or tennis. I've been busy. Oh, Cora May says you and Gladys keep turning us down for dinner. Well, we've had a lot of other things around. Yeah, no, that's not the reason. You don't go out because you can't afford to return the hospitality. Now, that's the that... truth. And I've known it for a long time. What? What do you think you know? I know all the signs. I've been there myself. It's because there's no money. Now, suddenly, your running expenses are draining you dry. And, well, you wonder how you'll live. Oh, it's the times. These crazy, twisted times. Still, we've got to live in these times. They're the only ones we'll ever have. Oh, I have to have some more money. Maybe I can take on another job or something. Where? And will Delavan and company uh, take kindly to the head of their research department moonlighting? How would it look? I don't know what to do, Frank. I'm glad it's... Huh? It'll kill her if it keeps up. No, you may laugh at that. I'm not laughing. She can't help the way she was brought up. And, and to me, it was so great that, that someone like her could fall for me. And you can laugh at that, too. It isn't funny. Sure, okay, we won't starve or even come close, but she can't have all the things she always took for granted. I, I, I mean, well, maybe it's wrong of her, maybe it's vanity, but well, that's how she is. I understand. And then she, she won't leave me. And she'll always feel that I failed her, and I have. Stanley, <laughs> quit beating your breast and do something positive. I tried. I was going to ask for a raise. Did Chris sense it? Did he finesse me? If it was a bluff, I just couldn't call it. But look at me, Stanley. Now, I don't make as much money as you, and I've got just about the same expenses, okay? Well, I just bought myself this suit for 280 smackers. The car outside is brand new, and you know it's not cheap. Now, this summer, we spent a whole month in Europe. How, how do I do it? You're in debt up to your ears. No, no, not even for a nickel. Yes, again. You sold your soul to the devil. Well. Well, what? It's, uh, <laughs> it's not a completely ridiculous answer. What do you mean it's not a completely ridiculous answer? There could be some truth to it. Well, now I don't know what to say. Well, you're on the right track. Well, if that's the right track, that's as far as I want to go. Suppose you could uh, make yourself an extra ten grand a year. Doing what? Tax free. <laughs> Who would I have to kill? I don't know. Yet. What kind of an answer is that? A truthful one. Frank, do you know what you're saying? Yes. You're saying I would have to kill somebody. That's right. Somebody who is, as yet, unknown. But why would I want to kill anybody? For money. Oh, no. You mean you'd do it for nothing? I wouldn't do it at all. That's what I had to find out. Frank. Hey, do you mean you're tied up with... You're you're involved... Did you, did you kill people? Yes. Yes. You sit there and... You say yes so calmly. How can you say this to me? Aren't you... Aren't you afraid I'd go to the police? No. In the first place, you're my oldest, closest friend. And I've taken you into my confidence. Yeah, but this has to do with murder. In the second place, what could you go to the police with? What could you prove? And in the third place, after you uh, think this over, you'll want to know more about it. Oh, no, Frank. I know too much right now. And I don't want to hear one more word. Okay, Stanley. I won't say one more word. Until you ask me. And so the seed has been planted. How like a growing thing a story is. In the first act, we plant the seed. In the second, we cultivate and water the soil. And in the third, we harvest the crop. What we don't know at this point is what kind of seed has just been planted. But something may start to flower when I return in just a few moments with Act Two. Oh, I thought I saw a putty cat. I did see a putty cat. Hi, I'm Mel Blank, and that's another of my thousand voices. And that's why they asked me to tell you about lemon mint Listerine lozenges. 
Because when your throat is hot and dry from a cold, they make it feel cool and soothed. And Listerine's anesthetic medicine helps give fast, <laughs> temporary relief from minor sore throat pain. Lemon mint Listerine lozenges. No matter how many voices you've got, you've only got one throat. So you get Listerine lozenges, folks. Use only as directed. Well, good old Uncle Sam has done it again. If you know anybody on Social Security, listen to this. People who get Social Security checks will never again have to worry about them being late or lost or stolen. If you just fill out a simple form at the Lincoln Savings Bank, Uncle Sam will automatically deposit your Social Security check directly into your account at the Lincoln every month. No more waiting around for it to come. No more lost or stolen checks. No more standing in line to cash them. Every month, the day your check is due, the money is there in your account at the Lincoln. Waiting for you to collect it or write payment orders the way you write ordinary checks or earning interest for you in a Lincoln savings account. Uncle Sam and the Lincoln do it all automatically. You don't have to do anything except fill out one form at any Lincoln branch or telephone 7826000 and the Lincoln will mail it to you. The Lincoln Savings Bank, 7826000. Member FDIC. Tomorrow morning, listen to Rambling with Gambling, the program with all the degrees. There's Fahrenheit, Celsius, and there are some others, too. Dr. John Gambling here, inviting you to join me and the other doctor, Dr. Bob Harris, along with Peter Roberts, Jack Allen, Harry Hennessy, Henry Gladstone, Walter Spencer, George Meade, Fred Feldman, and the whole crew here in Studio 2 for our daily seminars over WOR radio from 5 till 10 in the morning. Now, what courses would you like to take? We have music, news, sports, weather, traffic information, a little bit of alleged humor now and again, and just about everything else to start your morning right. That's Rambling with Gambling, daily, 5 till 10 in the morning, here at WOR radio, the talk of New York. What's a country fresh flavor like New Co doing in a city like New York? New Co's bring in country to the city. New Co's got that country fresh taste. New Co's bring in country to the city. Yeah. New Co's put a smile on your face. Heck, I'm big city now, but it wasn't always that way. I sure used to miss that back home country fresh taste that just big peas and carrots and corn and beans. Oh, my. But then Elsie Sue, she's really big city. She put me on to Nuco Margarine. It comes in both stick and soft forms, you know, and Nuco's got a real country fresh taste that makes anything you put it on taste country good. So now it's Elsie and me and Nuco Margarine. We're in a big city to stay. Nuco's bringing country to the city. Yeah. Nuco put a smile on your face. According to statistics, the majority of all arguments between husbands and wives are about money. Does this mean they don't have disagreements about other things? No. It only means they don't have long, drawn-out arguments about them. Money. They say it doesn't buy happiness. I suppose that all depends on what you mean by happiness. Is that you, Stanley? Yes, I'm home. Hi. What smells? Oh, it's dinner. I'm, I'm afraid I burned it. You burned it? Did you make dinner? Of course. What happened to Mrs. Stone? Oh, well, I had to let her go. You let her go? We have to save money, don't we? Yes, but you can't even boil water. Well, I'll have to learn. Look, Gladys, we, uh... Stanley, for the past few months, you've been telling me how terribly tight money has become. Now, is it true? Well, yes. The club, Judy's private school, the extra car, the boat, Mrs. Stone. We simply cannot afford all of those things anymore. Can we? Well, it has to do with this inflationary period. Perhaps soon things will become normal. And perhaps they won't. Perhaps this will become the new normal. Since you are unwilling or unable to make more money... All of this is merely idle chatter. Sit still, I'll get it. Hello? Yes, Coronet. Oh, fine. Uh, Tuesday night for dinner. Tell her we'll be back. Oh, darling, I'm sorry. We're tied up on Tuesday. I said tell her we'll make oh, it. Oh, I'd love to play Coronet, but 
I'm afraid this week he's out. I seem to have developed a tennis elbow. But we'll get together. Let me call you. Right. Bye. I said to tell her we'd accept that invitation. I am not accepting any hospitality I cannot afford to return. And you go out and play tennis and golf. Stanley, what are you saying? I'm saying I have killed myself these past 20 years so that I could enjoy some decent living. Well, nobody's going to take it away from me. Well, Frank, dessert? No, I don't want any dessert, and I don't want another cup of coffee or a liqueur. And we're the only ones left in the joint, so uh, if you're ready to go, I am. Frank, how can I make that extra ten grand a year? Well, well, actually, it uh, could be much more than ten grand. Lately, it seems there's uh, quite a bit of work. Just tell me how. The underworld, the mob, the syndicate, uh, call it whatever you want. They're getting away uh, more and more from using their own people as uh, executioners. Oh, good Lord. What kind of conversation am I having? We can stop any time. All right, let's stop. No. Go ahead. And so, uh, now, the trend is to look for a respectable folk to do the job. People who would never be suspected. Look at me. An editor for a trade magazine. Now, who would ever suspect me? Look at you. A research analyst from a brokerage house. Who would suspect you? It's this... This dealing with gangsters that scares me off. You're not dealing with gangsters. This is a small, private outfit. Created to fill a specific need. But still... And their clientele isn't restricted to the underworld. You'd be absolutely amazed how many law-abiding, reputable, upright people require this kind of service. <laughs> you know, there are times, it's unfortunate but true, when a well-placed bullet is the only solution to a problem. But it's murder. Yes. I never killed anybody. The commandment says, thou shalt not kill. You never killed anybody in Korea? Oh, that was different. Killing is killing. But your conscience... Each contract is worth between $2,500 and $3,000. I thought it would pay a good deal more. It does, in real value, when you consider it's tax-free. And uh, you might do five, six, even seven a year. No more money problems. Suppose you get caught. How can you get caught? Why should anyone even suspect you? Maybe... Maybe I'll... I'll try it once. No. Now you can't try it to see if you like it. Once you're on board, you can't get off the ship. Oh. You can understand why. Yeah. Well, uh, now you have to make the next move, Stanley. Frank, I've been on a straight and narrow all my life. I'll testify to that. Nobody worked harder than I did. That's a fact. But I'm... Well, I'm just not making out anymore. All of a sudden, I look around... I've gone through all my savings, and for what? Just to keep my head above water. I've been through the same thing, Stanley. Maybe my wife is vain, but that's her right. Maybe some people would look at me and say, he wants the frivolous things of this world. How much longer do you need to talk yourself into it? Where do I go? You don't go anywhere. He comes to you. <laughs> Oh, good evening. Uh, you must be Mrs. Morris. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Mr. Ackroyd. I'm sorry to disturb you at home, but I have some contracts to discuss with Mr. Morrison. Oh, well, please come in. Stanley, a gentleman to see you. Uh, won't you sit down, Mr. Ackroyd? Oh, thank you. Who rang the bell, Gladys? Mr. Morrison, uh, my name is Ackroyd. A mutual friend suggested that we might do some business. Oh? Isn't that wonderful, Stanley? Uh, what business are you in, Mr. Ackroyd? The removal business. Oh, yes. Yes, I remember you, Mr. Ackroyd. And I, uh, I have the pertinent information in my desk. Could you, uh, could you excuse us, darling? Oh, certainly. And uh, let me know if you gentlemen would like some refreshments. Oh, that's so kind of you, Mrs. Morrison. This way, Mr. Ackroyd. Our mutual friend speaks highly of you, Mr. Morrison. 
Well, I, uh, I have a contract for you. You must memorize all the details. All contracts are verbal. You can understand why. Uh, that gentleman's name is Everett Marshall. At this point, it's best you don't know who he is or what he does or why someone has purchased a contract for him. Well, then how am I supposed to know? The right man? We'll handle that detail for you. Now, you have your own weapon. I've been assured it's in excellent condition and that you're an expert in its use. You'll be on the northwest corner of Garfield and 3rd tomorrow evening at 8 o'clock sharp. I, uh... Nervousness is perfectly normal. The first time. I, I'm not sure I, uh... I can go through with it. But you can. You must. Oh, this envelope is for you. What's in it? Your fee. $2,500. Take it. But I... We pay in advance. $2,500. All for you. Well, till tomorrow. Oh, Mr. Ackroyd. Uh, may I offer you something to drink? Oh, thank you. I'm afraid I have a pressing engagement. <laughs> well, uh, another time, then. Oh. It must be the Boston Symphony. An unbelievably lucid blend of brass and strain. Yes, it is. Well, uh, good night. <laughs> good night. You know Stanley? He's such a nice man. Mr. Morrison, on time. Good side. Join me. And now then, in just a few moments, your client, Mr. Everett Marshall, will emerge from that building across the street. He's a tall, stout gentleman. Oh, oh, there he is. He has that blonde girl on his arm. See them? Yes. They're headed for the cafe just up the block. And take this key... It will let you into the building. Walk up the stairs. Do not take the elevator to the second floor. First on your right, you'll see the number 215. Open the door with the same key. Go into the office and wait for him. What do you mean, wait for him? In five minutes, he shall receive a telephone call and he will come back to the office. As soon as he is inside, shoot him. Sh shoot him? Don't hesitate, but... Suppose someone in the building happens to... There is absolutely no one in that building at this time. After you shoot him, take the stairway at the other end of the hall. It leads to an alleyway around the corner. But what, if, what, if he, what if he brings her, the, the girl, with him? He won't. I, uh... No, you'd better be on your way. You have less than three minutes. And uh, afterward, get rid of the revolver. Take it apart and toss it into the bay. What's the big idea asking me to get something out of the si Hey, who? Who are you? No! Don't! Don't! Oh. More coffee, darling? I have to run. Well, I know my coffee isn't much good, but is it that bad? It's awful. Has Mr. Soames found another job yet? I don't think so. Ask her to come back. But can we afford her? I mean, what about the money? Darling, don't worry about the money. It narrows your mouth and puts lines in your face. But I thought we were having trouble making ends meet. Well, they met finally. Anything in the morning paper? Oh, the usual murder stories on the front page. A gentleman named um, um, Everett Marshall was found shot to death in his office last night. Is that so? By whom? Police think it was a burglar. Morning, everybody. Uh, the door was open. I, I walked well, in. Well, good morning, Frank. Coffee? Uh, no, no, thanks. Uh, Stanley, you want to lift downtown? Thanks. Hey, what mischief are you boys up to this morning? Mischief? Well, a beautiful day like this, you might decide to play hooky and go to the club. Oh, no, no, no. We, uh, we don't do frivolous things together anymore. Stanley and I, uh, well, we've become very serious people. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> see by the papers, it uh, went very well. Oh, yes. I thought I'd 
come by this morning because, uh, well, I was very nervous after my first one. Maybe you'd need a lift. I'm all right. Ah, that's, that's good. I don't know why. When I went up to that man's office, I was convinced I wouldn't be able to kill him. When I walked in that door and he saw me and the gun in my hand, I could look into his eyes. I could see my whole life in his eyes as if as if it were a motion picture screen. You shouldn't think about these things. And he said, no, don't. And I just aimed at the top button of his jacket as if I were shooting on the range. And I squeezed the trigger once, twice, and he fell. He was dead. And I simply walked out of that room, down that hall, down those stairs, into the street, over to the bay, got rid of the 38, and here I am. And I don't feel one tiny twinge of remorse. Frank, what happened? To what? To 40 years of education, of indoctrination, of belief in the value of human life. Of right and wrong. All the things we we profess to believe in. I don't know. Do they get swept aside in the first storm? Frank, what happened to my to my conscience? Where is it? My conscience. There's no explanation, Stanley. Why am I so untroubled, so serene, so much at peace with myself? Is it possible that when we murder another human being, we also murder our own conscience? Because... I tell you, Frank, mine is dead. What do you think? Maybe you're right. How's yours? My conscience? Yes. Mine's dead, too. As the poet said, conscience doth make cowards of us all. He's usually right, but uh, perhaps Stanley and Frank are the exceptions that proves the rule. Well, it's an interesting problem. Can you kill a conscience? Or put it this way, in killing your conscience, what else do you kill? These questions require a third act for their solution, and I shall return in just a... Is it a veneer, our morality, our code of ethics? This problem has occupied the attention of scholars throughout the ages. How deeply are we committed to the values we profess so vehemently in public? Some say man is basically evil, and some say man is basically good. And perhaps neither side is completely right or completely wrong. Darling... Hmm? I'm, uh, I'm afraid I'm overdrawn at the bank. I know. You know? Yes. Jack Carstairs has orders to call me when that happens, and I make the adjustment. But, darling, I really should try to be more careful. No. For you to be more careful with money would require too much time and effort. Why'd you turn off the music? Because I want to tell you how much I love you. Happy? I'm deliriously happy. I don't want you to have a worry in the world. Stanley, why is it that suddenly we have no more money worries? Dear, it all has to do with judicious management. Oh, how right you are. Judicious management. That's what Daddy used to say. No, he used to say prudent management. Oh, same thing. You know, darling, you look marvelous. You look so so young, so happy, so so. Well, I can't really explain it. Exhilarated, as if you were having the time of your life. Well, I am. Hello. Hello, Stanley. Oh, oh yes. Uh, Stanley, would it be convenient to meet me at the Cafe Charleston on Ninth and Dewey, say in forty-five minutes? Certainly. Thank you, Stanley. Darling, was that that very nice gentleman, uh, I can't remember his name, the one who loves Mozart? Your envelope, Stanley. Thank you. 
Uh, you'll find it contains $3,500. Your rating has gone up. From now on, this is your fee. Uh, your client is a woman. A woman? Should that make a difference? Well, I... I... Women have been agitating for equality, haven't they? What did she do? Hmm. Does it matter? No, but I... The very cornerstone of our philosophy is complete disassociation from our clients. I understand. Your only contact with your client comes at the very end of his life. And then, only for a brief moment. It's just that a, a woman... Should it matter? All right. Where do I go? Her name is Alma Watson. Coming, honey, coming. Hi, Reggie. Oh, I thought you were the... Miss Alma Watson? Yeah. Are you sure you're Alma Watson? Sure, I'm sure. It wouldn't do for me to make a mistake. <laughs> the man's name is Paul Terry. His name is Jerome Kelly. He's hiding out in a little motel. Your classification's gone up, Stanley. You're a $5,000 man now. Chris, got a minute? Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, hi, Stanley. Yeah, look, I'm swamped. Can't wait. No, Chris, it can't wait. You want me to continue here? What a question. I want a 25% raise. Oh, now, Stanley, you know the facts of life around here. I'll quit. You... You know what? Take it or leave it. But, Stanley, you know how Sullivan feels. I only know what you tell me, Chris. Now, see here, Stanley. You can't get rid of me, and you know it. 25%. Well, that's a lot of money. Just for the rest of the year. After January 1, it goes to 30. Well, Stanley, we have to talk about this. I'm swamped with work, Chris. Besides, what's there to talk about? I said take it or leave it. That phony. He's been making himself look good at my expense. I never had the guts to stand up to him before. But you know something, Frank? Since I've taken on this sideline... How about another round? No, 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 I had enough. As I was saying, since we've been engaged in our new activity, I'm another person. I'll have another one. I think you had enough, too. Charlie, make it a double. A double? You know, I'm not afraid of anybody or anything. Maybe that's what we're all about. You, you, you know what I mean? No. But maybe... Maybe man is basically a hunting animal. Maybe we try to obscure that with a veneer of civilization. You think so? Well, look at how quickly we pierce that veneer. Eh, maybe we do, maybe we don't. When we get down to it, what's it all about? Security. Security? Yeah, well, I define as my security. My home, my woman, my child, my, my property. I'll kill for it. Each man defines what security means to him. And each man will kill for it. End of speech. Stanley. What's the matter, Frank? I, I don't know. You've been putting away a good deal of that booze, pal. I know, and it, it doesn't help. Well, what did booze ever help? And what help do you need? Stanley, I... I, I, I want to get out. Get out of what? You know what? Fine. I, I can't sleep. I, I, I see people's faces. You, you know which people I mean. Frank, if you'd stop drinking... Have you seen any faces yet, Stanley? Of course not. You will. You will. Remember that day, that, that first day... Oh, good Lord, how I wish I'd never gotten you into it. Are you crazy? You've solved all my problems. You, you wanted to know what happens to your conscience? Huh? Huh? We thought maybe you'd kill it. You, you don't. It just... It just goes to sleep. And all of a sudden, it wakes up. Well, regardless, Frank, we have a practical problem. You simply don't quit. Does Ackroyd suspect... Oh, I'm sure he does. I, I, I begged off the last couple of... Assignments claimed I was sick. I, I can't keep it up forever. Can you 
arrange to go away for a while. Get some rest. You'll see things differently. Do you know what I keep seeing in front of my eyes? Uh, the laugh. Oh, big letters of fire. And they say, thou shalt not kill. Oh, Frank, Frank, get hold of yourself. Oh, I'll try. Uh, I'll, I'll try. You'll be all right. Here's your envelope. Thank you. It, uh, it will be necessary to violate our basic philosophy just somewhat in this particular case. But then, rules were made to be broken. Oh, here we are. Oh, wait. Wait, this is the building. This is the building of the publishing company where... What, what? And here he comes now. Frank. He's going around the corner to the parking lot where it's dark and deserted. Follow him there. Kill him. But he's he's my... He's your client. I can't kill Frank. Why not? I... I... Stanley, Frank is being killed for just this very reason. He refused to accept a contract. Now go to the parking lot and shoot him. No. What's to be gained by your refusal? Someone else will be assigned to kill him. And to kill you, too. I wish I'd never gotten into this. Well, that's not true. The rewards have been spectacular. But, Frank... And if it is true, shouldn't you be eager to kill Frank? After all, he's the one who did get you into it. Quickly, Stanley, before it's too late. Stanley? Is that you? Yes. What are you doing here? Oh. Oh. I, I see. Well, uh, go, go ahead. I, I I don't care. It has to happen. It may as well be you as anyone else. Well, don't, don't stand there. Do it. You know you're supposed to do it right away. Don't wait. Don't delay. Just pull the trigger and walk away. I can't. You've got to. You can't save me. No one can save me. I don't want to be saved anyhow. When you see the faces, do you hear the voices too? Yeah. All of a sudden, I'm hearing them. When do you stop hearing them? I don't know. When do you stop seeing them? I guess when you're dead. Is this how it happened to you? You, you better kill me. Before it's too late for you. It's too late for me now. I don't have a chance. Try to save yourself. No, I'll never lose those voices, the faces. Look, have you got your gun? Yeah, in the glove compartment. Let's kill him. Who? Ackroyd. We'll never get away with it. Does that matter? Come on, buddy. He's in that car, all alone. No, he's not alone. See that car across the street? He's got some people in it. Maybe he felt he couldn't trust you. Stanley, I know it's a difficult assignment, but it has to be done. Stanley, you can't get away. The block is surrounded. Now, you just do what's necessary, and everything will be fine. I can hit him from here. Stanley, I... I don't care anymore. Save yourself. That's just what I'm trying to do. Save myself. Stanley, let me hear it. Yeah, I'll let you hear it. Don't shoot him, Stanley. It won't help. Shut up. It's not an easy shot. Now. <laughs> Got him. Let's try to get out of here. They're shooting at us. Frank. Frank, I don't hear the voices anymore. I don't see the faces. Do you? No. 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 Frank. The newspapers, the authorities, none of them knew what you and I know. There was a gunfight on the street between two respectable citizens and a group of people, some of whom are known criminals. The story the police seem inclined to believe is that a bank was about to be burglarized when Mr. Stanley Morrison and Mr. Frank Smith happened along and decided to perform their citizenly duties. Both men died heroes' deaths. 
and they will be honored at special funeral services. I shall return shortly. The human conscience, certainly the most elusive component in man's makeup. It may slumber for years and awake without warning. Our cast included Howard Da Silva, Joan Lovejoy, Bob Caliban, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Listerine Lozenges and Sinoff, the sinus medicines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next... Countdown for blast off. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand would-be worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents X minus one. Tonight's story, The Man in the Moon. Attention, attention. This is the Federal Bureau of Missing Persons calling all local agencies. Attention, this is a coded report nationwide. Missing since 9 o'clock this morning, the following persons. Smigley, Jonathan, 5 feet 8 inches tall, brown hair, brown eyes, mastoid scar behind right ear, last seen wearing blue top coat and tan cap, wanted by Los Angeles... Hello, get off this wavelength. Hello, this is a restricted Earth. band. Hello, hello, Earth. Uh, whoever you are, you're on a hello, coded wavelength. Earth. Tune out. This frequency is reserved hello. for the Federal Bureau of Missing Persons. Hello, Earth. This is the moon Whoa. calling Earth. Hello, Earth. This guy is loony. This is Jake in transmission. Jake, this is Charlie of the code room. Some crackpot is on our frequency. Yeah, I heard him, Charlie. Got CQ trying to trace a source now. We should have a triangulation any second. Well, hurry it up, will you? Some ham is in for a good stiff fine by the FCC. Yeah, they ought to take his license away. Oh, here comes Lenny with the directional fix. Right. Thanks, Lenny. Hey. Hey, what's this? This is impossible. What's going on down there? How about it? Get that ham out of my kilocycles. Oh, listen, Charlie, unless this is a gag, that interference is being beamed from 240,000 miles away. Oh, now, Jake, you know there ain't no such thing as 240,000 miles away. Yes, there is, Charlie, straight up. Oh, now, wait a minute. Charlie, that signal is coming from the moon. Are you nuts? Well, somebody might be bouncing it, like a radar signal. Radar? On this frequency? Where'd you study basic radio? Now, listen, Flathead, you asked for a fix. I gave the best fix our instruments can find. Take it or leave it. Somebody on the moon is calling the Bureau of Missing Persons. Mr. Timken! Mr. Timken! What's the sweat, Charlie? Shouldn't you be broadcasting? Listen, Mr. Timken... You know I'm a sober citizen, right? Mm-hmm. Never once have I broadcast with the smell of alcohol on my breath, right? Right. In all your 12 years here at the Bureau, did I well, once what's ever... What's the matter, Charlie? We're picking up a message on our wavelength. Well, did you report to the FCC? I ain't got the nerve. Well, what's wrong? You'll scream when you hear this, Mr. Timken. You'll jump right out the window, but... We are getting an SOS from the moon. <laughs> Well, that's it. He started on voice and switched to Morse. The way the signal repeats sounds like a phonograph record or automatic sender of some sort. Well, what's it say? Uh, let's see here. Can you read me? Help, Otterburn. We'll contact when Moon is in phase. Let's have that again. Can you read me? Help, Otterburn. We'll contact when Moon is in phase. Otterburn. That sounds like a name, huh? Otterburn. Otterburn. Wait a minute. Something registered? Cornelius Otterburn. Holy jumping Jehoshaphat. Hey, where are you going? Talk to the chief. Hey, wait a minute. 
What are you going to tell him? We just got a CQ from the man in the moon? That's exactly what I am going to tell him, Charlie. Hey. Oh, this just too much for me. Washington Star Ledger. Uh, let me have O'Brien on city desk. One moment. O'Brien. Seamus, yeah. Charlie Starbuck, down at the Missing Persons Bureau. You want a hot one? No kidding. This will cost you a beer, okay? All right, shoot, noodle brain. I'll stay on your wavelength for 30 seconds. Okay. We just got a radio message from the moon. Yeah. What? From the moon. Call me back when you're sober. Okay, Seamus, if you don't know a story when you see one, I'll... I'll send you the name of a good psychiatrist. So long, Orson Welles. How do you like that? He don't believe me. Otterburn, Mr. Wade. Now, does that name ring a bell? You're the man with the photographic memory, Henry. What about Otterburn? Cornelius Otterburn, atomic physicist, reported missing from his home in Baltimore on June 5th, 1945, just five years ago, vanished completely. Are you trying to tell me you really think there's something to this man of the moon business? Henry, I'm surprised at you. This is some crackpot trying to jam the airways. Yes, but the name Otterburn is so unusual. So Mr. are a lot of names. But I have a theory that... I was afraid uh, of that. Henry, you always have a theory. Let's see, what was it last year? Oh, yes, that people disappear in occupational cycles. But it's true. Please, I... Henry, I'm a busy man. You expect me to believe that this Otterburn is sitting up on the moon, sending out shortwave messages? Well, he might be on Earth bouncing the messages off the moon. And... But who's to say he isn't on the moon? Henry, as chief of this bureau, I have my hands full trying to coordinate reports from 48 states in Alaska. I have no time to include the moon. But, Mr. Wade... Out, Henry. But, Mr. Wade... Out. I'm busy. Yes, sir. Oh, here. Take this folder of reports for the dead file. Yes, sir. And no more nonsense, eh, Henry? Yes, sir. I appreciate that you have a very dull job filing old missing persons reports, and I appreciate that you take an active interest in the affairs of the Bureau. But no more nonsense, eh? No, sir. No more nonsense. Mm. Uh, pardon me. Hmm? You are Mr. Henry Timken. <laughs> That's my name. Permit me, Jefferson Philo, scientific feature writer. Oh, how do you do? Oh, are you a newspaper man? Not exactly. I write as a hobby. Occasionally, the papers give me leads on an assignment. If I may have a moment of your time... Oh, certainly. Just sit down at my desk over here. Thank you. My, that's quite a stack of papers. <laughs> Filing. Uh, I'm the records custodian of the Bureau. Twelve years and never misplaced a record. Magnificent. I admire the precise mind, Mr... Uh... Timken. Of course. Now, Mr. Timken, Mr. O'Brien, the editor of the Star Ledger, said I might drop by and investigate a rumor. Only a rumor, mind you, that a message from the, uh, moon... Well, we aren't certain it's from the moon. It may be a bounce. They have bounced radar waves off the moon, you know. Yes, and, I know. I wrote the first newspaper article on it. Really? I'd be interested to read it. I must have a copy in my book. Well, I don't bother. I... Oh, but I insist. Oh, yes. There you are. I'll leave it on your desk. Oh, thank you very much. Now, about this message from the moon, Mr. Timken... Well, now, we don't know for sure, as I said. But I believe that this message, wherever it originates, is from Cornelius Otterburn. The physicist? Oh, do you know him? I once wrote an article on his contributions to nuclear mechanics. A brilliant man, Otterburn. Years ahead of his contemporaries. Mm. Well, whoever is sending those signals, if he isn't on the moon, is at least using the moon as a sounding board, bouncing the signal. But why, Mr. Timken? Why? Well, if you will come here tomorrow night at 8, Mr. Philo, we may learn the answer to that question. I I've arranged with Charlie, our radio man, to let me use the equipment. May I consider this an invitation? You certainly may. Very well, sir. <coughs> Until tomorrow night, then. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Philo. Hmm. Uh, let's see now. Aiken, Abelard, Abramson, Rano, Atchison. Well, that's funny. Now, where did this list of names come from? Paul Ahrens, astromathematician. Robert Simons, electronic engineer. Carl Parker, mining specialist. Well, this must have got mixed up with the papers on my desk by accident. Peculiar list of names. Oh, good morning, Charlie. Oh, uh, hi, Mr. Timken. I see we made the papers. Oh? And how? And as the chief steamed up about it, he really gave me what for. What did the papers say? Oh, mostly ha-ha. Here's a herald. Listen. 
Man on the Moon contacts Missing Persons Bureau. Missing atomic scientists sitting on the moon, say bureau experts, etc., etc. What a panic. Well, no wonder Mr. Wade is hopping. Say, about tonight, Mr. Timken, I don't now, know... Now, you promised you'd give me a key to the radio room. Yeah, but I didn't expect Well, this. I'll take full responsibility Uh-oh. with Mr. Wade. Not the time for the morning broadcast. We got quite a list today. Well, uh, mind if I listen a while? We may hear Otterburn. Well, I ain't self-conscious. Just stick around. Yes. <clears throat> Attention. Attention. This is the Federal Missing Persons Bureau calling all local agencies. Nationwide. This is a coded broadcast. The following persons are missing. Aaron's Dr. Paul, what? five feet five, brown hair, brown eyes, scar on left side of chin, thick glasses. Aaron's. Occupation, astro-mathematician. Missing, missing since six o'clock this morning. Uh, being sought by uh, Bel Air Police. Uh, Charlie. Repeat, Dr. Paul uh, Charlie, Aaron's. shut it off a second. Hold it. A delay, one minute. Listen, Mr. Timkin, it's okay to stay, but you can't interrupt us. This is important. Did you say Dr. Aarons was reported missing this morning? 6 a.m. We got the report from Bel Air less than an hour ago. Are you certain, Charlie? Positive. What is this? Charlie, what's the next name on the list? Uh, let's see. Simons, Robert, engineer. What? Came in less than 20 minutes ago. 20? Hey, what's the matter with you? You look like you've seen a ghost. Nothing, Charlie, except that last night, quite by accident, someone left a list of names on my desk, and that list included the names of those two men who were reported missing within the last hour. What? Oh, that don't sound right to me. Well, it isn't right, Charlie. It leaves a big question to be answered. Who would make up a list of missing persons before they were missing, not after? And you say this list of names was left on your desk accidentally? Well, I believe so, Mr. Wade. Do you have any ideas, Henry? Well, it's hard to say. Mr. Philo left some papers from his briefcase. Mr. Philo? Well, uh, a science feature writer. I see. You were the leak on that story, then? Yes, sir, I'm afraid I was. I didn't think it would be treated as a laughing matter. Well, we'll I... deal with uh, that later. Yes, sir. What's this Philo like? Well, he's, he's a strange old duck. Bald, thick glasses, tall. He walks stooped over... Uh, seems to know a great deal about scientific data, but, of course, being a science writer, he... Is there wouldn't... any other possibility? Well, I believe that this is all hooked up with the broadcast from Otterburn. That seems to be a very remote possibility. Well, <clears throat> the Missing Persons Bureau deals in remote possibilities, Mr. Wade. I do not require a statement of policy. Yes, sir. What's the theory? Well, for some time now, it has been my contention that in a country like ours, where even the cleverest criminal can be ferreted out and located eventually, there is no such thing as a missing person. <sighs> I was afraid of that. Now, uh, for 12 years now, I have kept the central files, where information from all over the country is channeled and recorded. I have made a private study. This is beginning to sound familiar, Henry. And I have discovered that each year, literally thousands of persons vanish, leaving no trace. They are never located. Where do they go? Nobody knows. And? And they disappear in interesting cycles. What sort of cycles? Occupations, for example. One year we'll have a run on, well, say, coal miners. Next year the proportion of engineers increases. And then scientists. And... What do you think happens, Henry? I don't know, Mr. Wade, but I'm beginning to suspect that somebody else has discovered the same phenomenon, even to the point, perhaps, of being able to predict who will turn up among the missing next. Milo? Well, I don't know. But I would like to find out. And you think Otterburn may be a part of this picture? Mr. Wade, I definitely do. Henry, do you honestly expect me to buy an idea like well, that? It is more than I, an idea. The, the two top men on this list are missing, and... Maybe and, so, uh, but the rest of them aren't. Parker, Watson, Gibbs. Why, I saw Parker in the restaurant where I had lunch today. Yes, but... And Mr. if you think Wade, I'm going to make myself a laughingstock by accepting such a crack brain theory... Well, I... Excuse me. Yes. Hello, Wade speaking. Yes? Yes? I see uh, what name? Uh, just a moment. Uh, Henry, let me see that list again. Uh, here you are, sir. Go ahead. I see. I'll get back to you. I uh, guess I owe you an apology, Henry. Sir? Carl Parker was just reported missing. Parker? Third man on your list. Holy mackerel. Exactly. Henry... For a good many years now, I've ridiculed these theories of yours. I don't know. Perhaps I've underestimated you. Maybe this time you've really stumbled onto something. What do you intend to do, Mr. Wade? I don't know. 
I haven't thought it out yet. I, I was planning to listen for another broadcast tonight in the hope that Otterburn might try to contact us again. Good idea. I believe I'll join you. I also invited Mr. Philo, the feature writer. Oh? I'll be glad to meet him. I'm beginning to get interested in you, Mr. Philo. Wait, you don't think... That he's that... mixed up in this? Yes, sir. I don't know, Henry. But it suddenly strikes me that we don't know very much about him, really. We ought to contact the police. No, Henry. I, I no. think we're better off keeping this between ourselves for the moment. We're dealing with the unknown. And in solving an equation for the X factor, it's often easier to limit the number of terms. You follow me? I don't know, Mr. Wade. I... There may be more danger in what you have discovered than you are aware of. Let's keep it quiet. You agree? Maybe you're right, Mr. Wade. I, I hadn't thought of the danger involved. <laughs> Mr. Philo is late. Well, he said he'd be here. He strikes me as a man who keeps appointments. Look out the window. Yes, sir. The moon is almost in direct phase. We can't wait much longer. Well, it's a perfectly clear night for transmission. If anybody's sending, we ought to pick it up with this equipment. You'd better switch on the set. Yes, sir. I never realized how eerie this office could be when it was empty. I left a light in the hall for Mr. Philo when he comes. Are you getting anything? Uh, just some foreign stuff, I think. That's a peculiar transmission sound. Earth. Earth. Now that sounds like something. See if I can work the selector. The moon is in phase. Yes. Hello. Earth. Can you hear me? Uh, I'll try to return. Hello? Hello? Hello. Earth. Uh, hello, do you hear me? Oh, I get you now. Thank God. Uh, who are you? Can you hear me? Uh, who are you? This is Professor Cornelius Otterburn. Hello? Uh, go on, I hear you. Not much time. They're on to me. They've located my sending point. You hear me? Uh, go ahead. Keep talking. I've only enough oxygen for a few minutes more. Well, where are you? I'm on the Earth side of the moon. You get that? The Earth side of the moon. A volcanic crater. Could you start that recorder, Mr. Wade? Uh, go on. Explain, please. Explain, please. Now listen closely. There is an Earth, Earth colony on the moon. There is an Earth colony on the far side of the moon made up of renegade scientists and criminals. P Professor Ernst Halsman... Halsman, he, he died in an insane asylum in 1938. Professor Ernst Halsman discovered nuclear rocket power in 1935. Turned his plans over to escaped inmates of the asylum. They, they took off and set up a colony on the far side of the moon in 1938. Uh, go, go ahead, we're recording you. Each year, they recruit new colonists, colonists from Earth. S slave labor, mostly. Uh, I was kidnapped in 1945. Yes, I, I, I know. Uh, keep talking. They wanted me to work on atomic drive for their flying disc. Uh, Still getting you. Go on. Last month, six others and I escaped. Uh, speak louder. You, you've got to stop them. Stop them. Stop who? The moon colony. Planning to take over the Earth. Invasion. Oh. Hang on. No, 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 no oxygen. Hard to, to, to breathe. Can you? Listen. They, they have agents on Earth. You hear me? Agents on Earth? Well, where? Who? Uh, hello? 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 Agents in... Henry, look out. Someone at the window. Get down. Henry, are you all right? I, yes, I, I, I think so. Shot smashed to the transmitter. And the lights. Strike a match. Careful. It was close. I got a look at him. From the description, it was your Mr. Philo. We got a recording anyway. But, but not the most important part of the message. Poor Otterburn. Suffocating to death. Henry, we've got to get you out of here. You said they have agents. Philo was probably one of them. He'll be looking for you now, trying to kill you. The police... Do you think the police would believe a fantastic story like this? People being kidnapped to the moon as slave labor? Moon colony planning an invasion of the Earth? But Henry, believe me, they'd, they'd trap us into straitjackets before we could finish. We've got to do something. We need time. Time to get proof. Well, you don't think my theory was bunk then? I know it wasn't, Henry. Right now, my only concern is for your safety. But we can't walk out of here. Philo's probably waiting. Listen. 
There's a service elevator that leads to the basement garage. Yeah? We can get down there. There are some delivery trucks parked there all night. We can probably get one started. The garage door's off the ramp, work from the inside. We'll start the mechanism and make a run for it. I, I don't know. I think if we call the police... By the time the police get here, we'll be dead. You think Philo will wait outside all night? Come on. That's an order. Okay. But what about the recording of Otterburn's notes? We'll leave that here in, in the safe in my office. They'll never get into that. Let's go. You buzz the elevator while I hide the recording. This is the basement. Come on. Keep to the side. Yes, sir. Shh. Let's try that delivery truck over there. I'll get in. All right, Henry. You start the mechanism to open the garage door, then jump onto the truck. Yes, sir. We'll make a dash for it. Where can we go? I have a farm outside Chevy Chase. It's private. Miles from the nearest neighbor and completely hidden by trees. We'll run for that. Go ahead. Start the door up. All right. Quick, jump in. Let her go, Henry. Cross your fingers. We made it out all right. Anything doing? There's a blue coop behind us, Mr. Wade. It's easily following. I'll cut up Pennsylvania Avenue. Now Route 1, toward Baltimore. It is following. He turned with us. Can you go faster? Not much faster. Well, he's gaining on us. I've got an idea. Hang on, Henry. Yes. Why'd you stop? I'll turn off the lights. <sighs> it worked. He shot right past us. Now we'll double back and go out another route. I don't see anything. I think we've lost him. Good. I think everything's going to be all right now. We can be at my farm in less than an hour. Not much longer now. Is anyone behind us? I, I thought I saw the blue coop again, but I, I was mistaken. Whew. This place is really hot in the wilderness. We can stay here indefinitely till we'll figure out the next move. Now, just up this dirt road now. There's the house up ahead. You're not going toward it. No, I have a better idea. There's a big abandoned wheat silo on my grounds. It's down a hollow where it can't be seen except in the air. And even then, the oak trees shield it. We'll hide you out there. Now, we leave the truck here. It'll never be seen. Come on. Yes, sir. How did you ever find this place, Mr. Wade? I've always liked seclusion. I bought it about 12 years ago. Come up here in the summertime to get away from it all. There's the silo. Uh, it's certainly well hidden. There's a small door around the side. Come on. Be careful of those bushes. Uh, uh, yes. It's hard to see them in the dark. Do you suppose Philo will find us? I assure you, Henry, Mr. Philo will never find us here. Not in a million years. Here's the door. It's pitch dark. Oh, my arm. I know the way. Just a few steps up and another door. Steel. This is an unusual silo. It's double wall, wood outside, and steel inside. Completely fireproof. An army couldn't wreck it. We're inside the inner shell. Careful. Yes. We're in a circular room. Stay here a moment. I'll go outside and see if the coast is clear. In a moment, your eyes will become accustomed to the darkness. I'll bring back some food and water. Well, don't be long, Mr. Wade. I... This, this place gives me the willies. Just a moment. Mr. Wade. I swear I hear something. Mr. Wade. What's that? There is something. Good Lord. There's someone in here. It's locked. Oh, no. Mr. Wade! Mr. Wade, let me out! I'm 
not alone in here. Mr. Wade. Th this must be a light switch. Thank God. Huh? Oh, no. People. 10, 15, 20. Mr. Wade, help! Help! It'll do you no good to shout, Henry. Mr. Wade, where are you? Outside. Speaking over the intercom. Mr. Wade, there are people in here. 15 or 20 of them. They're... they're, they're Sitting like statues, just, just staring at me. They won't hurt you, Henry. What? They've all been drugged. They're even more helpless than you. But, but, who are they? Permit me to introduce them, Henry, since they're currently unable to introduce themselves. The gentleman seated before you, the one with the scar, is Dr. Paul Ahrens, the astro-mathematician. Next to him is Mr. Robert Simons, electronic engineer. Names on the list. Yes, you're familiar with the rest. They've all been, uh, shall we say, recruited to work with Professor Halsman's group on the moon. Moon? Then you, you... You're one of them. Of course. Oh, yes. There's one whose name was not on our list. If you'll turn around, Henry, you'll recognize the drugged form of your old friend, Mr. Philo. <sighs> Philo? But I... I thought... That he was part of the conspiracy? contrary. His snooping made it necessary for us to include. Please put the man in the window, the one who fired the shot. An agent of mine. The pilot of this ship. Ship? What ship? This silo is camouflaged for a rocket launching platform. In a moment, the roof will slide back for the rocket's takeoff. A rocket ship? In exactly 70 hours, you and your companions will join Professor Otterburn on the moon. But you... You, you can't do this to me! We have done it. No! You see, there was another name omitted in that list. I carelessly mixed up with your papers. That of no. Henry Timken. No! Bon voyage. I won't let you do this! You can't! Please! Please let me out! Let me out, please! It can't happen! Let me out! Let me Since 8 o'clock last night, the following persons. Timken Henry, age 45, height 5 feet 8, 165 pounds, brown eyes, slightly balding. Occupation, records custodian. Repeat, Timken Henry, age 45, height 5 feet 8, 165 pounds. In just a moment, a word about next week's adventure. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Man in the Moon, an original radio drama written by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Louis Van Ruten as Henry, Santos Ortega as the Chief, Ross Martin as Charlie, Sidney Smith as Otterburn, Bob Haig as Jake, Joe DeSantis as Philo, and Ed Latimer as O'Brien. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is an NBC Radio Network production. And now, next week, the sign on the window said Perigi's Wonderful Dolls. A woman and a child waited outside. The little girl peering eagerly through the window and the woman glancing impatiently at her wristwatch, as if expecting someone who was late for an appointment. And there was nothing about Perigi's doll shop to warn them that they were waiting to keep an appointment with doom at... X... 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 Minus... Minus... One... This episode from The Life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. So let's settle back comfortably and listen and... Uh, while you're getting settled, I'd like to know if you like seafood. And by seafood, I mean everything from 
Well, from broiled lobster to fried halibut. Because if you like seafood, any seafood, you'll love it together with Petri California Sauterne. Fish and Petri Sauterne were made for each other. No kidding. Boy, I'll never in my life forget a broiled brook trout on the plate in front of me and a glass of well-chilled Petri Sauterne right next to it. Mm. That fish and that Sauterne. Mm. Petri Sauterne has a pale golden color that's really good to look at. And as for taste, well, that Petri flavor is really something. Take my word for it and try it, won't you? Oh, and I'll tell you something else. Try that Petri Sauterne with chicken sometime. <laughs> Look, I'd better stop before I get hungry all over again, but just remember this. The best friend a good meal ever had is a glass of Petri wine. And now let's keep our appointment with the good Dr. Watson. Come in, come in. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Come over here and join me with a fire. I didn't think it was cold enough for a fire tonight, Doctor. Oh, I suppose it isn't really, but there was one late, so I just couldn't resist putting a match to it. <laughs> Fire's a good accompaniment to storytelling anyway. Uh, yes, my boy, a fire and a glass of port. Uh, care to join me in one? Thanks, Doctor. So, uh, you're going to tell us a sea story tonight? Yes, Mr. Bartell. The whole adventure took place aboard a small steamer as it plowed through the stormy seas of the Indian Ocean. Uh, here's your glass, my boy. Thanks. And uh, what were you and the great Sherlock Holmes doing on the Indian Ocean, may we I ask? We were on our way to Calcutta to solve the case of the vanishing elephant of Pa Butipur. Oh, yes, the story you told us a few weeks ago. That's quite right, my boy. It's in the summer of 1894 that we left Liverpool aboard the steamship Lucifer. It wasn't a large ship, and as both the uh, Mediterranean and the Red Sea proved somewhat, shall we say, unfriendly... I may tell you the first part of the voyage was quite unpleasant. In fact, until we left Aden, I'd spent most of the time in my cabin. I'm not much of a sailor, you know. However, as we headed eastward towards Colombo, the weather cleared up a bit, and I came on desk and joined Holmes. I remember on the second night out of Aden, we paced the decks together. The stars above us twinkled, the promise of a bright tomorrow. And the faint tinkle of a piano being played in the passenger lounge formed a perfect setting for an evening stroll. It only seems like yesterday that Holmes said... Watson, it's good to see you on your feet again. Yes, it's good to be on them, Holmes. It's been a miserable trip for me so far. The captain told me tonight that we can expect good weather between here and Caravati, our next port of call. I thought Colombo was the next stop. And where is Caravati, whatever you call it? Anyway, I never heard of the place. It's a tiny island in the Indian Ocean. It's a British protectorate. Those are the only facts I was able to glean from the encyclopedia and the oh, ship's did you library. Did ask the captain why we're stopping there? No, no, I didn't. Um, as we are traveling incognito, I felt it wiser not to ask too many questions. I find this incognito business something of a strain. Every time a steward calls me Mr. Hamish, I can't think who on earth he's talking uh, uh, to. Ah, uh, well, as I find myself answering to Mr. Mycroft almost automatically. By the way, old chap... Now that you're going to mix with the ship's passengers, I suggest that you adopt a Scotch accent. It would seem more appropriate for a Mr. Hamish, and I don't want anyone aboard to suspect our true identities. Oh, I'll do my best, but I must say, Holmes, I think you're being unnecessarily mysterious. <laughs> Possibly I've been influenced by reading too many of your rather florid stories of our adventures together. My stories are not florid. They're all perfectly true. Oh, don't, don't be angry with me, old chap. Don't be angry, oh, please. Oh, By the way, oh, uh, we'll... Uh, you'll be interested to know that I've... Uh, unearthed a little mystery aboard this I'll boat. I trust you to do that. Where is she? I mean, what, what is it? Oh, you observe that suite of cabins on the bridge deck above us? Yeah? What about them? Well, I've been watching them during uh, my nightly strolls for the past two weeks. The suite is occupied, and uh, yet the blinds are never raised. And I've never seen meals taken in there. I presume, therefore, that it must contain a private galley and a cook. I don't say anything mysterious about that. It's probably occupied by some wealthy invalid. Oh, possibly, possibly. Another interesting fact is that the occupants are not uh, entered on the ship's passenger list. It all sounds very mysterious. There's probably a perfectly simple explanation for it. In any case, you must save your energies for the problem that awaits us in India. You're Mr. Mycroft now, remember that. I will, Mr. Hamish. Uh, Mr. Mycroft? Uh, yes, Mr. Hamish? Would you care to join me for a wee drop of brandy in the smoking room? <laughs> Mr. Hamish, I shall be delighted. <laughs> Ah, oh, this is 
excellent brandy. Excellent. Watson, Watson you notice that rather garrulous gentleman over there in the corner? You mean the one at the table with the oriental-looking fellow? Yes, the talkative man is the ship's doctor, but I haven't seen the other gentleman before on this voyage. I wonder if he's an occupant of the mysterious suite on the bridge deck. Let's go over and talk to him, shall we? And remember the accent, Mr. Hamish. <laughs> and so, Verda, when we landed at Colombo, I decided to take Mrs. Abbott for a moonlight rickshaw drive for the cinnamon gardens. Uh... Uh, did you gentlemen want to see me? Uh, if you'll excuse us, Dr. Harris, my friend Mr. Hamish and I were having a little argument and we thought that perhaps you might be able to settle it for An us. An argument? Oh, I love a good argument. Uh, sit down, gentlemen. This uh, this is Mr. Verder. How do you do, gentlemen? Uh, good evening, sir. My name is Hamish and this is my friend, Mr. Mr. Mycroft. I'm so happy to meet you, gentlemen. Now, how do you know, Mr. Verder? Ah, now, gentlemen, uh, tell me what you're arguing about. Well, not a good argument. Uh, you see, it, it wasn't exactly an argument. My friend Mr. Hamish insists that the Suez Canal was built by a Dutchman in 1870. I'm convinced that it was built by de Lesseps, a Frenchman, in 1869. We, uh, we thought you'd know. <laughs> you flatter me. I'm only a ship's doctor, not an historian. Uh, ask Verdi. He probably knows. Uh, can you settle the question for us, sir? I can, my Mr. Mycroft. Uh, you are almost correct. The canal was opened in 1869 though its construction began ten years previously. De Lesseps, a French engineer, was in charge of the operation. There is a statue of him in Port Said Harbour, built to commemorate his skill and enterprise. Oh, much obliged to you, Mr. Vera. Uh, Hamish, I think that I win my bet. I, my cuff, I'm afraid you do, if you're sure of your facts, Mr. Vera. <laughs> uh, I'm sufficiently sure of them, Mr. Hamish. To venture a small wager myself. No, no, no. I think I'll not make any more bets on the subject, thank you. Uh, well, gentlemen, if you will excuse me, I shall return to my cabin now. Oh, don't go. No, 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 no don't go, sir. You'll make us feel as if we'd driven you away. Oh, not at all, Mr. Hamish. I enjoyed meeting you both, but I have some letters to write. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, he's, he's a charming person. Charming and extremely knowledgeable. Mm, bit of a bore, if you ask me. Uh, you two fellas enjoyed your trip? I'm just beginning to. It takes a little time to get my sea legs, you know. Uh, Dr. Harris, how long have you been on this ship? Four years. Uh, this is my 23rd trip east on the Lucifer. Uh -huh. Why? Well, uh, there's something that puzzles me on board this ship. I'm sure that you would explain it to me. And what is it? Well, the uh, suite of cabins on the bridge deck. Who occupies them? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to know? I don't know we would, and that's why my friend asked you. Well, I'll tell you. Though it's supposed to be a secret. But there'll be no harm in telling you now, for we're dropping anchor off the island of Cavarati in the morning. In that suite of rooms, in that suite of rooms, is the Rani of Cavarati herself. She has her own staff of servants and everything. What do you think of that? Oh, how very interesting. And is the Oriental gentleman who uh, left the table when we arrived part of our entourage? He is, sir. He's a sort of uh, prime minister of Cavarati. This whole trip of theirs is very hush-hush. Rani returning to her country, afraid someone might make an attack on her life. Have to keep it all hush-hush. Cavarati is an island that's had a lot of trouble. <laughs> you seem to be remarkably well informed about the place, sir. Yeah, I should be. I used to practice there in my younger days. Oh, really? How very interesting. Yes, I could tell you strange tales about the island. I remember... Oh, hello. See that fellow coming into the lounge? You mean the big man with the, the grey hair? Yes. That's Sir Christopher Wyatt. Owns all the tea plantations on Cavarati. He's a dull fella, but I'll call him over. Uh, Wyatt, come over and join us. Be careful. You talk your head off if you give him half a chance. Ah, draw up a chair, Wyatt. We were just just talking about Cavarati. It seems to me that would be a good subject to keep away from. At least till after tomorrow, Harris. What do you mean? You know perfectly well what I mean. I should have thought that after your own experience on Cavarati, you'd have learned a little discretion. You're talking like a schoolmaster, Wyatt. Why don't you just sit down, have a drink, and be friendly? Thank you. I prefer my own company. Pompous ass. <laughs> you and Sir Christopher don't seem on the best of terms, Doctor. I know too much about him. He's afraid of me. That's what he is. Uh, look at this girl coming into the room. Great scut. She's good looking. Judging by our oriental costume, she must be a member of the Rani's retinue. <laughs> She's coming to our table. Yes, my dear. What is it? Which of you gentlemen is Mr. Mycroft, please? I am. My mistress sends her compliments and asks that you will call on her in her suite. And who is your mistress, may I ask? Her Highness, the Rani of Cavarotti. Oh, I shall be delighted. Please tell the Rani that I shall pay my respects without delay. We will join her in a few minutes. Very well, Mr. Mycroft. <laughs> Holmes, 
Holmes, this is pretty exciting. The girl that just brought us the message was a stunning creature. Imagine what the Rani herself must be like. Oh, what an incurable romanticist you are, Watson. I suppose you picture the Rani clad in oriental splendor, reclining like an odorless on silken cushions. Oh, no, no, there's no need to make fun of me, old fellow. <laughs> oh, here we are, the cabin. Ah, oh, it is you, gentlemen. Follow me, please. Her Highness, the Rani of Kavarati. All right, Raduna, you can offer it. Yes, Your Highness. Well, me lads, don't look so startled. Come in and sit down. Your Highness, I... Uh, uh... What's the matter? What's the matter? Don't I fit into your picture of a Rani? What did you expect? A slant-eyed beauty with a veil and big hips? Well, I've got the big hips, all right. Uh, your Highness... Um, <laughs> oh, I... never mind, what? Your Highness. Sit yourselves down and talk free and easy like. I may as well begin by telling you that I know who you both are. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Oh, dear me, dear me. Oh, I've seen you in the good old days in London, you know. Uh, may I ask if our visit is purely a social one, or are you in need of uh, professional advice? Oh, a little of both, Mr. Holmes, a little of both. And we'll start off with being social. Bruma. Mem Saib. Champagne. Botachi, Mem Saib. If you will pardon my asking you, madam, but uh, I have not seen you before, somehow. <laughs> Oh, that's a question I'm always having to answer. Yes, you probably have, Dr. Watson. You see, I was in the chorus at Daly's Theatre in London for a, <laughs> quite a few years <laughs> until the Roger of Cavarotti decided I'd look better on his island than I did in front of the footlights. Uh, your husband, the Roger, <laughs> is dead, isn't he? Yes, he, he was killed playing polo. Champagne, ma'am, say. Polo. Champagne, for the sector. Atcha. He doesn't speak English, so I'll get along with telling him my troubles. Mr. Holmes... Somebody's trying to kill me. Kill you? Good God. Uh, may I ask what reason you have for saying that, madam? You may, Mr. Holmes. <clears throat> Before I left England, I had threatening letters warning me that if I ever went back to Cavarotti, I'd never get to the island alive. I got another letter in Port Side that said the same thing. You kept these letters, I trust? No, I didn't. I tore them up. I never did pay attention to letters that weren't signed. Well, that's a great pity, madam. Those letters might have been invaluable. Well, it's too late to think about that now, Dr. Watson. Here's what's on my mind. I land at Cavarotti in the morning, and if anyone's up to a bit of no good, tonight's their last chance. You had destroyed the threatening letters, madam, thereby indicating that you did not believe in the threats, and yet you now appear to feel that you are in danger. I wonder what made you change your mind. The Ace of Spades. Yes? I don't understand you, madam. In the last two days, every time I tell my fortune, I get the Ace of Spades. <laughs> now, you know what that means. Death. Oh, come now, madam. If you'll pardon my saying so, that's a very childish superstition. Well, the cards have never lied to me yet. Oh, you can laugh at it if you like, but I know. <laughs> well, do you mind if I ask you a few questions? Anything you like, Mr. Holmes. Fire away. How long is it since you were in Cavarotti? Mm, about 18 months. We were in England when my husband died, and I couldn't face the idea of going back to that island alone. In three months ago, Verda... Oh, he's the chief minister of Cavarotti. Yes, 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 madam. We met him for a moment in the lounge. Oh, well, ago. Verda came over to England to persuade me it was my duty as the Ronnie to go back. I see. As far as you know, have you any enemies among the passengers on board the ship? Oh, that's an odd one to answer, Mr. Holmes. But I can tell you right here in my suite there's someone who doesn't like me. The girl, Raduna, the one that brought you my message. She was in love with a Roger herself. Well, I know she hates me, even though she did stay with me in England after my husband died. Mm, how about Ferda, your minister? <laughs> Oh, he's all right. My husband thought the world of him, and he's been wonderful to me. He came from Cavarotti recently, you say, to persuade you to return there. That's right, Mr. Holmes. Well, Bruma seems to be all right after drinking that champagne, so it'll be safe for us to have some now. Champagne au Mlog Kedor? Botache, Mem Saib. Oh, I've been burning with curiosity to know why you gave him a glass of champagne a few minutes ago, and yet we <laughs> didn't have any. Well, surely that's obvious, Watson. Mm -hmm. uh, Fuma is the official poison taster, isn't he, mm -hmm. madam? That's right, Mr. Holmes. He tastes everything I eat or drink before I do. And if it doesn't affect him, then I know it's safe. Better brought him over to England when he came to fetch me. On the island of Cavarotti, poisoning's quite an arbor, you know. There were uh, two people in the smoking room tonight who seemed to know quite a lot about your island. The ship's doctor, a rather garrulous gentleman by the name of Harris, and Sir Christopher Wyatt, who owns tea plantations on the island. Do you know either of them, madam? I should say I do, both of them. Dr. Harris isn't any good. 
He was on the island for a bit, but he got into some kind of trouble, and my husband had him thrown out. Mm, and how about Sir Christopher Wyatt? <laughs> oh, Chris is all right. I saw quite a bit of him in London after my husband's death. <laughs> As a matter of fact, well, if I weren't going back to Cavarotti, I, I don't think he'd be on the boat at all. He hasn't been there for over five years, ever since he had a row with my husband over the wages he paid the native labor. It seemed to me that several people aboard this boat have a personal interest in the island of Cavarati. Interests that might uh, be influenced by your death. That's yes, just what I was going to say, madam. I think we should uh, keep an eye on you. Oh, that's just what I was hoping you'd say, doctor. You see, I'm giving a bit of a supper party tonight. All the people we've been talking about have been invited. And I thought... Well, I thought if you two were to be here, perhaps you'd be on the lookout for any any funny business. How about it? Well, of course we'll come, won't we, Holmes? I think it might be a good idea, though I would suggest that we retain our incognitos as Mr. Hamish and uh, Mr. Mycroft. Well, whatever you say, Mr. Holmes. And now, let's have that champagne. You know, Holmes, I remember the Raleigh when she was in the chorus at Daly's. She looked stunning in tights. There was one night I... Yes, no, I'm old chap, don't mind. At what? the moment, there's a question I want to ask you. Oh, sir? Is your medical bag fully equipped with all the antidotes to poison? Poison? <clears throat> it's ridiculous. How could the Rani be poisoned when she has a poison taster? My dear Watson, you mustn't... Hey, hello! Help! Help! What the blazes is... Come on, Watson. That cry came from the companionway. There are two figures struggling by the rail there. Good heavens! One of them has pushed the other down the companionway. Ah! Good Lord. His skull smashed in. I'm afraid what that he... It? What's happened? Sir Christopher Wyatt. What are you doing here? I was taking a stroll. I heard a yell from this direction and came there as fast as I could. Great Scott, this fellow's bleeding badly. We must get the ship's doctor at once. That's hardly necessary, I fear, Sir Christopher. What do you mean? In the first place, this man is dead. In the second place, he is the ship's doctor. We'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second, so I'm just going to ask you to do one thing for me. Well, I should say for yourself. Tomorrow night, if you're having meat or any meat dish for dinner... Why not open up a bottle of Petri California Burgundy? That wonderful, rich, red Petri Burgundy will turn your dinner into a real feast. You see if it doesn't. Because there's nothing like a good wine with good food. And I know your family gets good food, and I know that Petri Burgundy is a good wine. In fact, it's a perfect mealtime wine. Try it and see. And now, Dr. Watson, tell us what happened next. You said you found the ship's doctor dead at the foot of the companionway? Yes, Mr. Bartell. His neck had been broken instantly. Imagine there was a good deal of excitement aboard. No, my boy. As a matter of fact, there wasn't. We managed to get the body back to its cabin without attracting attention. Holmes, after revealing his true identity, was able to persuade the captain to hush up the killing until after the Rani's party had taken place. Oh, he didn't want to scare the murderer, I guess. W what happened next, Doctor? Holmes and I returned to our cabin to dress for the party. Holmes, I remember, was in a state of suppressed excitement. He spoke quietly and deliberately. Watson, surely it's obvious why the doctor was murdered? Well, it isn't obvious to me. But it's all. elementary, my dear fellow. If you are planning a subtle murder by poison, how wise to remove the one man who might save the victim's life, a doctor. Oh, you keep harping on poisoning. It seems to me to be the last way a murderer would try to dispose of the Rani. Everything she touches is first tested by the poison tester. Exactly. That's why I call it a subtle murder attempt. Didn't you notice the physical attributes of Frumer, the poison tester? Uh, which in particular, huh? Well, his unusually glossy hair, his remarkably clear complexion, his plump figure. Look here. Just tell me one thing, will you? What's that? I presume that in your medical bag you have a supply of magnesia. Naturally. Do you also have hydrated ferric oxide? Yes, I do. Splendid. Then be off to the party. Oh, funny things to take to a party, I must That's say. That's true, my dear fellow, but I'm afraid that this party may not prove as convivial as the Rani thinks. Holmes, it's nearly one in the morning. 
Everything seems to be going splendidly. It seems to be, Watson, but keep your eyes on the Rani. Yes, I have been. The poison taste has tested everything that passed her lips. Uh, we Duck and Doris to you, Sir Christopher. Uh, you having a good time? Yes, indeed. Thank you, Mr. Hamish. How about you, Mr. Mycroft? Oh, the Rani's a perfect hostess. Who could help having a good time? I don't think that girl, Regina, should be here, though. I don't want to be pompous, but after all, she's only a glorified servant. Oh, possibly the laws of etiquette are not so strict in ca- <coughs> Cavarati as they are in London, Sir Christopher. Oh, perhaps you're right. But I don't trust the girl. <coughs> There's something shifty about her. I've told the Rani more than once. Oh, well, I suppose it's none of my business. I think I'll try and persuade the Rani to sing one of her old songs. Yeah. He doesn't trust Raduna, and I don't trust him. I don't think it was an accident that we found him near the body of Dr. Harris. Shh, shh. Here comes Vera. I trust you gentlemen are enjoying yourself. Very much, Mr. Vera, thank you. I imagine you must be excited at the prospect of returning to Calabati. I am, Mr. Mycroft. Though I only left it three months ago... It has seemed more like three years. Do you can what time we'll arrive there? I am told that we shall be there in five hours, Mr. Hamish. Oh, look, look, look. The Rana's at the piano. She must be going to give us a tune. <laughs> yes. Let's move a little closer, shall we? Chris here has asked me to sing something. Well, my voice isn't what it used to be, and don't I know it. But me spirit's the same, and that's enough to put a number over. So, old tight boys, here we go. My sweetheart's the man in the moon. I'm going to marry him soon. Two would fill me with bliss just to give him one kiss. But I know that a dozen I never would miss. I'll go up in a great big... Oh. Great Scott, she... she... Quick, Watson, your medical bag. I'll lock the door. Right, your Holmes. Bring some water, please. Help me. Oh, please, help What's the me. What is the matter? Don't be frightened, madam. I'll take care of you. Thirsty. Give me water. She wants water. Oh, such pain. All the symptoms of arsenic poisoning. Now I know why Holmes asked me if I had any magnesia and phenic oxide. Do something for me, doctor. I'm dying. Don't worry, Your Highness. You're not going to die. Going to live, Holmes. Ah, oh, gracious me, I'm tired. Just touch and go there for a while, though. Well done, Watson, old chap. Well done. Now that she's out of danger, why can't we all go back to our cabins? It's nearly dawn, and we've been locked in here since one o'clock. You've no right to do this, you know. Possibly not, Sir Christopher, but there's a murderer in this cabin, and I don't intend to let him escape. Mr. Holmes, what happened? How could I have been poisoned when Fruma tasted everything first? Why wasn't he poisoned? For a very simple reason, Your Highness. The murderer has been conditioning Fruma for over a year. What, what do you mean? He's been feeding him gradually increasing doses of arsenic until he has finally become immune to the poison. Great Scott, I never thought of that. Fruma's glossy hair, his complexion and stout figure are all typical of a person who consumes arsenic regularly. But who could have done it? Only one person had the opportunity. Well, tell us who that person is. No, not you, Sir Christopher, not you. For you haven't been on the island for years, whereas... Fruma returned from Calabati, but three months ago. Raduna has also been in London with her mistress for the past 18 months, remember? The answer is obvious. You did it, Verda. You brought the taster over when you came to fetch me. You'd prepared him for the year beforehand. Of course I did. No white Rana will ever rule over Cavarati. And you murdered Dr. Harris. Equally true. Mr. Holmes... Give me the key to the door, oh, please. Yeah. Oh, no. Huh? Do not come near me. Oh. Please throw it on the floor. Oh. Do not hesitate. <laughs> you see this revolver? I should have no compunction in using it, I assure you. How do you expect to escape, Yoda? The key, please. Thank you. You'll never get away with this murder, you devil. But I shall. We are now in the harbor of Cavarati. I shall swim ashore and arrange your welcome, my dear Rane. Turn your backs, please. Turn them. Thank you. Goodbye. He's gone. Come on, Watson. After him. You, 
You have your revolver, Watson? Yes, but I didn't get a chance to draw it. He had me covered. Well, draw it now, old fellow. Aim for a leg or an arm and don't hesitate to shoot. There he is, up by the lifeboat. He's clambering up on the rail. Where is he? Where did he go? Out there on the rail above us, madam. He's going to dive. Give me that revolver, Dr. Watson. Quick, that's it. Come down off there, Verda. Fools, meddlers, keep out of my affairs. There he goes. He's dived. Ah! Madam, you shot to kill. Of course I did, Mr. Holmes. Remember that we're now in Cavarotti waters and that I, though I may not look like it at the moment, I am still the Ronnie of Cavarotti. <laughs> Say, that, that was a swell story, Doctor. It had a lot of color and quite a bit of action. <laughs> color and a bit of action? Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you liked it, my boy. Oh, I did. Say, you know, that's not a bad idea. I mean, uh, having someone taste everything before you eat it. Oh, it's a very old idea, very old. Very common, too, years ago. You know the kind of job I'd like? No, what's, uh, what's that? I'd like to be the official taster for the Petri family. Boy, just think of all the Petri wine I'd get to taste. Petri to the right of me. Petri to the left of me. What a life. What wine? Yeah, I wouldn't mind having that job myself. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> the Petri family, you know, really knows how to make good wine. They've been making wine for generations. And because they've always owned and operated their own business ever since it was started way back in the 1800s, well, the Petri family has sure piled up plenty of skill and experience. Yes, they've been handing down in the family from father to son, from father to son the fine art of turning luscious grapes into delicious wine. That's why you can't go wrong with any Petri wine. It must be good, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, uh, Doctor, what new story do you have lined up for us next well, week? Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you an adventure that Sherlock Holmes and I had many years ago. It concerns a series of bonfires, an underground cellar full of gunpowder, and a strange death on the rooftops of London. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story The Adventure of the Mazarin Stone. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This is Ronald Coleman, inviting you to radio's most dramatic half hour, Favorite Story. According to that connoisseur of mysteries, Alexander Wolcott, the story we're bringing you in this half hour is the best whodunit ever written. Mr. Russell Krauss, the distinguished playwright, chose it as his favorite story, The Moonstone of Wilkie Collins. In certain parts of India, there are rumors in hushed tones about a certain yellow diamond, larger than the Koh-i-Noor, more perfect than the Cullinan, more richly storied than the Sansi, which once hung about the throat of Queen Elizabeth of England. 
The earliest known traditions of this gem describe it as gleaming from the forehead of the four-handed Indian goddess of the moon. From its color, which grew and faded in brilliance with the waxing and waning of the moon, it became known as the moonstone. In a shrine inlaid with precious stones, under a roof supported by pillars of gold, sits the moon goddess, her eyes closed, the ever-wakeful diamond in her forehead, looking out over the bowed heads of worshippers in her temple. The Brahmins say that Vishnu, the preserver, breathed divinity into the moonstone, and whatever mortal shall touch that sinister stone will find disaster and sudden death. Genghis Khan tried to carry the moonstone back to Xanadu, but he died before it reached his caves of ice. The Islam conqueror Mahmud of Ghizni tore the stone from the statue's forehead and was found strangled in his sleep at the dark of the moon. For another awesome adventure of the moonstone, I commend you to Mr. Wilkie Collins. have to excuse me. My boat sails in an hour. I have very little time. Oh, Mr. Blake, you have no less time than I, and no more. Here in India, you must have learned that time is as endless as the river Ganges, which cannot be hurried in its course and cannot be stayed. Who are you? Why do you come uninvited to my hotel room? I've come to warn you your life is in great danger. Why? You have offended the goddess of the moon. I have no time for superstitious ravings. Now get out. I have bags to pack. I'm leaving for England. You will die, Franklin Blake. Very well, I shall die. Men do. You and whoever touches it shall be cursed. It will wither you as the frost withers the lotus in the desert night. To touch it is to go mad. To touch what? In the Hindu temple of the moon in the province of Katiawa sits the granite image of the moon goddess, her forearm stretching toward the four corners of the earth. And for eleven centuries, she has worn in her forehead the moonstone. I know nothing of this. <laughs> you know nothing of a yellow-white diamond which shimmers with the luster of the Queen of Night? Get out! You do not know that the shrine of Katiawa has been robbed, desecrated, and the diamond snatched from the forehead of the moon goddess? You accuse me? I accuse no one. But do you imagine, Franklin Blake, that the moon goddess will suffer to lose her moonstone? Unrevenged. Don't prattle to me of moon goddesses. Do you fancy that the priest of Katiawa will rest until the moonstone again reposes in its sacred shrine? If you do not leave me, I shall ask the hotel authorities to remove you forcibly. I shall go. Have a pleasant voyage to England, Mr. Blake. For I promise you, it is a voyage to disaster. Franklin, darling. Rachel, my oh, sweet. My oh, precious, I want to kiss for every hour I've been away from you. Oh, it's been an eternity. It has. You have no idea how difficult it is for a girl, Franklin, to be 10,000 miles away from the man she's going to marry. But I'm home, darling. That's all that matters. We'll publish the bans immediately. And in a month, the Church of England will miraculously transform Miss Rachel Verinder into Mrs. Franklin Blake. Now, you must tell me what's in the boxes. Presents for the loveliest young lady in the British Empire. Here, this one's from me. Oh, it has the scent of India about it. Oh, Franklin, it's precious. It's a good luck Buddha. Rub his tummy and he'll bring you the best luck in the world. <laughs> Guaranteed. So the natives say. Oh, thank you, dear. I shall treasure this always. What's in the little black box? I don't know. It's from your great Uncle Jonathan. Uncle Jonathan? But he's been dead for three years. Well, his solicitor in Calcutta said I must deliver this to you. How odd. 
And he warned me to take particularly good care of it, so I didn't trust it with my trunks. I kept it with my personal things. And Uncle Jonathan, whatever could it... Good Lord. Can it be real? I don't know. I've never seen a diamond so yellow. See how it glitters in the candlelight. I had no idea I was carrying anything so... so priceless. Oh, it must be worth a fortune. Wait, there's a note. What does it say? It's from Uncle Jonathan. It must have been written just before he died. To my dearest Rachel, I bequeath my love and the moonstone. The moonstone? What was that? Oh, my little good luck Buddha. It's split in two. Do you think it's genuine, Mr. Abelwhite? Yes, Godfrey. Do you think it's real? Oh, unquestionably. <laughs> I'm quite a judge of gems, though, especially diamonds. I purchased a valuable pendant as a Christmas present for the late Mrs. Abelwhite. May God rest her. Cost me oh, 200,000 guineas, but this stone, why? I would estimate it is even more perfect than the Koh-i-Noor and of greater size. Worth, uh, how much would you say? My dear Franklin, I'm not a diamond merchant. I'm a mere dabbler in charities. Uh -huh. But I should guess this moonstone of yours, Rachel, would fetch a, a million pounds. A million? Mm, possibly a million, too. A handsome diary, I must say. I'm a very fortunate young lady, Godfrey. And uh, Franklin is a very fortunate young man. Abel White, I trust that you don't insinuate I would marry Rachel for her fortune. I insinuate? You gave the thought words, Mr. Blake. See here, I won't be insulted by gentlemen, anyone. Gentlemen, oh, gentlemen, stop didn't this didn't bickering. Frankly, I'm surprised. Cousin Godfrey said nothing to offend you. Now shake hands and say you're sorry. I'm sorry. Forgive me, Abel White. Didn't mean to say anything out of line. I, I've just been all a little jumpy since I got back from India. <laughs> well, that's all right, old man. Well, I'll say good night. Good night, Cousin Godfrey. I have to get some sleep, you know. Uh, that's what you need, Blake. Uh, sleep. Sleep? Oh. oh. Poor Franklin. What's the matter with you? Oh, nothing but India fever, darling. A few more weeks of bracing English air, a few more weeks of being with you, and I'll be myself again. But I've had the most dreadful time sleeping. I promise you, you shall sleep tonight. Oh, if I only could. Rosanna! Rosanna! Yes, Miss Rachel? Will you bring a packet of sleeping powders for Mr. Blake? For Mr. Blake? If you'd be so kind. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Strange child. Is she new to the household? No, Franklin. Don't you remember her? Before you went away to India. Little Rosanna? Oh, she's quite grown up now. Quite. Hmm. Now, darling, where are you going to keep the moonstone? I don't know. In my jewel casket, I suppose. Oh, but you mustn't. Well, why not? Or would you leave a million pounds where any servant girl could pop it under her apron while she dusted your room? Well, would you have me lock it up in a safe? Naturally. Oh, how distrustful you are, my dear. This is not a hotel. No one's going to run off with my diamond. But a little caution, Rachel, after all. If... Why are you so concerned about the moonstone, Franklin? It's mine, darling, not yours. Well... Mr. Blake. Oh, the sleeping powders, Franklin. Oh, thank you. Here you are, sir. Why, Rosanna, how your hand is shaking. Why, it's nothing. I'm quite all right. Forgive me, sir. Forgive me, Mr. Blake. Well, what's wrong with her? Don't you recognize the symptoms, my dear? No. The girl's falling in love with you. Oh. Go to bed, darling. <laughs> Sleep well. Wrong here. What time is it? It's past 3 a.m., Blake. Godfrey saw Rosanna on the stairs, so he waited for her house. Well, perhaps she was sleepwalking. Were you sleepwalking, child? I hardly think so, Blake. But 
because I saw her coming out of your bedroom. But I've been sound asleep. Had a heavy dosage of sleeping powders. I would have... Good Lord, the moonstone. Where did you put it, Rachel? You know where I put it. Your jewel casket. Quick. We must find out if it's still there. Now, Franklin, don't go in my room. I must. Darling, if your diamond has been stolen... We... Good Lord. What is it, Blake? Look in the jewel casket. I know. The moonstone is gone. I'm a respectable gentleman, sir. I refuse to be questioned like a common thief. I'm sorry, Mr. Abelwhite, but a priceless diamond belonging to Miss Rachel Verinder has vanished. You were in the house at the time it was stolen. The government authorities insist that you cooperate with us in attempting to locate the gem. I do not understand how this is any concern of the government authorities. I called Sergeant Cuff into this investigation, Rachel. He's here at my request. You had no business calling him, Franklin. I would gather from your tone, Miss Verinder, that you have no desire to recover the moonstone, as it's called. I refuse to answer. Hmm? Was the gem insured? Uh, no. I had just arrived with it from India. We hadn't had time to insure it. Could it have been mislaid? Miss Verinder, with your permission, I'd like to look through your closets and wardrobe, just to make sure... No. Rachel. Sergeant Cuff may not examine any part of my wardrobe. But my... Well, this makes things rather difficult. But what about the servant girl, Rosanna? You may search my room, sir. I don't know anything about the diamond. Not anything. I didn't even know there was such a thing in the house. Mm -hmm. Mr. Abelwhite? I am a wealthy man, sir. I've no need to steal diamonds to increase my fortune. Mm. Mr. Blake, what have you to say? Well, I... What's that? It was Faith. I saw Faith near the window. Night prowl. Quick, Sergeant, out the back way. Whoever it is, we must hold them. Question. Stop, whoever you are. Don't try to run away. We'll fire on you. The Indian. May I introduce myself? My name is Baru, priest of the goddess of the moon. Ah, Mr. Blake. I believe we have met before in your hotel room in Calcutta. What are you doing here? My mission is identical with the one that concerns you, Sergeant Cuff. I, too, am looking for the Moonstone. Whenever a jewel disappears, there you have a story. Whether it happens in the daily news, a novel by your bedside, or on this program. A gem belonging to Miss Rachel Verinder, the Moonstone, has vanished. And the eminent Sergeant Cuff of Scotland Yard is on the trail of the famous diamond. We bring you Act Two of Mr. Russell Krause's favorite story, The Moonstone. Miss Verinder this afternoon. I don't know, Sergeant. She won't see me. She won't speak to me. She's locked herself in her room. Why? I don't know. I have no idea. Came back here to England expecting to be married at once. Expecting to find happiness. Instead... <gasps> What's the matter, Mr. Blake? The Indian. This is exactly what he predicted. A voyage to disaster. Where is he? Do you have him in custody, Sergeant? Our Indian friend, of course not. But don't you suspect him of the robbery? Oh, I suspect everyone, Mr. Blake. I can't throw every suspect into prison. And frankly, I don't think that the Indian could possibly have stolen the moonstone. But he followed me all the way from Calcutta. He had every reason to steal the diamond. Yes, yes, he has every reason to depart for India the instant the diamond's delivered into his hands. He's still here. Therefore, I conclude he is not the thief. Then who did steal it? Where is the diamond now? It's your responsibility, Sergeant, to have it returned to Miss Verinder. Even though the lady herself shows no interest in helping us find the stone. <sighs> Such is the lot of a British detective. But no matter. Rachel. I will answer no questions. Rachel, for the love of heaven, don't treat me like a stranger. 
What have I done to you? Why are you so cold? I will answer no questions. I'm leaving the house for London immediately. Miss Verdinder. Yes, Sergeant Carr. This uh, unseemly haste cannot help arousing certain suspicions. You suspect me of stealing my own diamond? I only suspect that you know a great deal more about the disappearance of the moonstone than you're willing to tell. I have nothing whatsoever to say. I shall be in the garden, Franklin. Will you call me when the carriage arrives? Yes, of course, Rachel. Now, come with me, Blake. Hurry. Where? To Miss Rachel's room. This may be our only chance to find what she's hiding from us. Oh, locked. Of course it's locked. Rosanna. Miss Verinder's things are all packed and ready to be taken to London. Rosanna, we must find Miss Rachel's diamond. You have a key to your mistress's room, haven't you? But you can't have it. I won't let you in. But for the sake of recovering a fortune, Rosanna, something worth a million pounds has been stolen. I won't let you in. Please don't ask it. Please, Mr. Blake. For your own sake. For my sake? Hello. What is it, Sergeant? This door. Has it been freshly painted? <gasps> Why, yes, I believe Rachel said something to me about it. The door to her room was freshly lacquered just yesterday evening. Then the paint would not have been dry at the time the robbery was committed. Quite right. This sort of lacquer takes about 12 hours to set, I believe. And this paint smear by the edge of the door may very well have been made by the person who stole the moonstone from Miss Verinder's jewel case. <gasps> no, don't listen to him, Mr. Blake. He's talking nonsense. Quiet, Rosanna. Well, you're quite right, Sergeant. The paint is smeared. And no. if we can find a garment with a paint smear on it, the chances are excellent that the owner of that garment is the person who stole the moonstone. Rosanna, come back. Stop her. Don't let her get away. Rosanna. Oh, you're hurting me. What do you know about this? Tell me. Don't threaten her, Blake. Get the keys from her if she has them. No. Yep. No, I Give... beg you, Mr. Blake. Don't go into Miss Rachel's room. Give me those no. keys. <laughs> there you are, Sergeant. <laughs> ah, here's her luggage. Let's go through it together, quickly. All right. Well, there doesn't seem to be anything here. Keep looking in the other bags. Look for a garment with a brown paint smear on it. Ah, here's something. No, That's please. what she's been hiding. A dressing gown. Uh -huh. The paint smear seems to match. Are there any initials on it? Ah. F.B. Sergeant Cuff. This dressing gown... Belongs to me. <laughs> this is ridiculous. I couldn't have stolen the moonstone. I was asleep. Were you, Mr. Blake? Certainly. I didn't wake up until I heard Rosanna scream in the hallway. Let me think. Oh, uh, I'd complained about not sleeping, and Rachel rang for the servant, and Rosanna came and brought me some sleeping powders. Ah. I remember... Her hand shook as she handed me the glass. I thought it was curious, and Rachel offered the absurd explanation that poor Rosanna was infatuated with me. Mr. Blake, I think I have a solution to this mystery. You know who stole the moonstone? Not exactly, but I have a plan which may tell us how the diamond disappeared. your trip to London by this one night, Miss Verinder. Kind. Shh. You left me no alternative, Sergeant. You take complete charge of my own house, refuse to summon me a carriage... It's for your benefit, Miss Verinder, that I've asked you to watch with me here tonight. What do you expect to see? I don't know precisely. But we've tried this evening to reenact, as nearly as possible, the events which took place on the night the diamond was stolen. Mr. Blake is retired at the same time as he did on that night. He took exactly the same sleeping potion. We have placed a paste replica of the moonstone in your jewel case. And now, we have nothing to do but wait. Watch the hallway and see what happens. Sergeant, no matter what happens, 
No matter what you see, I want you to know that that Franklin Blake is not a thief. We'll soon know. The door to his room is opening. Franklin! He's wearing the dressing gown. He's going straight to your room. His eyes are so glassy. He's sleepwalking. He doesn't know what he's doing. Now, see? He brushes against the door of your room, the door which was covered with wet paint. He'll take the diamond out of the jewel box, just as he did before. You saw him steal it then, the night the moonstone disappeared? Yes. But you wouldn't tell anyone because... Because I love him. Oh, if he'd steal from me, he could never be a faithful husband. So how could I marry him? But I could never accuse Franklin as a criminal. He's not a criminal. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's completely asleep. If, if Franklin took the diamond in his sleep, then, then what became of it? That's what we hope to find out. But how can I we find the... Put the diamond in a safe place. It's an anxiety complex. He's here. worried about your leaving the moonstone in a jewel I box unlocked. the diamond and lock it in the safe. That's exactly the way he did it. He lifted the lid of my jewel box and took the stone out. But I didn't know he was sleepwalking. Well, what did you do after that? Well, I noticed the paint smear on the door, and, and I knew Franklin's dressing gown must have done it. I knew this would incriminate him, and so I called my maid servant. Rosanna? Yes. She went into Franklin's room and took his dressing gown, and I hid it among my things. And Abel White saw Rosanna leaving Blake's room. But where was Abel White? Abel White? Cousin Godfrey, where are you? You were here before. Godfrey? You took the diamond, Godfrey. He's dropped it. Just as he did before. Only Abel White was there to snatch it away. But why would Cousin Godfrey steal my diamond? Why? Because he was desperate for money. His philanthropies were just a cover-up, Miss Verinder, the whitewash for his financial manipulations. He'd suffered bad reverses. He was seriously in debt. He was in the hall that night, waiting to steal the gem himself, when Blake became his unknowing accomplice. Yes, Abel White is the man who stole your moonstone. Oh, thank heaven it wasn't, Franklin. Franklin! Oh, my darling. What? What? Oh. <laughs> what, what, what is... I, I don't understand. What am I doing here? <laughs> You've been sleepwalking, Mr. Blake. I have? Oh, Franklin, darling. And I thought you had stolen my diamond. <laughs> You can understand, I think, how delighted I was to have Rachel embrace me. To know that the marriage I'd look forward to during the long months in India was soon to take place. As for the Moonstone, well, Godfrey Abelwhite took it to London, then attempted to leave with it for Amsterdam. But he was found murdered, and the gem was taken from him. The murderer was never discovered. But Sergeant Cuff uncovered evidence that the man was of swarthy complexion and answered to the description of the Hindu high priest who had followed me from Calcutta to England. No one knows where the moonstone is today, but travelers from the inland plateaus of Katyawa tell me that there stands behind a curtain of trees a shrine to the goddess of the moon. On a high throne is the dreadful statue, its four arms reaching toward the four corners of the earth, and... In its forehead, the gleaming yellow diamond called the Moonstone. Is it still there, the Moonstone? I do not know. The years pass and repeat each other. The same events revolve in the cycles of time. What will be the next adventures of the Moonstone? Who can tell? <laughs> You've been listening to The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins, the favorite story of Mr. Russell Krauss. Sergeant Cuff was a versatile young man from Chicago named Marvin Miller. And from Weems, Scotland, equally versatile, came Thomas Freeburn Smith, who played Franklin Blake. We all hope you enjoyed our favorite story production of The Moonstone. If you dial this way next week, you'll hear Jane Austen's touching and amusing story about how a mother succeeded in marrying off a house full of daughters. Pride and Prejudice, the favorite story choice of the famous American artist and scenic designer, Mr. Oliver Smith, 
We hope you'll be listening. Save both time and money in waxing floors. Use economical no-rubbing Aero Wax. Just apply it, and in six to nine minutes, it dries itself to a hard, lustrous finish that saves countless scrubbings. Makes dingy floors shine like new. Yet Aero Wax costs only twenty-five cents a pint. Try Aero Wax, A E R O W A X, tomorrow. <laughs> Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons is on the air. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the makers of Colonel's Toothpaste present Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction and one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday night from 7.30 to 8 Eastern Wartime, the famous old investigator will take from his files and bring to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. But first, would you like to have an attractive, dazzling smile, teeth that sparkle with all their natural brilliance? Then try the new Colonos, a high-polishing toothpaste. Colonos acts like a jeweler's polish in removing tarnish from silver erasing the common surface stains and dingy film that so often robs you of an attractive smile. See the difference it makes in the appearance of your teeth. Try Colonos Toothpaste. K-O-L-Y-N-O-S tonight. And now, Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons. Our story this time opens far from Mr. Keene's comfortable office in New York on a stormy night in the Deep South, a night lashed by wind and rain. A ramshackle old cab makes its way up a back road. Over his shoulder, the old Negro driver talks to his two passengers, Mr. Keene and the latter's assistant, Mike Clancy. So y'all wants me to drop you off at the Mead place? Yes, driver. That's what I said. Will we soon be there? In hardly a minute, boss. Wouldn't get me to go visiting in there at night. And why not? Most unnatural folks in there. Crazy folks. The saints preserve us. All touched in the head and the heart. Why do you say that? You'll meet them, boss. Here you are, gentlemen. This gate right over here. Hmm. Quite a big place. No walled in. I'll get out and ring the bell for you. Thank you. And I'll wait here till someone comes for the fetcher. But I ain't going inside. Driver, you wouldn't be superstitious, eh? Oh, no, no, sir. Just intelligent. I'm very intelligent about places where not to go. <laughs> oh, Mr. King, I, uh... I just remembered something terribly important. What's that, Mike? Well, I got an appointment tonight to go bowling in New York. Oh. Steady, Mike. <coughs> there comes somebody now. Oh, it's a great game. Big as a horse. And a woman with him. She's unlocking the gate. Come on, Mike. Let's get out. On your responsibility, sir. Driver, I uh, believe this covers the fare. Thank you, sir. And uh, good luck to you. Good evening. I uh, suppose you're Mr. Keene. Yes, and this is my assistant, Mike Clancy. I'm Dorothea Mead. How do you do? How do you do? Please do. Please come in. So 
sorry you had to make the trip in such weather, Mr. Keene. Not at all. I'm much more troubled by what you had to say in your letter, Miss Lee. Oh, yes, it's so disturbing about Uncle Adam. Let's walk along the driveway, shall we? We'll get some shelter from the trees. Well, these are water oaks, I believe. Mm -hmm. Twelve altogether in a double row. They're magnificent. Yes, but they've been going to pieces lately. There's the house on up ahead. Oh, yes. That's one of the most beautiful and majestic southern mansions I've ever seen. But decaying, like everything else around here. Oh, be careful of that first step, Mr. Keene. It's loose. I have it. Just fasten Nero's leash to the post here. Please come inside. And uh, just to hang your coat and hat from those hooks there. Thank you. Ah, uh, it's good to be in out of the rain. Well, if you'll come across the hall now, we'll make ourselves comfortable in Stop. the library. Stop where you are. Saints preserve us. Turn around. Get out of this house. It's that man. The top of the stairs. You're not wanted here. Get out. Oh, now stop it, Cousin Roscoe. You're being very rude. I don't like strangers. I hate them. Go on back to your room, dear, and work on your plans. Otherwise, you'll never capture Washington. Oh, yes. Washington. I'll move up reinforcements to the Army of the Potomac. Dorothea, see that I am not disturbed. Glory be. Poor Roscoe is still fighting the war of the states, Mr. King. So it would seem. Here, let's go into the library. Of course. Now, if you just make yourselves comfortable. Well, now, Miss Dorothea, to get a few facts straight, this place belongs to your Uncle Adam? Yes, Mr. King. How old is he? About 80. And he disappeared just 10 days ago? That's right. That's why I want you to investigate. Well, now... Who are all the members of the household? Well, I myself, I'm just visiting here. Then there are two nephews and another niece. Oh. You've just met one of the nephews, my cousin Roscoe. Huh. I'd say. Yeah. Then there's also Roscoe's sister, Harriet. Both about 50. Yes. Finally, there's my cousin Herbert Mead. About 40, very charming. He lived for years in India. Oh, did he? Came back last year with wonderful gifts for all of us. I believe he's enormously wealthy. At any rate, that was the entire household, except for the servants. Your uncle and two nieces and two nephews. Yes. Now, tell me about the exact circumstance of his disappearance, Miss Dorothea. Well, after dinner that night, Uncle Adam decided to go for a walk. It was very dark, moonless, but quite mild. He went by himself? No, Nero trotted off with him, Mr. King. Mm-hmm. Who was the last person to see him? Oh, well, I was. I went out after him to offer him a flashlight. He said... Nonsense, my dear. I don't need it. Oh, but it's so awfully dark, Uncle Adam. I know every pebble around here by its first name. Uh, come along, Nero. Let's go get some air. And that was the last time you saw him, eh? What about Nero? We found Nero here the next morning tied to a post. Well, we presumed that Uncle Adam had decided not to take him after all, or disappeared after returning. Did you start a search for him? The very next morning, Mr. Keene. Well, the police went all over the grounds and no trace of him. Then I decided to write to you. Oh, I'm so terribly worried. What could have happened to him, Mr. Keene? It's much too early to start guessing, my dear. Miss Dorothea, quite frankly, how did your uncle get along with the other members of the household? Well, I, he was something of a tease. You see, uh, oh, hello, cousin Herbert. Hello, Dorothy. I understand Mr. Keene has arrived. Yes, and this is his assistant, Mr. Clancy. How do you How do? You do? do? It's a dreadful business. If there's any way I can help, Mr. Keene, I may want to talk to you later, Mr. Mead. Well, I'll be in my room. Delighted to have met you, Mr. Keene. Seems like a very pleasant sort. Oh, he's a dear, and about the only one that Uncle Adam never picked on. Of course, Uncle Adam's been supporting Roscoe and Harriet for years as permanent guests. But he could never let off reminding Harriet about her age. He said, Harriet, my dear niece, sometimes I begin to think you'll never find a husband. Be still, Uncle Adam. I must admit, though, that I met a fellow the other day who's quite smitten with you, Harriet. Oh, oh, really? Did you? 
Uh, Miss Harriet, he said, uh, isn't the flashy kind, but for solid good looks, she can't be beat. Oh, tell me, who said that? Oh, a fellow in the old man's home. <laughs> and I hate you, Uncle Adam. I hate you. That wasn't very kind. Oh, but in money matters, he was the very soul of generosity. Here, look, inside the drawer of this table, Mr. Keith. Hmm. It's stuffed with bills. It was there for Roscoe and Harriet to use if they wish. Interesting. Boss, there's something very odd about the size of those bills. Yes, this is the old-fashioned currency, Mike. About 50% larger than what's issued nowadays. It's one of my uncle's eccentricities. He's kept a bale of cash in the bank vault for years, and he's still drawing on it. I see. Well, now, Miss Dorothea, beside the servants, was there anybody else around the grounds about the time he disappeared? Well, yes. Uncle Adam had hired three or four men to work on the oaks. That double row we saw as we came in, eh? Yes. And I can get you the names of all the men who worked here. Well, that can wait until morning. Oh, yes, of course. Let me show you to your rooms now. Here you are, Mr. King. Your room, Mr. Clancy, is the one down the hall there. Well, thank you, Miss Dorothea. I'll be wanting to talk a minute with the boss. I'll find it later. Everything's all laid out for you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Boss, what do you make of it? Nothing yet. Oh, this place gives me the creeps. Oh, relax, Michael. Oh, I get the feeling that eyes are on me all the time. And then that darn rainstorm. Oh, I, I wish she hadn't put us off in this lonely old wing by ourselves. Steady, Mike. Go to sleep. Well, I'll try to anyhow. Good night, boss. Good night. <sighs> Almost 11 o'clock. It is a strange house. And a strange family. I wonder if that storm will clear by morning. Must have a look around the grounds as soon as possible and see... If... Oh! oh, great Scott. Oh. It's Mike Clancy. Somebody's turned off the hall light. Oh. One moment, Mike, while I find the hall light. Oh. Ah, there you are, lying in the floor. Oh. Oh. Wait, Mike, wait. I'll fasten it from your neck. Oh. Ah. Uh, there we are. Oh, Stan's preserves. What was it? A silk stocking drawn around your neck like a noose. Glory be. Tell me, what happened? I don't know, boss. I, I stepped out into the hall. I started from my own room. Suddenly the light went out and I was being choked. With a silk stocking? Oh, there are no better use for silk stockings in times like these. One second. You notice anything about the color of this? Well, it's 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 dark, sort of. Gunmetal. The same color that Dorothea Mead was wearing. Oh, boss, I I told you I should have went bowling tonight in little old New York. Good morning, Mr. Keene. Good morning. You enjoying the view from the porch? Yes, it's beautiful. Thank heavens the storm has cleared. Yes, it gave me the chance to look around the grounds. Oh, did you find anything interesting? Mm -hmm. But on Mr. Clancy's neck, look at this. Oh, a stocking? Why, it looks like one of my own. It was used last night in an attempt to choke Mr. Clancy. Oh, Dear God. I wonder if you can explain. Well, I, I'm afraid that I can. I I have several pairs like that. When I went back to my room last night, Roscoe was coming out. Was he? He said he'd been looking for some book. And, oh, I know he has fits of temper, but I hate to believe he actually would try. Here he comes now, up the gravel path. Ah, is that you, Keen? Just the man I want to see. Good. I want to talk with you. Tell me, Keen. If you were in a situation where your major forces were disposed along the Potomac and Grant was moving along your flank... Now, Mr. Mead. Oh, 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 you think I'm a bit of a fool, don't you? Well, look at these. Dollar bills? A dozen of them. The old-fashioned size. 
I have been investigating for a week, all on my own. You know where they all turned up? In the bar back in town. The bartender told me. I have bought them all up. Know why? Well, why? Because they'd all been spent there by Ben Matley. Oh, who's he? He's one of the men working on the grounds when my uncle disappeared. Simple as could be. Matley murdered Uncle Adam. Well, that's very much worth looking into. But what about this stocking, Mr. Mead? Ever see it before? Have you? Of course. On Dorothea's leg. <laughs> One moment, Mr. Mead. I'm afraid I'll have to go after it. Mr. Mead! Stop where you are. Mr. Keene, uh, this is Cousin Harriet. I don't want this man here. Tell him for us to go alone. Cousin Harriet, if we're ever to find Uncle Adam. Why, Jim, I don't much care if we do. <laughs> This seems to be a house of hate with motives on every side. But Mr. Keene continues his search. Meanwhile, thousands of girls who suffer the heartache of being unpopular, clever, pretty, smartly dressed girls have just one thing to blame. Teeth that rob them of charm when they smile. Thousands of men whose livelihood depends on selling themselves to others have the same weakness of appearance to blame. They don't know it or notice it, but the people they contact do. You may or may not be one of those people, but if you have the slightest suspicion that you are, try the new Colonos toothpaste, a high-polishing toothpaste. Its action is like a jeweler's polish removing tarnish from a piece of silver. You'll find Colonos helps remove those dingy, unattractive surface stains from your teeth, brings out all the natural luster and brilliance that adds so much to your smile. Start using the new Colonos tonight. Remember, it's a high-polishing toothpaste. You can get Colonos K-O-L-Y-N-O-S, Colonel Toothpaste at any drugstore. Now back to Mr. Keene, who is knocking on the door of a cottage near the Mead Estate. Good morning. Are you Ben Matley? Sure enough. Keene is my name. Yeah. I heard they was calling you from New York to find old Mr. Adam Mead. Well, Matley, I'm going to ask you a very blunt question. Yeah. How do you come to have so many of those large-sized bills that Mr. Adam Mead always used? Heck, I worked for them for weeks on them trees. You would seem to be spending more than your normal share. Sure. I'm good at poker, and the other boys ain't. Well, tell me, Matt Lee, about the work you did in those water oaks. Now, I gather that it consisted of hollowing out the rotted parts and filling them with cement. Yeah, sure enough. And then, were they finished? Yep. Yeah. A couple of weeks ago today. Before Mr. Mead disappeared? Mm. The day before. Oh. Uh, sure had big holes in them. Funny the way that rot gets in water oaks. Holes big as a house, Mr. Keene. Hmm. But it never affects black walnut trees that way, does it? Hardly ever. What do you ask me for? Why? For an excellent reason. Mr. Keene. Good, Miss Dorothea. I've worked up quite an appetite with all my walking this morning. Right this way. The others are all waiting. How do you do? How do you do? Oh, Mr. Clancy's sitting here by my side. Will you sit next to Cousin Herbert, Mr. Keene? I'd be delighted. Any progress, Mr. Keene? Progress? Why, I believe... Uh, excuse me. Oh, did you drop something on the floor? <laughs> I've got a pebble in my shoe. I'll have it out in a moment. <laughs> Ah, there we are. You were saying, Mr. Keene? Negative progress. I mean that we can safely eliminate one theory. And what is that? If your uncle has been murdered, Miss Harriet, I don't believe it was for a legacy. But why do you say that, Mr. Keene? Because, Miss Dorothea, he has been made to disappear so completely. I don't follow. Not at all, Mr. Keene. Assuming that he is dead, his will cannot be probated, nor can his estate be distributed for at least five years. You see... There must be proof of death through the finding of the body, or else under the laws of this state, five years must pass until he can be presumed to be legally dead. Well, I didn't know that. Everybody knows that. Be that as it may, Cousin Herbert. Uncle Adam will turn up all right. What makes you so sure, Miss Harriet? A Harriet's? bad penny always turns up.
Hello. Somebody knocking? It's I, Mr. King Herbert Mead. Oh, come in. Mr. King. One moment. I'll switch on the bed lamp. I'm sorry to waken you. It was my first chance to break away from the others. What's the trouble? I don't know whether Dorothy has been completely frightened, Mr. Keene. In what regard? When Uncle Adam walked off that night, he wasn't alone. Oh, really? I was looking out of the library window. Down the path, Uncle Adam was joined by... Well, family loyalty is a good thing, but... Come, come, Mr. Mead. The best way is to have it all come out now. Surely we could enter a plea of insanity for him. For Roscoe, you mean? You've seen one of his wages, I believe. Yes. Uncle Adam always was ridiculing poor Roscoe's military campaigns. But the body... Mr. Keene, I know the grounds have already been searched once. But I noticed this morning that the way Nero was mooning around in back of the house. It's only a stab in the dark, but I... Yes, go on. Tomorrow, by daylight... We'll go there together. All right. First thing in the morning. Good morning, Mr. Keene. Good morning, Mike. Huh. Something on your mind, boss? Well, Mike, yesterday at lunch I set a trap. And? Could you tell me about it? There was no pebble in my shoe yesterday. I was examining a trouser cuff. I, I don't follow you. Come along, Mike. We have an appointment this morning with Herbert Meade. Maybe he's gone downstairs by now, Mr. Keen, sir. Maybe. But let's try the door. Okay. Boss. Scott. Look at him there in the bed. Blood all over his face. Quick, let's get to him. Mr. Mead. Herbert. Herbert. Oh, my a nasty gash on his forehead, sir. Herbert, can you hear me? Boss, he must be dead. No. He seems to be just barely breathing. Mike, run downstairs. Have somebody phone for a doctor. Okay, boss. Well, what are you doing there, sir? Having a look in the closet, Mike. What for? The killer? No. Just his trousers. Well, we certainly had a fright, Mr. Keene. What did the doctor say, Miss Dorothea? Nasty cut for Cousin Herbert, but no fracture, fortunately. Well, does Herbert have any idea who attacked him? Just going back to discuss that with him now. You coming with me, Mr. Keene? As a matter of fact, I'll join you later if you don't mind. I want to have a look in your uncle's tool shed, if I may. Of course, anything. Only we must find out once and for all who's responsible for all these horrors in this house. Oh, poor Herbert. Don't you think you should stay in bed? Oh, don't worry, Dorothy. I'll be all right. And you have no idea who it was? I was deep asleep. Next thing, something came down on my head. I remember the pain and nothing. Why, you could have been killed. I wasn't hit with much force, the doctor said. Dorothea, that makes me start wondering. Perhaps... Oh, no, no. But Harriet is such a strange one, always sulking, always taking Roscoe's part. Oh, Herbert. May I come in? Why, of course, Mr. King. I see you're sitting up, Mr. Mead. And, and you, Mr. King. I'm afraid so, my dear. Afraid? What I mean is... Uh, you know that old black walnut tree out there in back? You can just about see the top of it from that window? Yes. Well, what about it? Well, just before your uncle's disappearance, some work was being done on the 12 oaks out in front, wasn't it? They had rotted. That's right, so. And that's understandable. But I find also that another tree was treated the same way. Bored out, refilled with cement. That is very strange. Why, Mr. Kitty? Black walnut doesn't usually decay like that doesn't ordinarily require that sort of surgery. A few minutes ago, I had that cement filling broken open. Oh, dear God, you mean... Your you... uncle, Adam Mead, has been lying inside that tree for two weeks. Dead. Oh. Entombed in the black walnut. 
by the person who killed him. Who was that person? The possibilities are numerous. Somebody who was mentally unbalanced, possibly. A thief, possibly. Mm -hmm. Or else a rather greedy and ruthless man who knew nothing about the laws of inheritance. Who? Who? You, Herbert Mead. What did you say, Mr. Oh, King? Now we've got a third lunatic in the house. But, Keen, don't you realize that I was nearly killed here myself? Nearly killed, yes. You staged that attack yourself and hit yourself just hard enough to bring blood. No worse. Well, that's ridiculous. Well, when you found me, I was completely unconscious. Correct. The answer is in this night table. See? A box of sleeping powder, half gone. First you gashed yourself, then you took a big dose of the sleeping powders, and then waited for results. Well, you're out of your mind. You see, while you lay there unconscious, I didn't waste too much time in pity. I looked in your closet, examined the cuffs of every pair of trousers you wear. I, I don't understand. In two of them, I found granules of wood, a black walnut scraping. In the third, bits of cement. Oh, now, just a moment. Night after night, while the men working on the oaks left their equipment around, you went out and worked on the black walnut, making a tomb. And then, when it was ready... You went out in the dark after your uncle and strangled him. Nonsense! The same way you attacked my assistant later. You see, you did not understand the laws of legacy, Herbert Mead. But when I mentioned it at the table yesterday, you realized you'd made a mistake. You realized the body had to be found. And you gave me hints to guide me. You said Nero had been mooning around in back. Then, my dear fellow... You really gave yourself away. Stand back, King, both of you. Got a pistol. Careful, Mead. Into the closet, you two. You won't get far, Mead. I've already been in touch with the police. Stop that pistol, Mead. I've got you covered. Thank you, sir. That was well done. I heard every word of it. I arrest you, Herbert Mead, for the murder of your uncle, Adam Mead. <laughs> On time, Mike. We'll soon be getting into Pennsylvania Station. I'm sure when will I tell me old lady just how close she came to losing her precious Michael Clancy. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> but boss, I wonder what on earth you'd ever do if you didn't happen to know about things like black walnut trees and the laws of inheritance. What would I do, Mike? I wouldn't be a detective. <laughs> And so ends the case of the Moonless Night. Listen next week at the same time as Mr. Keene brings us the bizarre and baffling case of the missing witness. <laughs> to help bring out the gleaming natural brightness of your teeth, remove common surface stains by brushing them with a the new colonel, a high-polishing toothpaste. Colonos acts like a jeweler's polish in removing tarnish from silver. It quickly removes surface stains and helps make your teeth and smile look their dazzling, romantic best. Try the new Colonos toothpaste tonight. You have just been listening to Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. Now on the air at a new time, every Thursday night, 7.30 to 8 Eastern Wartime, over this network. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday night when the kindly old tracer turns to the case of the missing witness. And now, one closing thought. Many of you listening in have signed the Home Front Pledge, a pledge made by 15 million Americans in the past year to pay no more than top legal prices and accept no ration goods without ration points. If all of us will do these two simple things, we will soon wipe out the black market, cut down the cost of living, and ensure a fair share of food for the wives and families of our fighting men and millions of others living on fixed income. This is Larry Elliott saying good night for the makers of Colonel's Toothpaste and Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. <laughs> Ladies.
Ladies, there is now a wonderfully inexpensive, easy way to wax wood floors and linoleum to a high, sparkling finish in only six to nine minutes. Use Aero Wax, a self-polishing wax that goes on in a jiffy, dries without rubbing to a marvelous high luster, adds beauty to your rooms, saves countless scrubbings, yet costs only 25 cents a pint. Get Aero Wax, A-E-R-O-W-A-X, tomorrow. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.